states versus totalitarian government, which means capitalism versus socialism. The smear of capitalism's advocates as fascists has failed in this country and for over a decade has been moldering in dark corners, seldom venturing to be heard openly in public, coming only as an occasional miasma from under the ground, from the sewers of actual leftism. And this is the kind of notion that the liberals are unfastidious enough to attempt to revive. But it is obvious what vested interest that notion can serve. If it were true that dictatorship is inevitable, and that fascism and communism are the two extremes at the opposite ends of our course, then what is the safest place to choose? Why, the middle of the road. The safely undefined, indeterminate, mixed economy, moderate middle. With a moderate amount of government favors and special privileges to the rich, and a moderate amount of government handouts to the poor, with a moderate respect for rights and a moderate degree of brute force, with a moderate amount of freedom and a moderate amount of slavery, with a moderate degree of justice and a moderate degree of injustice, with a moderate amount of security and a moderate amount of terror, and with a moderate degree of tolerance for all, except those extremists who uphold principles, consistency, objectivity, morality, and who refuse to compromise. The notion of compromise as the supreme virtue superseding all else is the moral imperative, the moral precondition of a mixed economy. A mixed economy is an explosive, untenable mixture of two opposite elements which cannot remain stable, but must ultimately go one way or the other. It is a mixture of freedom and controls, which means not of fascism and communism, but of capitalism and statism, including all its variants. Those who wish to support the unsupportable, disintegrating status quo are screaming in panic that it can be prolonged by eliminating the two extremes of its basic components. But the two extremes are capitalism or total dictatorship. Dictatorship feeds on the ideological chaos of bewildered, demoralized, cynically flexible, unresisting men. But capitalism requires an uncompromising stand. Destruction can be done blindly, at random, but construction requires strict adherence to specific principles. The welfare statists hope to eliminate capitalism by smear and silence, and to avoid dictatorship by voluntary compliance, by a policy of bargaining and compromise with the government's growing power. This brings us to the deeper implications of the term extremism, it is obvious that an uncompromising stand on anything is the actual characteristic which that anti-concept is designed to damn. It is also obvious that compromise is incompatible with morality. In the field of morality, compromise is surrender to evil. There can be no compromise on basic principles. There can be no compromise on moral issues. There can be no compromise on matters of knowledge, of truth, of rational conviction. If an uncompromising stand is to be smeared as extremism, then that smear is directed at any devotion to values, any loyalty to principles, any profound conviction, any consistency, any steadfastness, any passion, any dedication to an unbreached, inviolate truth, any man of integrity. And it is against all these that that anti-concept has been and is being used. Here we can see the deeper roots, the source that has made the spread of anti-concepts possible, the mentally paralyzed, anxiety-ridden neurotics produced by the disintegration of modern philosophy, with its cult of uncertainty, its epistemological irrationalism and ethical subjectivism, come out of our colleges broken by chronic dread, seeking escape from the absolutism of reality with which they feel themselves impotent to deal. Fear drives them to unite with slick political manipulators and pragmatist ward healers to make the world safe for mediocrity by raising to the status of a moral ideal that archetypal citizen of a mixed economy, the docile, pliable, moderate, milk toast who never gets excited, never makes trouble, never cares too much, adjusts to anything and upholds nothing. The best proof of an intellectual movement's collapse 
is the day when it has nothing to offer as an ultimate ideal but a plea for moderation. Such is the final proof of collectivism's bankruptcy. The vision, the courage, the dedication, the moral fire are now on the barely awakening side of the crusaders for capitalism. It will take more than an anti-concept to stop them. Chapter 18, The Obliteration of Capitalism by Ayn Rand In my article, Extremism or the Art of Smearing, I discuss the subject of anti-concepts, i.e. artificial, unnecessary, undefined, and rationally unusable terms intended to replace or obliterate certain legitimate concepts in people's minds. I said that the liberals are coining and spreading anti-concepts in order to smuggle this country into statism by an imperceptible process, and that the primary target marked for obliteration is the concept of capitalism, which, if lost, would carry away with it the knowledge that a free society can and did exist. But there is something much less attractive and politically much more disastrous than capitalism's enemies, its alleged defenders, some of whom are muscling in on the game of manufacturing anti-concepts of their own. Have you ever felt a peculiar kind of embarrassment when witnessing a grossly inappropriate human performance, such as the antics of an unfunny comedian? It is a depersonalized, almost metaphysical embarrassment at having to witness so undignified a behavior on the part of a member of the human species. That is what I feel at having to hear the following statement of Governor Romney, which was his alleged answer to the Communists' boast that they would bury capitalism. But what they do not understand, and what we have failed to tell the world, is that Americans buried capitalism long ago and moved on to consumerism. The implications of such a statement are too sickeningly obvious. The best comment on it came from the Richardson Digest, Richardson, Texas, April 28, 1965, from the column Lively Comments by Earl Lively, who wrote, Afraid to stand alone, even on his knees, Romney then tells the rest of us that we do not know the definition of capitalism. We do not understand our economic principles, and we'd be better off if we quit going around defending such an unpopular concept as capitalism. Mr. Lively is admirably precise in his description of the posture involved, but Mr. Romney is not alone in it. A number of intellectually more reputable men, including some distinguished free enterprise economists, have adopted the same stance and the same line for the same psychological reasons. There are the economists who proclaim that the essence and the moral justification of capitalism is service to others, to the consumers, that the consumer's wishes are the absolute edicts ruling the free market, etc. This is an example of what a definition by non-essentials accomplishes, and of why a half-truth is worse than a lie. What all such theorists fail to mention is the fact that capitalism grants economic recognition to only one kind of consumer, the producer, that only traders, i.e. producers who have something to offer, are recognized on a free market, not consumers as such, that in a capitalist economy, as in reason, in justice, and in reality, production is the precondition of consumption. There are the businessmen who spend fortunes on ideological ads, allegedly in defense of capitalism, which assure the public that all but a tiny fraction of an industry's income goes to labor, wages, to government, taxes, etc., with these shares represented as big chunks in full-color process, and lost among them an apologetic little sliver is marked two and a half percent and labeled profits. There is the display of charts and models in a hallway of the New York Stock Exchange presenting the achievements of free enterprise and captioned the people's capitalism. Since none of these attempts can succeed in disguising the nature of capitalism nor in degrading it to the level of an altruistic stockyard, their sole result is to convince the public that capitalism hides some evil secret which imbues its alleged defenders with such an aura of abject guilt and hypocrisy. But in fact the secret they are struggling to hide is capitalism's essence and greatest virtue, that it is a system based on the recognition of individual rights, on man's right to exist and to work for his own sake, 
not on the altruistic view of man as a sacrificial animal. Thus it is capitalism's virtue that the public is urged by such defenders to regard as evil, and it is altruism that all their efforts help to reinforce and reaffirm as a standard of the good. What they dare not allow into their minds is the fact that capitalism and altruism are incompatible, so they wonder why the more they propagandize, the more unpopular capitalism becomes. They blame it on people's stupidity, because people refuse to believe that a successful industrialist is an exponent of altruistic self-sacrifice, and on people's greed for the unearned, because after being battered with assurances that the industrialist's wealth is morally theirs, people do come to believe it. No anti-concept launched by the liberals goes so far, so crudely, as the tag consumerism. It implies loudly and clearly that the status of consumer is separate from and superior to the status of producer. It suggests a social system dedicated to the service of a new aristocracy which is distinguished by the ability to consume and vested with a special claim on the caste of serfs marked by the ability to produce. If taken seriously, such a tag would lead to the ultimate absurdity of the communists proclaiming who does not toil shall not eat, and the alleged representatives of capitalism replying, Oh, yes, he shall. And if the ad hoc committee on the triple revolution propounds such a moral obscenity as the right to consume, who inspired it, Karl Marx or Governor Romney? It is true that we are not a capitalist system any longer. We are a mixed economy, i.e. a mixture of capitalism and statism, of freedom and controls. A mixed economy is a country in the process of disintegration, a civil war of pressure groups looting and devouring one another. In this sense, consumerism might be the appropriate name for it. Now, to whom is it that the friends, the semi-friends, and even the acquaintances of capitalism are so anxiously apologizing? As the clearest illustration of the psychological motives, the moral meaning, and the intellectual technique involved in the manufacture of anti-concepts, I offer you a column by C. L. Sulzberger, entitled Should the Old Labels Be Changed, in the July 1964 issue of the New York Times. A research report of the United States Information Agency, writes Mr. Sulzberger, has ruefully discovered that the more our propaganda advertises the virtues of capitalism and attacks socialism, the less the world likes us. Confused semantics make bad public relations. Having analyzed conclusions of its poll-takers in both hemispheres, the USIA study observes, Capitalism is evil. The United States is the leading capitalist country. Therefore, the United States is evil. It would be difficult to exaggerate the harm that this line of thinking has done. In the Soviet Union and Communist China, it sustains attitudes and actions that greatly increase the danger of thermonuclear war. What is meant here by such a foggy expression as sustains attitudes and actions? The smear of capitalism as evil was originated and constantly reiterated by the communists. Does the above mean that their own smear sustains their attitudes? And does it mean that the way to avoid thermonuclear war is for us to agree that the smear is true? The report does not say. It merely goes on. In the non-communist world, it tends to poison the atmosphere in which we are trying to carry on our aid programs and other international cooperation. This means that the harm to us lies in the danger that the recipients of our charity might refuse to take our money, and that in order to gain their cooperation we must spit in our own face and join in smearing the system which produced the wealth which is saving their lives. Capitalism is a dirty word to millions of non-Marxists who see socialism as vaguely benevolent. When the USIA sampled foreign opinion, it found that to the majority, socialism did not mean government ownership and was not necessarily related to communism. Rather, it seemed to imply a system favoring welfare of common people. If you have doubted that the philosophy of pragmatism actually teaches that truth is to be established by public polls, here is a sample of it, in pure and naked form. Volumes of theory, a century of history, and the bloody practice of five continents, to the contrary, notwithstanding, socialism does not mean government ownership, 
and is not related to communism because a sampling of majority opinion said so. And what is meant by a system favoring welfare of common people? How does one favor the common people? At the expense of the uncommon? A favor means the unearned, since the earned is a right, not a favor, whose rights and earnings are to be abrogated and expropriated for whose benefit. The only variant of socialism that can distribute favors without government ownership is fascism. Draw your own conclusions about the political inclinations of the moral cannibals involved in that poll. Most foreigners apparently don't regard capitalism as descriptive of an efficient economy or a safeguard of individual rights. To them, it means little concern for the poor, unfair distribution of wealth, and undue influence of the rich. How does one combine the safeguard of individual rights with a government-enforced concern for the poor and a government-distributed wealth and influence? No answer. USIA found an impressive percentage of British, West Germans, Italians, Japanese, Mexicans, and Brazilians have a favorable opinion of socialism and a strongly unfavorable opinion of capitalism. Consider the philosophical trends, the intellectual commitments, the moral records of these countries, and their political results. Germany, Italy, and Japan were fascist dictatorships. Their claims to political wisdom consist of giving the world a demonstration of horror equaled only by their ideological brothers in Soviet Russia and Red China. Britain, Mexico, and Brazil are mixed economies, which have long since gone over the borderline state of mixture into the category, and the economic bankruptcy, of socialistic countries. And these are the nations whose opinions we are asked to value, whose favor we are asked to court, these are the moral authorities to whom we must apologize for the noblest political system in history, ours. These are the judges whom we must placate by denying our system, dishonoring its record, and obliterating its name. Is there any conceivable motive that could prompt a nation to so base a betrayal? Conceivable? No, if one refers to the realm of rational concepts, but... Capitalism abroad is frequently a pejorative word. Efforts to purge it of negative connotations by phrases like people's capitalism have failed. But socialism is chic. Yes, chic. Even in Britain and West Germany, where private ownership is the mode, the majority expressed itself sympathetic to socialism, while abhorring communism. If the term social metaphysics occurs to you at this point, you would be right except that even that term seems too clean, almost too innocent to explain the following. Leaders of underdeveloped nations, spurning capitalism, boast of special brands of socialism. Leopold Senghor of Senegal says, Socialism is a sense of community which is a return to Africanism. Julius Nereri of Tanganyika insists, No underdeveloped country can afford to be anything but socialist. Tunisia's Habib Bourguiba claims Mohammed's companions were socialists before the invention of the word, and Cambodia's Prince Norodom Sihanouk contends our socialism is first and foremost an application of Buddhism. The above is true, totally true, true all the way down to the deepest philosophical, psychological, political, and moral fundamentals. And this is the most damning indictment of socialism that a rational person could need to see. Socialism is a regression to primitive barbarism. But that is not the appraisal or the conclusion of the USIA report. It is to the Mohammedans, the Buddhists, and the cannibals, the literal cannibals this time, to the underdeveloped, the undeveloped, and the not-to-be-developed cultures that the capitalist United States of America is asked to apologize for her skyscrapers, her automobiles, her plumbing, and her smiling, confident, untortured, unskinned alive, uneaten young men. The column ends as follows. The study concludes that foreigners attribute to the USA a high degree of capitalist exploitation and of capitalist power over the society as a whole, as well as a great absence of those social welfare measures which to them are the decisive criterion of socialism. There is surely no sense in proclaiming our philosophy in terms that are unsaleable, 
and peculiarly vulnerable to our opponents' attacks. Our system of capitalism has evolved immensely from the outmoded economic doctrine to which the label was originally applied by Marx and other 19th century thinkers. Might not the USIA attempt another survey, seeking ways of announcing our social and political system in a manner more acceptable to those abroad whose opinions we would influence? Influence how? In what direction? To what purpose? If for the sake of appeasement we renounce our philosophy and adopt theirs, if we discard the last remnants of capitalism and proclaim ourselves to be a nationalist socialist welfare state, who would have influenced and buried whom? A great many things may be observed about this unusually revealing column. It is true, of course, that if American propagandists are defending capitalism abroad as they do at home, the results would be precisely as described in that USIA study, or worse. At home it is the conservatives who are appeasing the liberals and losing the battle, because they dare not uphold the true nature of capitalism. Abroad it is the liberals who are appeasing the communists and losing the battle for the same reason. There is no way to defend capitalism without upholding man's right to exist, which means without rejecting altruism. Observe the appalling indifference to the issue of truth or falsehood on the part of capitalism's alleged defenders. They attach no significance to such contradictions as sympathizing with socialism while abhorring communism, or to the fact that capitalism is the only opposite of and the only defense against communism. They attach no significance to the ignorance, the dishonesty, the injustice, the irrationality of capitalism's critics. In the face of a moral philosophical issue, their response is an immediate, uncritical acceptance of the critics' terms, a surrender to ignorance, dishonesty, injustice, irrationality. In the face of the knowledge that capitalism is being smeared by the communists, by the very enemy they intend to fight, their policy is not to blast the smear, not to enlighten the world, not to defend the victim, not to speak out for justice, but to sanction the smear, to hide the truth, to sacrifice the victim, to join the lynching. What they feel is, of what account is truth in the face of such a consideration as people don't like us? What they cry is, but this is the way we'll make people like the victim after we've helped them grind her to bits in the mud. Then they wonder why contempt is all they earn from betrayed allies and sworn enemies alike. Moral cowardice is not an attractive, nor an inspiring, nor a very practical trait. Observe the obscenity of those Europeans who in this day and age, in the rising tide of global bloodshed, in the face of the unspeakable atrocities of the newly emerging nations, dare prattle about little concern for the poor, and criticize the United States for that. Whatever their motives, concern for human suffering is not one of them. We may observe all that, but it seems almost irrelevant beside the one central overwhelming fact. The intellectual leaders of today's world are willing to condone and accept anything. They are willing to recognize the right of Buddhism and Africanism to their boastfully asserted traditions. Remember the nature and record of those traditions. But they make one exception. There is one country, the United States of America, who is not acceptable to them, who must renounce her tradition, and in atonement must crawl on her knees begging the savages of five continents to choose a new name for her system which would obliterate the guilt of her past. What is her guilt? That for one brief moment in human history she offered the world the vision of unsacrificed man in a non-sacrificial way of life. When one grasps this, one knows that it is no use arguing over political trivia, or wondering about the nature of altruism and why the reign of the altruists is leading the world to an ever-widening spread of horror. This is the nature of altruism. This, not any sort of benevolence, goodwill, or concern for human misfortune. Hatred of man, not the desire to help him, hatred of life, not the desire to further it, hatred of the successful state of life, and that ultimate apocalyptic evil, hatred of the good for being the good. What every successful man, successful at any human value, spiritual or material, has encountered, 
has sensed, has been bewildered by, but has seldom identified, can now be seen in the open, with nations, instead of individual men, reenacting the same unspeakable evil on a world scale where it cannot be hidden any longer. It is not for her flaws that the United States of America is hated, but for her virtues. Not for her weaknesses, but for her achievements. Not for her failures, but for her success, her magnificent, shining, life-giving success. It is not your wealth that they're after. Theirs is a conspiracy against the mind, which means against life and man. It is a conspiracy without leader or direction, and the random little thugs of the moment who cash in on the agony of one land or another are chance scum, riding the torrent from the broken dam of the sewer of centuries, from the reservoir of hatred for reason, for logic, for ability, for achievement, for joy, stored by every whining anti-human who ever preached the superiority of the heart over the mind. Atlas shrugged. With most of the world in ruins, with the voice of philosophy silent and the last remnants of civilization vanishing undefended, in an unholy alliance of savagery and decadence, bloody thugs are fighting over the spoils, while the cynical pragmatists left in charge and way out of their depth are trying to drown the panic at Europe's cocktail parties, where emasculated men and hysterical white-lipped women determine the fate of the world by declaring that socialism is chic. This is the face of our age. To attempt to fight it by means of compromise, conciliation, equivocation, and circumlocution is worse than grotesque. This is not a battle to be fought by joining the enemy in any manner, nor by borrowing any of his slogans or his bloody ideological equipment, nor by deluding the world about the nature of the battle, nor by pretending that one is in with that sort of crowd. It is a battle only for those who know why it is necessary to be out, as far out of that stream as words will carry, why, when moral issues are at stake, one must begin by blasting the enemy's base and cutting off any link to it, any bridge, any toehold, and if one is to be misunderstood, let it be on the side of intransigence, not on the side of any resemblance to any part of so monstrous an evil. It is a battle only for those who paraphrasing a character in Atlas Shrugged, are prepared to say, Capitalism is the only system in history where wealth was not acquired by looting but by production, not by force but by trade, the only system that stood for man's right to his own mind, to his work, to his life, to his happiness, to himself. If this is evil by the present standards of the world, if this is the reason for damning us, then we, we the champions of men, accept it and choose to be damned by that world. We choose to wear the name capitalism printed on our foreheads proudly as our badge of nobility. This is what the battle demands. Nothing less will do. Chapter 19 Conservatism, an Obituary by Ayn Rand both the conservatives and the liberals stress a fact with which everybody seems to agree, that the world is facing a deadly conflict and that we must fight to save civilization. But what is the nature of that conflict? Both groups answer, it is a conflict between communism and... and what? Blank out. It is a conflict between two ways of life, they answer, the communist way and... what? Blank out. It is a conflict between two ideologies, they answer. What is our ideology? Blank out. The truth which both groups refuse to face and to admit is that politically the world conflict of today is the last stage of the struggle between capitalism and statism. We stand for freedom, say both groups, and proceed to declare what kind of controls, regulations, coercions, taxes, and sacrifices they would impose what arbitrary powers they would demand, what social gains they would hand out to various groups, without specifying from what other groups these gains would be expropriated. Neither of them cares to admit that government control of a country's economy, any kind or degree of such control by any group, for any purpose whatsoever, rests on the basic principle of statism, 
the principle that man's life belongs to the state. A mixed economy is merely a semi-socialized economy, which means a semi-enslaved society, which means a country torn by irreconcilable contradictions in the process of gradual disintegration. Freedom in a political context means freedom from government coercion. It does not mean freedom from the landlord or freedom from the employer or freedom from the laws of nature which do not provide men with automatic prosperity. It means freedom from the coercive power of the state and nothing else. The world conflict of today is the conflict of the individual against the state, the same conflict that has been fought throughout mankind's history. The names change, but the essence and the results remain the same, whether it is the individual against feudalism or against absolute monarchy or against communism or fascism or Nazism or socialism or the welfare state. If one upholds freedom, one must uphold man's individual rights. If one upholds man's individual rights, one must uphold his right to his own life, to his own liberty, to the pursuit of his own happiness, which means one must uphold a political system that guarantees and protects these rights, which means the politico-economic system of capitalism. Individual rights, freedom, justice, progress were the philosophical values, the theoretical goals, and the practical results of capitalism. No other system can create them or maintain them. No other system ever has or will. For proof, consider the nature and function of basic principles. For evidence, consult history and the present state of the different countries of Europe. The issue is not slavery for a good cause versus slavery for a bad cause. The issue is not dictatorship by a good gang versus dictatorship by a bad gang. The issue is freedom versus dictatorship. It is only after men have chosen slavery and dictatorship that they can begin the usual gang warfare of socialized countries. Today it is called pressure group warfare over whose gang will rule, who will enslave whom, whose property will be plundered for whose benefit, who will be sacrificed to whose noble purpose. All such arguments come later and are in fact of no consequence. The results will always be the same. The first choice, and the only one that matters, is freedom or dictatorship, capitalism or statism. That is the choice which today's political leaders are determined to evade. The liberals are trying to put statism over by stealth, statism of a semi-socialist, semi-fascist kind, without letting the country realize what road they are taking to what ultimate goal. And while such a policy is reprehensible, there is something more reprehensible still, the policy of the conservatives who are trying to defend freedom by stealth. If the liberals are afraid to identify their program by its proper name, if they advocate every specific step, measure, policy, and principle of statism, but squirm and twist themselves into semantic pretzels with such euphemisms as the welfare state, the New Deal, the New Frontier, they still preserve a semblance of logic, if not of morality. It is the logic of a con man who cannot afford to let his victims discover his purpose. Besides, the majority of those who are loosely identified by the term liberals are afraid to let themselves discover that what they advocate is statism. They do not want to accept the full meaning of their goal. They want to keep all the advantages and effects of capitalism while destroying the cause, and they want to establish statism without its necessary effects. They do not want to know or to admit that they are the champions of dictatorship and slavery. So they evade the issue for fear of discovering that their goal is evil. Immoral as this might be, what is one to think of men who evade the issue for fear of discovering that their goal is good? What is the moral stature of those who are afraid to proclaim that they are the champions of freedom? What is the integrity of those who outdo their enemies in smearing, misrepresenting, spitting at and apologizing for their own ideal? What is the rationality of those who expect to trick people into freedom, cheat them into justice, fool them into progress, con them into preserving their rights, and while indoctrinating them with statism, put one over on them and let them wake up in a perfect capitalist society some morning? These are the conservatives or most of their intellectual spokesmen.
one need not wonder why they are losing elections, or why this country is stumbling anxiously, reluctantly, toward statism. One need not wonder why any cause represented or upheld in such a manner is doomed. One need not wonder why any group with such a policy does in fact declare its own bankruptcy, forfeiting any claim to moral, intellectual, or political leadership. The meaning of the liberals' program is pretty clear by now. But what are the conservatives? What is it that they are seeking to conserve? It is generally understood that those who support the conservatives expect them to uphold the system which has been camouflaged by the loose term of the American way of life. The moral treason of the conservative leaders lies in the fact that they are hiding behind that camouflage. They do not have the courage to admit that the American way of life was capitalism, that that was the politico-economic system born and established in the United States, the system which, in one brief century, achieved a level of freedom, of progress, of prosperity, of human happiness unmatched in all the other systems and centuries combined, and that that is the system which they are now allowing to perish by silent default. If the conservatives do not stand for capitalism, they stand for and are nothing. They have no goal, no direction, no political principles, no social ideals, no intellectual values, no leadership to offer anyone. Yet capitalism is what the conservatives dare not advocate or defend. They are paralyzed by the profound conflict between capitalism and the moral code which dominates our culture, the morality of altruism. Altruism holds that man has no right to exist for his own sake, that service to others is the only justification of his existence, and that self-sacrifice is his highest moral duty, virtue, and value. Capitalism and altruism are incompatible. They are philosophical opposites. They cannot coexist in the same man or in the same society. The conflict between capitalism and altruism has been undercutting America from her start, and today has reached its climax. The American political system was based on a different moral principle, on the principle of man's inalienable right to his own life, which means on the principle that man has the right to exist for his own sake, neither sacrificing himself to others nor sacrificing others to himself, and that men must deal with one another as traitors by voluntary choice to mutual benefit. But this moral principle was merely implied in the American political system. It was not stated explicitly. It was not identified. It was not formulated into a full philosophical code of ethics. This was the unfulfilled task which remained as a deadly flaw in our culture and which is destroying America today. Capitalism is perishing for lack of a moral base and of a full philosophical defense. The social system based on and consonant with the altruist morality, with the code of self-sacrifice, is socialism in all or any of its variants, fascism, Nazism, communism. All of them treat man as a sacrificial animal to be immolated for the benefit of the group, the tribe, the society, the state. Soviet Russia is the ultimate result, the final product the full consistent embodiment of the altruist morality in practice. It represents the only way that that morality can ever be practiced. Not daring to challenge the morality of altruism, the conservatives have been struggling to evade the issue of morality or to bypass it. This has cost them their confidence, their courage, and their cause. Observe the guilty evasiveness the apologetic timidity, the peculiarly non-intellectual, non-philosophical attitude projected by most conservatives in their speeches and in their writings. No man and no movement can succeed without moral certainty, without a full rational conviction of the moral rightness of one's cause. Just as the conservatives feel guilty, uncertain, morally disarmed in fighting the liberals, so the liberals feel guilty, uncertain, morally disarmed in fighting the communists. When men share the same basic premise, it is the most consistent ones who win. So long as men accept the altruist morality, they will not be able to stop the advance of communism. The altruist morality is Soviet Russia's best and only weapon. The hypocrisy of America's position in international affairs, the evasiveness, the self-effacing timidity, the apologies for her wealth, her power, her success, 
for all the greatest virtues of her system, the avoidance of any mention of capitalism as if it were the skeleton in her closet, have done more for the prestige of Soviet Russia and for the growing spread of communism through the world than the Russians' own cheap bombastic propaganda could ever accomplish. An attitude of moral guilt is not becoming to the leader of a world crusade and will not rouse men to follow us. And what do we ask men to fight for? They would join a crusade for freedom versus slavery, which means for capitalism versus communism, but who will care to fight in a crusade for socialism versus communism? Who will want to fight and die to defend a system under which he will have to do voluntarily or rather by public vote what a dictator would accomplish faster and much more thoroughly, the sacrifice of everyone to everyone. Who will want to crusade against murder for the privilege of committing suicide? In recent years, the conservatives have gradually come to a dim realization of the weakness in their position, of the philosophical flaw that had to be corrected. But the means by which they are attempting to correct it are worse than the original weakness, the means are discrediting and destroying the last remnants of their claim to intellectual leadership. There are three interrelated arguments used by today's conservatives to justify capitalism, which can best be designated as the argument from faith, the argument from tradition, the argument from depravity. Sensing their need for a moral base, many conservatives decided to choose religion as their moral justification. They claim that America and capitalism are based on faith in God. Politically, such a claim contradicts the fundamental principles of the United States. In America, religion is a private matter which cannot and must not be brought into political issues. Intellectually, to rest one's case on faith means to concede that reason is on the side of one's enemies, that one has no rational arguments to offer. The conservatives claim that their case rests on faith means that there are no rational arguments to support the American system, no rational justification for freedom, justice, property, individual rights, that these rest on a mystic revelation and can be accepted only on faith, that in reason and logic the enemy is right, but men must hold faith as superior to reason. Consider the implications of that theory. While the communists claim that they are the representatives of reason and science, the conservatives concede it and retreat into the realm of mysticism, of faith, of the supernatural, into another world, surrendering this world to communism. It is the kind of victory that the communists' irrational ideology could never have won on its own merits. Observe the results. On the occasion of Khrushchev's first visit to America, he declared at a televised luncheon that he had threatened to bury us because it has been scientifically proved that communism is the system of the future, destined to rule the world. What did our spokesman answer? Mr. Henry Cabot Lodge answered that our system is based on faith in God. Prior to Khrushchev's arrival, the conservative leaders, including senators and House members, were issuing indignant protests against his visit. But the only action they suggested to the American people, the only practical form of protest, was prayer and the holding of religious services for Khrushchev's victims. To hear prayer offered as their only weapon by the representatives of the most powerful country on earth, a country allegedly dedicated to the fight for freedom, was enough to discredit America and capitalism in anyone's eyes, at home and abroad. Now consider the second argument, the attempt to justify capitalism on the ground of tradition. Certain groups are trying to switch the word conservative into the exact opposite of its modern American usage, to switch it back to its 19th century meaning and to put this over on the public. These groups declare that to be a conservative means to uphold the status quo, the given, the established, regardless of what it might be, regardless of whether it is good or bad, right or wrong, defensible or indefensible. They declare that we must defend the American political system not because it is right, but because our ancestors chose it, not because it is good, but because it is old. America was created by men who broke with all political traditions and who originated a system unprecedented in history, relying on nothing but the unaided power of their own intellect. 
But the neoconservatives are now trying to tell us that America was the product of faith in revealed truths and of uncritical respect for the traditions of the past. It is certainly irrational to use the new as a standard of value, to believe that an idea or a policy is good merely because it is new, but it is much more preposterously irrational to use the old as a standard of value, to claim that an idea or a policy is good merely because it's ancient. The liberals are constantly asserting that they represent the future, that they are new, progressive, forward-looking, etc., and they denounce the conservatives as old-fashioned representatives of a dead past. The conservatives concede it, and thus help the liberals to propagate one of today's most grotesque inversions. Collectivism, the ancient frozen status society, is offered to us in the name of progress, while capitalism, the only free, dynamic, creative society ever devised, is defended in the name of stagnation. The plea to preserve tradition as such can appeal only to those who have given up or to those who never intended to achieve anything in life. It is a plea that appeals to the worst elements in men and rejects the best. It appeals to fear, sloth, cowardice, conformity, self-doubt, and rejects creativeness, originality, courage, independence, self-reliance. It is an outrageous plea to address to human beings anywhere but particularly outrageous here in America, the country based on the principle that man must stand on his own feet, live by his own judgment, and move constantly forward as a productive creative innovator. The argument that we must respect tradition as such, respect it merely because it is a tradition, means that we must accept the values other men have chosen merely because other men have chosen them, with the necessary implication of, who are we to change them? The affront to a man's self-esteem in such an argument and the profound contempt for man's nature are obvious. This leads us to the third and the worst argument used by some conservatives, the attempt to defend capitalism on the ground of man's depravity. This argument runs as follows. Since men are weak, fallible, non-omniscient, and innately depraved, no man may be entrusted with the responsibility of being a dictator and of ruling everybody else. Therefore, a free society is the proper way of life for imperfect creatures. Please grasp fully the implications of this argument. Since men are depraved, they are not good enough for a dictatorship. Freedom is all that they deserve. If they were perfect, they would be worthy of a totalitarian state. Dictatorship, this theory asserts, believe it or not, is the result of faith in man and in man's goodness. If people believed that man is depraved by nature, they would not entrust a dictator with power. This means that a belief in human depravity protects human freedom, that it is wrong to enslave the depraved, but would be right to enslave the virtuous. And more, dictatorships, this theory declares, and all the other disasters of the modern world, are man's punishment for the sin of relying on his intellect and of attempting to improve his life on earth by seeking to devise a perfect political system and to establish a rational society. This means that humility, passivity, lethargic resignation, and a belief in original sin are the bulwarks of capitalism. One could not go farther than this in historical, political, and psychological ignorance or subversion. This is truly the voice of the Dark Ages rising again in the midst of our industrial civilization. The cynical, man-hating advocates of this theory sneer at all ideals, scoff at all human aspirations, and deride all attempts to improve men's existence. You can't change human nature, is their stock answer to the socialists. Thus they concede that socialism is the ideal, but human nature is unworthy of it, after which they invite men to crusade for capitalism. A crusade one would have to start by spitting in one's own face, who will fight and die to defend his status as a miserable sinner? If, as a result of such theories, people become contemptuous of conservatism, do not wonder and do not ascribe it to the cleverness of the socialists. Such are capitalism's alleged defenders, and such are the arguments by which they propose to save it. It is obvious that with this sort of theoretical equipment, 
and with an unbroken record of defeats, concessions, compromises, and betrayals in practice, today's conservatives are futile, impotent, and culturally dead. They have nothing to offer and can achieve nothing. They can only help to destroy intellectual standards, to disintegrate thought, to discredit capitalism, and to accelerate this country's uncontested collapse into despair and dictatorship. But to those of you who do wish to contest it, particularly those of you who are young and are not ready to surrender, I want to give a warning. Nothing is as dead as the stillborn. Nothing is as futile as a movement without goals, or a crusade without ideals, or a battle without ammunition. A bad argument is worse than ineffectual. It lends credence to the arguments of your opponents. A half battle is worse than none. It does not end in mere defeat. It helps and hastens the victory of your enemies. At a time when the world is torn by a profound ideological conflict, do not join those who have no ideology, no ideas, no philosophy to offer you. Do not go into battle armed with nothing but stale slogans, pious platitudes, and meaningless generalities. Do not join any so-called conservative group, organization, or person that advocates any variant of the arguments from faith, from tradition, or from depravity. Any homegrown sophist in any village debate can refute those arguments and can drive you into evasions in about five minutes. What would happen to you with such ammunition on the philosophical battlefield of the world? But you would never reach that battlefield. You would not be heard on it, since you would have nothing to say. It is not by means of evasions that one saves civilization. It is not by means of empty slogans that one saves a world perishing for lack of intellectual leadership. It is not by means of ignoring its causes that one cures a deadly disease. So long as the conservatives ignore the issue of what destroyed capitalism and merely plead with men to go back, they cannot escape the question of back to what? And none of their evasions can camouflage the fact that the implicit answer is back to an earlier age of the cancer which is devouring us today and which has almost reached its terminal stage. That cancer is the morality of altruism. So long as the conservatives evade the issue of altruism, all of their pleas and arguments amount in essence to this. Why can't we just go back to the 19th century, when capitalism and altruism seemed somehow to coexist? Why do we have to go to extremes and think of surgery when the early stages of the cancer were painless? The answer is that the facts of reality, which includes history and philosophy, are not to be evaded. Capitalism was destroyed by the morality of altruism. Capitalism is based on individual rights, not on the sacrifice of the individual to the public good of the collective. Capitalism and altruism are incompatible. It's one or the other. It's too late for compromises, for platitudes, and for aspirin tablets. There is no way to save capitalism, or freedom, or civilization, or America, except by intellectual surgery. That is, by destroying the source of the destruction, by rejecting the morality of altruism. If you want to fight for capitalism, there is only one type of argument that you should adopt, the only one that can ever win in a moral issue, the argument from self-esteem. This means the argument from man's right to exist, from man's inalienable individual right to his own life. I quote from my book for the new intellectual. The world crisis of today is a moral crisis, and nothing less than a moral revolution can resolve it. A moral revolution to sanction and complete the political achievement of the American Revolution. The new intellectual must fight for capitalism, not as a practical issue, not as an economic issue, but with the most righteous pride as a moral issue. That is what capitalism deserves, and nothing less will save it. Capitalism is not the system of the past. It is the system of the future. If mankind is to have a future... Those who wish to fight for it must discard the title of conservatives. Conservatism has always been a misleading name, inappropriate to America. Today there is nothing left to conserve. The established political philosophy, the intellectual orthodoxy, and the status quo are collectivism. Those who reject all the basic premises of collectivism are radicals in the proper sense of the word. Radical means fundamental. 
Today, the fighters for capitalism have to be not bankrupt conservatives, but new radicals, new intellectuals, and above all, new dedicated moralists. Chapter 20 The New Fascism Rule by Consensus by Ayn Rand I shall begin by doing a very unpopular thing that does not fit today's intellectual fashions and is therefore anti-consensus. I shall begin by defining my terms so that you will know what I am talking about. Let me give you the dictionary definitions of three political terms, socialism, fascism, and statism. Socialism, a theory or system of social organization which advocates the vesting of the ownership and control of the means of production, capital, land, etc., in the community as a whole. Fascism, a governmental system with strong centralized power, permitting no opposition or criticism, controlling all affairs of the nation, industrial, commercial, etc. Statism, the principle or policy of concentrating extensive economic, political, and related controls in the state at the cost of individual liberty. It is obvious that statism is the wider generic term of which the other two are specific variants. It is also obvious that statism is the dominant political trend of our day. But which of those two variants represents the specific direction of that trend? Observe that both socialism and fascism involve the issue of property rights. The right to property is the right of use and disposal. Observe the difference in those two theories. Socialism negates private property rights altogether and advocates the vesting of ownership and control in the community as a whole, i.e. in the state. Fascism leaves ownership in the hands of private individuals but transfers control of the property to the government. Ownership without control is a contradiction in terms. It means property without the right to use it or to dispose of it. It means that the citizens retain the responsibility of holding property without any of its advantages, while the government acquires all the advantages without any of the responsibility. In this respect, socialism is the more honest of the two theories. I say more honest, not better, because in practice there is no difference between them. Both come from the same collectivist statist principle. Both negate individual rights and subordinate the individual to the collective, both deliver the livelihood and the lives of the citizens into the power of an omnipotent government, and the differences between them are only a matter of time, degree, and superficial detail, such as the choice of slogans by which the rulers delude their enslaved subjects. Which of these two variants of statism are we moving towards, socialism or fascism? To answer this question, one must first ask, which is the dominant ideological trend of today's culture? The disgraceful and terrifying answer is, there is no ideological trend today. There is no ideology. There are no political principles, theories, ideals, or philosophy. There is no direction, no goal, no compass, no vision of the future, no intellectual element of leadership. Are there any emotional elements dominating today's culture? Yes. One. Fear. A country without a political philosophy is like a ship drifting at random in mid-ocean, at the mercy of any chance wind, wave, or current. A ship whose passengers huddle in their cabins and cry, Don't rock the boat, for fear of discovering that the captain's bridge is empty. It is obvious that a boat which cannot stand rocking is doomed already, and that it had better be rocked hard if it is to regain its course. But this realization presupposes a grasp of facts, of reality, of principles, and a long-range view, all of which are precisely the things that the non-rockers are frantically struggling to evade. Just as a neurotic believes that the facts of reality will vanish if he refuses to recognize them, so today the neurosis of an entire culture leads men to believe that their desperate need of political principles and concepts will vanish if they succeed in obliterating all principles and concepts. But since, in fact, neither an individual nor a nation can exist without some form of ideology, this sort of anti-ideology is now the formal, explicit, dominant ideology of our bankrupt culture. This anti-ideology has a new and very ugly name. 
It is called government by consensus. If some demagogue were to offer us as a guiding creed the following tenets, that statistics should be substituted for truth, vote counting for principles, numbers for rights, and public polls for morality, that pragmatic range of the moment expediency should be the criterion of a country's interests, and that the number of its adherents should be the criterion of an idea's truth or falsehood, that any desire of any nature whatsoever should be accepted as a valid claim, provided it is held by a sufficient number of people, that a majority may do anything it pleases to a minority, in short, gang rule and mob rule, if a demagogue were to offer it, he would not get very far. Yet all of it is contained in and camouflaged by the notion of government by consensus. This notion is now being plugged not as an ideology, but as an anti-ideology, not as a principle, but as a means of obliterating principles, not as reason, but as rationalization, as a verbal ritual or a magic formula to assuage the national anxiety neurosis, a kind of pep pill or goofball for the non-boat rockers and a chance to play at deuces wild for the others. It is only today's lethargic contempt for the pronouncements of our political and intellectual leaders that blinds people to the meaning, implications, and consequences of a notion of government by consensus. You have all heard it, and I suspect dismissed it as politicians' oratory, giving no thought to its actual meaning. But that is what I urge you to consider. This book is continued on Capitalism, The Unknown Ideal, by Ayn Rand. Continued. Disc 8. It is only today's lethargic contempt for the pronouncements of our political and intellectual leaders that blinds people to the meaning, implications, and consequences of a notion of government by consensus. You have all heard it, and I suspect dismissed it as politicians' oratory, giving no thought to its actual meaning. But that is what I urge you to consider. A significant clue to that meaning was given in an article by Tom Wicker in the New York Times, October 11, 1964, referring to what Nelson Rockefeller used to call the mainstream of American thought, Mr. Wicker writes, That mainstream is what political theorists have been projecting for years as the national consensus, what Walter Lippmann has aptly called the vital center. Political moderation, almost by definition, is at the heart of a consensus. That is, the consensus generally sprawls over all acceptable political views, all ideas that are not totally repugnant to and do not directly threaten some major segment of the population. Therefore, acceptable ideas must take the views of others into account, and that is what is meant by moderation. Now let us identify what this means. The consensus generally sprawls over all acceptable political views. Acceptable to whom? To the consensus. And since the government is to be ruled by the consensus, this means that political views are to be divided into those which are acceptable and those which are unacceptable to the government. What would be the criterion of acceptability? Mr. Wicker supplies it. Observe that the criterion is not intellectual, not a question of whether certain views are true or false. The criterion is not moral, not a question of whether the views are right or wrong. The criterion is emotional, whether the views are or are not repugnant. To whom? To some major segment of the population. There is also the additional proviso that these views must not directly threaten that major segment. What about the minor segments of the population? Are the views that threaten them acceptable? What about the smallest segment, the individual? Obviously, the individual and the minority groups are not to be considered. No matter how repugnant an idea may be to a man, and no matter how gravely it may threaten his life, his work, his future, he is to be ignored or sacrificed by the omnipotent consensus and its government, unless he has a gang, a sizable gang, to support him. What exactly is a direct threat to any part of the population? In a mixed economy, every government action is a direct threat to some men and an indirect threat to all. Every government interference in the economy consists of giving an unearned benefit extorted by force to some men 
at the expense of others? By what criterion of justice is a consensus government to be guided by the size of the victim's gang? Now note Mr. Wicker's last sentence. Therefore, acceptable ideas must take the views of others into account, and that is what is meant by moderation. And just what is meant here by the views of others, of which others? Since it is not the views of individuals nor of minorities, the only discernible meaning is that every other major segment must take into account the views of all the other major segments. But suppose that a group of socialists wants to nationalize all factories, and a group of industrialists wants to keep its properties. What would it mean for either group to take into account the views of the other? And what would moderation consist of in such a case? What would constitute moderation in a conflict between a group of men who want to be supported at public expense and a group of taxpayers who have other uses for their money? What would constitute moderation in a conflict between the member of a smaller group, such as a Negro in the South, who believes that he has an inalienable right to a fair trial, and the larger group of Southern racists who believe that the public good of their community permits them to lynch him? What would constitute moderation in a conflict between me and a communist, or between our respective followers, when my views are that I have an inalienable right to my life, liberty, and happiness, and his views are that the public good of the state permits him to rob, enslave, or murder me? There can be no meeting ground, no middle, no compromise between opposite principles. There can be no such thing as moderation in the realm of reason and of morality, but reason and morality are precisely the two concepts abrogated by the notion of government by consensus. The advocates of that notion would declare at this point that any idea which permits no compromise constitutes extremism, that any form of extremism, any uncompromising stand, is evil, that the consensus sprawls only over those ideas which are amenable to moderation, and that moderation is the supreme virtue superseding reason and morality. This is the clue to the core, essence, motive, and real meaning of the doctrine of government by consensus, the cult of compromise. Compromise is the precondition, the necessity, the imperative of a mixed economy. The consensus doctrine is an attempt to translate the brute facts of a mixed economy into an ideological or anti-ideological system and to provide them with a semblance of justification. A mixed economy is a mixture of freedom and controls, with no principles, rules, or theories to define either. Since the introduction of controls necessitates and leads to further controls, it is an unstable, explosive mixture, which ultimately has to repeal the controls or collapse into dictatorship. A mixed economy has no principles to define its policies, its goals, its laws, no principles to limit the power of its government, the only principle of a mixed economy, which necessarily has to remain unnamed and unacknowledged, is that no one's interests are safe. Everyone's interests are on a public auction block, and anything goes for anyone who can get away with it. Such a system, or more precisely anti-system, breaks up a country into an ever-growing number of enemy camps, into economic groups fighting one another for self-preservation in an indeterminate mixture of defense and offense, as the nature of such a jungle demands. While politically a mixed economy preserves the semblance of an organized society with a semblance of law and order, economically it is the equivalent of the chaos that had ruled China for centuries, a chaos of robber gangs looting and draining the productive elements of the country. A mixed economy is ruled by pressure groups. It is an amoral, institutionalized civil war of special interests and lobbies, all fighting to seize a momentary control of the legislative machinery, to extort some special privilege at one another's expense by an act of government, i.e. by force. In the absence of individual rights, in the absence of any moral or legal principles, a mixed economy's only hope to preserve its precarious semblance of order, to restrain the savage, desperately rapacious groups it itself has created, and to prevent the legalized plunder from running over into plain, unlegalized looting of all by all, is compromise. Compromise on everything and in every realm, 
material, spiritual, intellectual, so that no group would step over the line by demanding too much and topple the whole rotted structure. If the game is to continue, nothing can be permitted to remain firm, solid, absolute, untouchable. Everything and everyone has to be fluid, flexible, indeterminate, approximate. By what standard are anyone's actions to be guided by the expediency of any immediate moment? The only danger to a mixed economy is any not-to-be-compromised value, virtue, or idea. The only threat is any uncompromising person, group, or movement. The only enemy is integrity. It is unnecessary to point out who will be the steady winners and who the constant losers in a game of that kind. It is also clear what sort of unity of consensus that game requires. The unity of a tacit agreement that anything goes, anything is for sale or for negotiation, and the rest is up for the free-for-all of pressuring, lobbying, manipulating, favor-swapping, public relationing, given-taking, double-crossing, begging, bribing, betraying, and chance, the blind chance, of a war in which the prize is the privilege of using legal armed force against legally disarmed victims. Observe that this type of prize establishes one basic interest held in common by all the players, the desire to have a strong government, a government of unlimited power, strong enough to let the winners and would-be winners get away with whatever they're seeking, a government uncommitted to any policy, unrestrained by any ideology, a government that hoards an ever-growing power, power for power's sake, which means for the sake and use of any major gang who might seize it momentarily to ram their particular piece of legislation down the country's throat. Observe, therefore, that the doctrine of compromise and moderation applies to everything except one issue, any suggestion to limit the power of the government. Observe the torrents of vilification, abuse, and hysterical hatred unleashed by the moderates against any advocate of freedom, i.e. of capitalism. Observe that such designations as extreme middle or militant middle are being used by people seriously and self-righteously. Observe the inordinately vicious intensity of the smear campaign against Senator Goldwater, which had the overtones of panic, the panic of the moderates, the vital centrists, the middle of the roaders, in the face of the possibility that a real pro-capitalism movement might put an end to their game, a movement, incidentally, which does not exist as yet, since Senator Goldwater was not an advocate of capitalism, and since his meaningless, unphilosophical, unintellectual campaign has contributed to the entrenchment of the consensus advocates. But what is significant here is the nature of their panic, it gave us a glimpse of their vaunted moderation, their democratic respect for the people's choices and their tolerance of disagreements or opposition. In a letter to the New York Times, June 23, 1964, an assistant professor of political science, fearing Goldwater's nomination, wrote as follows, The real danger lies in the divisive campaign which his nomination would provoke. The result of a Goldwater candidacy would be a divided and embittered electorate, and to be effective, American government requires a high degree of consensus and bipartisanship on basic issues. When and by whom has statism been accepted as the basic principle of America, and as a principle which should now be placed beyond debate or dissension, so that no basic issues are to be raised any longer? Isn't that the formula of a one-party government? The professor did not specify. Another letter writer in the New York Times, June 24, 1964, identified in print as a liberal Democrat, went a little farther. Let the American people choose in November. If they choose overwhelmingly for Lyndon Johnson and the Democrats, then once and for all the federal government can get on with no excuses with the job millions of Negroes, unemployed, aged, sick, and otherwise handicapped persons expect it to do, to say nothing of our overseas commitments. If the people choose Goldwater, then it would seem the nation was hardly worth saving after all. Woodrow Wilson once said that there is such a thing as being too proud to fight, then he had to go to war. Once and for all let us have it out, while the battle yet can be fought with ballots instead of bullets. 
Does this gentleman mean that if we don't vote his way, he will resort to bullets? Your guess is as good as mine. The New York Times, which had been a conspicuous advocate of government by consensus, said some curious things in its comment on President Johnson's victory. Its editorial of November 8, 1964, stated, No matter how massive the electoral victory, and it was massive, the administration cannot merely ride the crest of the popular wave, rolling along on a sea of platitudinous generalizations and euphoric promises. Now that it has a broad popular mandate, it has the moral as well as the political obligation not to try to be all things to all men, but to settle down to a hard, concrete, purposeful course of action. What kind of purposeful action? If the voters were offered nothing but platitudinous generalizations and euphoric promises, how can their vote be taken as a broad popular mandate? A mandate for an unnamed purpose? A political blank check? And if Mr. Johnson did win a massive victory by trying to be all things to all men, then which things is he now expected to be? Which voters is he to disappoint or betray? And what becomes of the broad popular consensus? Morally and philosophically, that editorial is highly dubious and contradictory. But it becomes clear and consistent in the context of a mixed economy's anti-ideology. The president of a mixed economy is not expected to have a specific program or policy. A blank check on power is all that he asks the voters to give him. Thereafter, it's up to the pressure group game, which everybody is supposed to understand and endorse but never mention. Which things he will be to which men depends on the chances of the game and on the major segments of the population. His job is only to hold the power and to dispense the favors. In the 1930s, the liberals had a program of broad social reforms and a crusading spirit. They advocated a planned society. They talked in terms of abstract principles. They propounded theories of a predominantly socialistic nature, and most of them were touchy about the accusation that they were enlarging the government's power. Most of them were assuring their opponents that government power was only a temporary means to an end, a noble end, the liberation of the individual from his bondage to material needs. Today, nobody talks of a planned society in the liberal camp. Long-range programs, theories, principles, abstractions, and noble ends are not fashionable any longer. Modern liberals deride any political concern with such large-scale matters as an entire society or an economy as a whole. They concern themselves with single, concrete-bound, range-of-the-moment projects and demands without regard to cost, context, or consequences. Pragmatic, not idealistic, is their favorite adjective when they are called upon to justify their stance, as they call it, not stand. They are militantly opposed to political philosophy. They denounce political concepts as tags, labels, myths, illusions, and resist any attempt to label, i.e. to identify, their own views. They are belligerently anti-theoretical, and with a faded mantle of intellectuality still clinging to their shoulders, they are anti-intellectual. The only remnant of their former idealism is a tired, cynical, ritualistic quoting of shop-worn humanitarian slogans when the occasion demands it. Cynicism, uncertainty, and fear are the insignia of the culture which they are still dominating by default, and the only thing that has not rusted in their ideological equipment but has grown savagely brighter and clearer through the years is their lust for power for an autocratic, statist, totalitarian government power. It is not a crusading brightness. It is not the lust of a fanatic with a mission. It is more like the glassy-eyed brightness of a somnambulist, whose stuporous despair has long since swallowed the memory of his purpose, but who still clings to his mystic weapon in the stubborn belief that there ought to be a law that everything will be all right if only somebody will pass a law, that every problem can be solved by the magic power of brute force. 
such is the present intellectual state and ideological trend of our culture. Now I shall ask you to consider the question I raised at the beginning of this discussion. Which of these two variants of statism are we moving toward, socialism or fascism? Let me submit in evidence, as part of the answer, a quotation from an editorial that appeared in the Washington Star, October 1964. It is an eloquent mixture of truth and misinformation, and a typical example of the state of today's political knowledge. Socialism is quite simply the state ownership of the means of production. This has never been proposed by a major party candidate for the presidency, and is not now proposed by Lyndon Johnson. True. There is, however, a whole series of American legislative acts that increase either government regulation of private business or government responsibility for individual welfare. True. It is to such legislation that warning cries of socialism refer. Besides the constitutional provision for federal regulation of interstate commerce, such intrusion of government into the marketplace begins with the antitrust laws. Very true. To them we owe the continued existence of competitive capitalism and the non-arrival of cartel capitalism. Untrue. Inasmuch as socialism is the product, one way or another, of cartel capitalism, untrue, it may reasonably be said that such government interference with business has in fact prevented socialism. Worse than untrue. As to welfare legislation, it is still light years away from the cradle-to-grave security sponsored by contemporary socialism. Not quite true. It seems much more like ordinary human concern for human distress than like an ideological program of any kind. The last part of this sentence is true. It is not an ideological program. As to the first part, Ordinary human concern for human distress does not manifest itself ordinarily in the form of a gun aimed at the wallets and earnings of one's neighbors. This editorial did not mention, of course, that a system in which the government does not nationalize the means of production but assumes total control over the economy is fascism. It is true that the welfare statists are not socialists that they never advocated or intended the socialization of private property, that they want to preserve private property with government control of its use and disposal. But that is the fundamental characteristic of fascism. Here is another piece of evidence. This one is less crudely naive than the first, and much more insidiously wrong. This is from a letter to the New York Times, November 1, 1964, written by an assistant professor of economics. Viewed by almost every yardstick, the United States today is more committed to private enterprise than probably any other industrial country, and is not even remotely approaching a socialist system. As the term is understood by students of comparative economic systems, and others who do not use it loosely, socialism is identified with extensive nationalization, a dominant public sector, a strong cooperative movement, egalitarian income distribution, a total welfare state, and central planning. In the United States, not only has there been no nationalization, but government concerns have been turned over to private enterprise. Income distribution in this country is one of the most unequal among the developed nations, and tax cuts and tax loopholes have blunted the moderate progressivity of our tax structure. Thirty years after the New Deal, the United States has a very limited welfare state, compared with the comprehensive social security and public housing schemes in many European countries. By no stretch of the imagination is the real issue in this campaign a choice between capitalism and socialism, or between a free and a planned economy. The issue is about two differing concepts of the role of government within the framework of an essentially private enterprise system. The role of government in a private enterprise system is that of a policeman who protects man's individual rights, including property rights, by protecting men from physical force. In a free economy, the government does not control, regulate, coerce, or interfere with men's economic activities. I do not know the political views of the writer of that letter. He may be a liberal, or he may be an alleged defender of capitalism, but if he is this last, 
then I must point out that such views as his, which are shared by many conservatives, are more damaging and derogatory to capitalism than the ideas of its avowed enemies. Such conservatives regard capitalism as a system compatible with government controls and thus help to spread the most dangerous misconceptions. While full laissez-faire capitalism has not yet existed anywhere, while some unnecessary government controls were allowed to dilute and undercut the original American system more through error than through theoretical intention, such controls were minor impediments. The mixed economies of the 19th century were predominantly free, and it is this unprecedented freedom that brought about mankind's unprecedented progress. The principles, the theory, and the actual practice of capitalism rest on a free, unregulated market, as the history of the last two centuries has amply demonstrated. No defender of capitalism can permit himself to ignore the exact meaning of the term laissez-faire and of the term mixed economy, which clearly indicates the two opposite elements involved in the mixture, the element of economic freedom, which is capitalism, and the element of government controls, which is statism. An insistent campaign has been going on for years to make us accept the Marxist view that all governments are tools of economic class interests and that capitalism is not a free economy, but a system of government controls serving some privileged class. The purpose of that campaign is to distort economics, rewrite history, and obliterate the existence and the possibility of a free country and an uncontrolled economy. Since a system of nominal private property ruled by government controls is not capitalism but fascism, the only choice this obliteration would leave us is the choice between fascism and socialism, or communism, which all the statists in the world of all varieties, degrees, and denominations are struggling frantically to make us believe. The destruction of freedom is their common goal, after which they hope to fight one another for power. It is thus that the views of that professor and of many conservatives lend credence and support to the vicious leftist propaganda which equates capitalism with fascism. But there is a bitter kind of justice in the logic of events. That propaganda is having an effect which may be advantageous to the communists, but which is the opposite of the effect intended by the liberals, the welfare statists, the socialists, who share the guilt of spreading it. Instead of smearing capitalism, that propaganda has succeeded in whitewashing and disguising fascism. In this country, few people care to advocate, to defend, or even to understand capitalism. Yet fewer still wish to give up its advantages. So if they are told that capitalism is compatible with controls, with the particular controls which further their particular interests, be it government handouts or minimum wages or price supports or subsidies or antitrust laws, or censorship of dirty movies, they will go along with such programs in the comforting belief that the results will be nothing worse than a modified capitalism. And thus a country which does abhor fascism is moving by imperceptible degrees through ignorance, confusion, evasion, moral cowardice, and intellectual default, not towards socialism or any mawkish altruistic ideal but toward a plain, brutal, predatory, power-grubbing, de facto fascism. No, we have not reached that stage, but we are certainly not an essentially private enterprise system any longer. At present we are a disintegrating, unsound, precariously unstable mixed economy, a random, mongrel mixture of socialistic schemes, communistic influences, fascist controls, and shrinking remnants of capitalism still paying the costs of it all, the total of it rolling in the direction of a fascist state. Consider our present administration. I don't think I'll be accused of unfairness if I say that President Johnson is not a philosophical thinker. No, he is not a fascist. He is not a socialist. He is not a pro-capitalist. Ideologically, he is not anything in particular. Judging by his past record and by the consensus of his own supporters, the concept of an ideology is not applicable in his case. He is a politician, 
a very dangerous yet very appropriate phenomenon in our present state. He is an almost fiction-like archetypical embodiment of the perfect leader of a mixed economy, a man who enjoys power for power's sake, who is expert at the game of manipulating pressure groups, of playing them all against one another, who loves the process of dispensing smiles, frowns, and favors, particularly sudden favors, and whose vision does not extend beyond the range of the next election. Neither President Johnson nor any of today's prominent groups would advocate the socialization of industry. Like his modern predecessors in office, Mr. Johnson knows that businessmen are the milk cows of a mixed economy, and he does not want to destroy them. He wants them to prosper and to feed his welfare projects, which the next election requires, while they, the businessmen, are eating out of his hand as they seem to be anxiously eager to do. The business lobby is certain to get its fair share of influence and of recognition, just like the labor lobby or the farm lobby or the lobby of any major segment, on his own terms. He will be particularly adept at the task of creating and encouraging the type of businessmen whom I call the aristocracy of pull. This is not a socialistic pattern. It is the typical pattern of fascism. The political, intellectual, and moral meaning of Mr. Johnson's policy toward businessmen was summed up eloquently in an article in the New York Times of January 4, 1965. Mr. Johnson is an out-and-out -out Keynesian in his assiduous wooing of the business community. Unlike President Roosevelt, who delighted in attacking businessmen until World War II forced him into a reluctant truce, and President Kennedy, who also incurred business hostility, President Johnson has worked long and hard to get businessmen to join ranks in a national consensus for his programs. This campaign may perturb many Keynesians, but it is pure Keynes. Indeed, Lord Keynes, who once was regarded as a dangerous and Machiavellian figure by American businessmen, made specific suggestions for improving relations between the president and the business community. He set down his views in 1938 in a letter to President Roosevelt, who was running into renewed criticism from businessmen following the recession that took place the previous year. Lord Keynes, who always sought to transform capitalism in order to save it, recognized the importance of business confidence and tried to convince Mr. Roosevelt to repair the damage that had been done. He advised the president that businessmen were not politicians and did not respond to the same treatment. They are, he wrote, much milder than politicians, at the same time allured and terrified by the glare of publicity, easily persuaded to be patriots, perplexed, bemused, indeed terrified, yet only too anxious to take a cheerful view, vain perhaps, but very unsure of themselves, pathetically responsive to a kind word. He was confident that Mr. Roosevelt could tame them and make them do his bidding, provided he followed some simple Keynesian rules. You could do anything you liked with them, the letter continued, if you would treat them, even the big ones, not as wolves and tigers, but as domestic animals by nature, even though they have been badly brought up and not trained as you would wish. President Roosevelt ignored his advice, so apparently did President Kennedy. But President Johnson seems to have got the message. By kind words and frequent pats on the head, he had had the business community eating out of his hand. Mr. Johnson appears to agree with Lord Keynes's view that there is little to be gained by carrying on a feud with businessmen. As he put it, if you work them into the surly, obstinate, terrified mood of which domestic animals wrongly handled are capable, the nation's burden will not get carried to market, and in the end public opinion will veer their way. The view of businessmen as domestic animals who carry the nation's burden and who must be trained by the president to do his bidding is certainly not a view compatible with capitalism. It is not a view applicable to socialism since there are no businessmen in a socialist state. It is a view that expresses the economic essence of fascism, of the relationship between business and government in a fascist state. No matter what the verbal camouflage, such is the actual meaning of any variant of transformed or modified or modernized or humanized capitalism. In all such doctrines, 
the humanization consists of turning some members of society, the most productive ones, into beasts of burden. The formula by which the sacrificial animals are to be fooled and tamed is being repeated today with growing insistence and frequency. Businessmen, it is said, must regard the government not as an enemy but as a partner. The notion of a partnership between a private group and public officials, between business and government, between production and force, is a linguistic corruption, an anti-concept typical of a fascist ideology, an ideology that regards force as the basic element and ultimate arbiter in all human relationships. Partnership is an indecent euphemism for government control. There can be no partnership between armed bureaucrats and defenseless private citizens who have no choice but to obey. What chance would you have against a partner whose arbitrary word is law, who may give you a hearing if your pressure group is big enough, but who will play favorites and bargain your interests away, who will always have the last word and the legal right to enforce it on you at the point of a gun, holding your property, your work, your future, your life in his power? Is that the meaning of partnership? But there are men who may find such a prospect attractive. They exist among businessmen as among every other group or profession. The men who dread the competition of a free market and would welcome an armed partner to extort special advantages over their abler competitors. Men who seek to rise not by merit but by pull. Men who are willing and eager to live not by right but by favor. Among businessmen, this type of mentality was responsible for the passage of the antitrust laws and is still supporting them today. A substantial number of Republican businessmen switched to the side of Mr. Johnson in the last election. Here are some interesting observations on this subject from a survey by the New York Times, September 16, 1964. Interviews in five cities in the industrial Northeast and Midwest disclose striking differences in political outlook between officials of large corporations and men who operate smaller businesses. The business executives who expect to cast the first Democratic presidential vote of their lives are nearly all affiliated with large companies. There is more support for President Johnson among business executives who are in their 40s and 50s than there is among either older or younger businessmen. Many businessmen in their 40s and 50s say they find relatively little shifting towards support of Mr. Johnson on the part of younger business executives. Interviews with those in their 30s confirm this. The younger executives themselves speak with pride of their generation as the one that interrupted and reversed the trend toward more liberalism in younger persons. It is on the issue of government deficits that the division of opinion between small and large businessmen emerges most dramatically. Officials of giant corporations have a far greater tendency to accept the idea that budget deficits are sometimes necessary and even desirable. The typical small businessman, however, reserves a very special scorn for deficit spending. This gives us an indication of who are the vested interests in a mixed economy and what such an economy does to the beginners or the young. An essential aspect of the socialistically inclined mentality is the desire to obliterate the difference between the earned and the unearned, and therefore to permit no differentiation between such businessmen as Hank Reardon and Orrin Boyle. To a concrete bound, range of the moment, primitive socialist mentality, a mentality that clamors for a redistribution of wealth without any concern for the origin of wealth, the enemy is all those who are rich regardless of the source of their riches. Such mentalities, those aging, graying liberals who had been the idealists of the thirties, are clinging desperately to the illusion that we are moving toward some sort of socialist state inimical to the rich and beneficial to the poor, while frantically evading the spectacle of what kind of rich are being destroyed and what kind are flourishing under the system they, the liberals, have established. The grim joke is on them. Their alleged ideals have paved the way not towards socialism, but toward fascism. The collector of their efforts is not the helplessly, brainlessly virtuous little man of their flat-footed imagination and shop-worn fiction, but the worst type of predatory rich, 
the rich by force, the rich by political privilege, the type who has no chance under capitalism, but who is always there to cash in on every collectivist noble experiment. It is the creators of wealth, the Hank Reardons, who are destroyed under any form of statism, socialist, communist, or fascist. It is the parasites, the Orrin Boyles, who are the privileged elite, and the profiteers of statism, particularly of fascism. The special profiteers of socialism are the James Taggarts, of communism the Floyd Ferrises. The same is true of their psychological counterparts among the poor, and among the men of all the economic levels in between. The particular form of economic organization, which is becoming more and more apparent in this country as an outgrowth of the power of pressure groups, is one of the worst variants of statism, guild socialism. Guild socialism robs the talented young of their future by freezing men into professional castes under rigid rules. It represents an open embodiment of the basic motive of most statists, though they usually prefer not to confess it the entrenchment and protection of mediocrity from abler competitors, the shackling of the men of superior ability down to the mean average of their professions. That theory is not too popular among socialists, though it has its advocates. But the most famous instance of its large-scale practice was fascist Italy. In the 1930s, a few perceptive men said that Roosevelt's New Deal was a form of guild socialism and it was closer to Mussolini's system than to any other. They were ignored. Today the evidence is unmistakable. It was also said that if fascism ever came to the United States, it would come disguised as socialism. In this connection, I recommend that you read or reread Sinclair Lewis's It Can't Happen Here, with special reference to the character, style, and ideology of Berzelius Windrip, the fascist leader. Now let me mention and answer some of the standard objections by which today's liberals attempt to camouflage to differentiate from fascism the nature of the system they are supporting. Fascism requires one-party rule. What will the notion of government by consensus amount to in practice? Fascism's goal is the conquest of the world. What is the goal of those global-minded bipartisan champions of the United Nations, and if they reach it, what positions do they expect to acquire in the power structure of one world? Fascism preaches racism. Not necessarily. Hitler's Germany did. Mussolini's Italy did not. Fascism is opposed to the welfare state. Check your premises and your history books. The father and originator of the welfare state, the man who put into practice the notion of buying the loyalty of some groups with money extorted from others, was Bismarck the political ancestor of Hitler. Let me remind you that the full title of the Nazi party was the National Socialist Workers' Party of Germany. Let me remind you also of some excerpts from the political program of that party, adopted in Munich on February 24, 1920. We ask that the government undertake the obligation above all of providing citizens with adequate opportunity for employment and earning a living. The activities of the individual must not be allowed to clash with the interests of the community, but must take place within its confines and be for the good of all. Therefore we demand an end to the power of the financial interests. We demand profit-sharing in big business. We demand a broad extension of care for the aged. We demand the greatest possible consideration of small business in the purchases of the national, state, and municipal governments. In order to make possible to every capable and industrious citizen the attainment of higher education and thus the achievement of a post of leadership, the government must provide an all-around enlargement of our entire system of public education. We demand the education at government expense of gifted children of poor parents. The government must undertake the improvement of public health by protecting mother and child, by prohibiting child labor, by the greatest possible support for all clubs concerned with the physical education of youth. We combat the materialistic spirit within and without us and are convinced that a permanent recovery of our people can only proceed from within on the foundation of the common good before the individual good. There is, however, one difference between the type of fascism toward which we are drifting 
and the type that ravaged European countries. Ours is not a militant kind of fascism, not an organized movement of shrill demagogues, bloody thugs, hysterical third-rate intellectuals, and juvenile delinquents. Ours is a tired, worn, cynical fascism, fascism by default, not like a flaming disaster, but more like the quiet collapse of a lethargic body, slowly eaten by internal corruption. Did it have to happen? No. Can it still be averted? Yes. If you doubt the power of philosophy to set the course and shape the destiny of human societies, observe that our mixed economy is the literal, faithfully carried out product of pragmatism and of the generation brought up under its influence. Pragmatism is the philosophy which holds that there is no objective reality or permanent truth, that there are no absolute principles, no valid abstractions, no firm concepts, that anything may be tried by rule of thumb, that objectivity consists of collective subjectivism, that whatever people wish to be true is true, whatever people wish to exist does exist, provided a consensus says so. If you want to avert the final disaster, it is this type of thinking, every one of those propositions and all of them, that you must face, grasp, and reject. Then you will have grasped the connection of philosophy to politics and to the daily events of your life. Then you will have learned that no society is better than its philosophical foundation. And then, to paraphrase John Galt, you will be ready not to return to capitalism, but to discover it. Chapter 21, The Wreckage of the Consensus, by Ayn Rand Two years ago, on April 18, 1965, I spoke at this forum on the subject of the new fascism, rule by Congress. I said, the clue to the core, essence, motive, and real meaning of the doctrine of government by consensus is the cult of compromise. Compromise is the precondition, the necessity, the imperative of a mixed economy. The consensus doctrine is an attempt to translate the brute facts of a mixed economy into an ideological or anti-ideological system and to provide them with a semblance of justification. The brute facts of a mixed economy are gang rule, i.e. a scramble for power by various pressure groups without any moral or political principles, without any program, direction, purpose, or long-range goal with the tacit belief in rule by force as their only common denominator, and unless the trend is changed, a fascist state as the ultimate result. In September of 1965, writing in the Objectivist newsletter, I said, Contrary to the fanatical belief of its advocates, compromise does not satisfy, but dissatisfies everyone. It does not lead to general fulfillment, but to general frustration. Those who try to be all things to all men end up by not being anything to anyone. It is startling to observe how rapidly this principle took effect in an age that takes no cognizance of principles. Where is President Johnson's consensus today, and where, politically, is President Johnson? To descend in two years in an era of seeming prosperity without the push of any obvious national disaster to descend from the height of a popular landslide to the status of a liability to his own party in the elections of 1966 is a feat that should give pause to anyone concerned with modern politics. If there were any way to make compromise work, President Johnson is the man who would have done it. He was an expert at the game of manipulating pressure groups, a game that consists of making promises and friends and keeping the second but not the first. His skill as a manipulator was the one characteristic that his public image builders were selling us at the height of his popularity. If he could not make it, no amateur can. The practical efficacy of compromise is the first premise that Johnson's history should prompt people to check. And I believe a great many people are checking it. People, but not Republicans, or at least not all of them not those who are now pushing an unformed, soft-shelled thing like Romney to succeed where a pro has failed. What are we left with now that the consensus has collapsed? Nothing but the open spectacle of a mixed economy's intellectual and moral bankruptcy, the random wreckage of its naked mechanism, 
with the screeching of its gears as the only sound in our public silence. The sound of crude, range-of-the-moment demands by pressure groups who have abandoned even the pretense at any political ideals or moral justification. The consensus doctrine was a disguise, a shoddy cheesecloth one, but still a disguise, to give a semblance of theoretical status to the practice of plain gang warfare. Today even the cheesecloth is gone, leaving the anti-ideology to function in the open more brazenly than ever. A political ideology is a set of principles aimed at establishing or maintaining a certain social system. It is a program of long-range action, with the principles serving to unify and integrate particular steps into a consistent course. It is only by means of principles that men can project the future and choose their actions accordingly. Anti-ideology consists of the attempts to shrink men's minds down to the range of the immediate moment, without regard to past or future, without context or memory, above all without memory, so that contradictions cannot be detected, and errors or disasters can be blamed on the victims. In anti-ideological practice, principles are used implicitly and are relied upon to disarm the opposition, but are never acknowledged and are switched at will when it suits the purpose of the moment. Whose purpose? The gang's. Thus men's moral criterion becomes not my view of the good or of the right or of the truth, but my gang, right or wrong. This is what makes today's public issues and discussions so sickeningly false and futile. Most issues rest on so many wrong premises and carry so many contradictions that instead of the question who is right, one is constantly and tacitly confronted with the question which gang do you want to support? For example, consider the issue of the war in Vietnam. Everything is wrong about that hideous mess, but not for the reasons which are shouted most loudly, starting from its designation. A cold war is a brazen contradiction in terms. It is not very cold for the American soldiers killed on battlefields, nor for their families, nor for any of us. A cold war is a typically Hegelian term. It rests on the premise that A is non-A, that things are not what they are so long as we don't name them, or practically speaking, things are what our leaders tell us they are, and unless they tell us, we have no way of knowing. This sort of epistemology is not working too well, even in regard to the ignorant hordes of Russian peasants. That this should be attempted in regard to American citizens is perhaps the most disgraceful symptom of our cultural disintegration. When men are being killed by a foreign army in military action, it is a war, a whole war, and nothing but a war, regardless of what temperature anyone chooses to ascribe to it. But observe what advantages the Hegelian terminology offers to the leaders of a mixed economy. When a country is at war, it has to use all of its power to fight and win as fast as possible. It cannot fight and non-fight at the same time. It cannot send its soldiers to die as cannon fodder, forbidding them to win. When a country is at war, its leaders cannot prattle about cultural exchanges and about building bridges to the enemy, as our leaders are doing, trade bridges to bolster the enemy's economy and enable it to produce the planes and guns which are killing our own soldiers. A country at war often resorts to smearing its enemy by spreading atrocity stories, a practice which a free civilized country need not and should not resort to. A civilized country with a free press can let the facts speak for themselves. But what is the moral, intellectual state of a country that spreads smears and atrocity stories about itself and ignores or suppresses the facts known about the enemy's atrocities? What is the moral, intellectual state of a country that permits its citizens to stage parades carrying the enemy's, the Viet Cong's flag? or to collect funds for the enemy on university campuses. What makes this possible? The claim that we are not allegedly at war, only at cold war. A country's morale is crucially important in wartime. In World War II, the British Lord Haw Haw was properly regarded as a traitor for the crime of trying to undercut the British soldiers' morale by broadcasting scare stories about Nazi Germany's invincible power. 
In a Cold War such as we have today, Lord Haw Haw's job is performed by our own public leaders. The sickening scare stories about escalation, about our fear of war with China, would be morally shameful if indulged in by the leaders of Monaco or Luxembourg. When they come from the leaders of the most powerful country on earth, shameful is not an adequate word to describe their moral meaning. If a country knows that it cannot fight another country, it does not undertake to fight. If a country is actually weak, it does not go into battle screaming, Please don't take me seriously, I won't go very far. It does not proclaim its fear as proof of its desire for peace. There is only one sense in which that ghastly phenomenon has to be classified as a non-war. The United States has nothing to gain from it. Wars are the second greatest evil that human societies can perpetrate. The first is dictatorship, the enslavement of their own citizens, which is the cause of wars. When a nation resorts to war, it has some purpose, rightly or wrongly, something to fight for, and the only justifiable purpose is self-defense. If you want to see the ultimate suicidal extreme of altruism on an international scale, observe the war in Vietnam, a war in which American soldiers are dying for no purpose whatever. This is the ugliest evil of the Vietnam War, that it does not serve any national interest of the United States, that it is a pure instance of blind, senseless, altruistic, self-sacrificial slaughter. This is the evil, not the revolting stuff that the Vietniks are howling about. None of us knows why we are in that war, how we got in, or what will take us out. Whenever our public leaders attempt to explain it to us, they make the mystery greater. They tell us simultaneously that we are fighting for the interests of the United States, and that the United States has no selfish interests in that war. They tell us that communism is the enemy, and they attack, denounce, and smear any anti-communists in this country. They tell us that the spread of communism must be contained in Asia, but not in Africa. They tell us that communist aggression must be resisted in Vietnam, but not in Europe. They tell us that we must defend the freedom of South Vietnam, but not the freedom of East Germany, Poland, Hungary, Latvia, Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia, Katanga, etc. They tell us that North Vietnam is a threat to our national security, but Cuba is not. They tell us that we must defend South Vietnam's right to hold a democratic election and to vote itself into communism, if it wishes, provided it does so by vote, which means that we are not fighting for any political ideal or any principle of justice, but only for unlimited majority rule, and that the goal for which American soldiers are dying is to be determined by somebody else's vote. They tell us also that we must force South Vietnam to accept communists into a coalition government, a process by which we delivered China to the communists, which fact we must not mention. They tell us that we must defend South Vietnam's right to national self-determination, and that anyone upholding the national sovereignty of the United States is an isolationist, that nationalism is evil, that the globe is our homeland and we must be prepared to die for any part of it, except the continent of North America. Is it any wonder that no one believes the pronouncements of our public leaders any longer, neither the American people nor foreign nations? Our anti-ideologists are beginning to worry about this problem, but in their typical style, they do not say that somebody is lying, they say that there exists a credibility gap. Observe the terms in which the war in Vietnam is discussed. There are no stated goals, no intellectual issues. But there are apparently two opposing sides which are designated not by any specific ideological concepts, but by images which is appropriate to the primitive epistemology of savages, the hawks and the doves. But the hawks are cooing apologetically and the doves are snarling their heads off. The same groups that coined the term isolationist in World War II to designate anyone who held that the internal affairs of other countries are not the responsibility of the United States. These same groups are screaming that the United States has no right to interfere in the internal affairs of Vietnam. Nobody has proposed a goal which, if achieved, would terminate that war, except President Johnson, who has offered a billion dollars as the price of peace. Not a billion dollars paid to us, but a billion dollars paid by us for the economic development of Vietnam. 
which means that we are fighting for the privilege of turning every American taxpayer into a serf laboring part of his time for the benefit of his Vietnamese masters. But, demonstrating that irrationality is not a monopoly of the United States, North Vietnam has rejected that offer. No, there is no proper solution for the war in Vietnam. It is a war we should never have entered. To continue it is senseless. To withdraw from it would be one more act of appeasement on our long, shameful record. The ultimate result of appeasement is a world war, as demonstrated by World War II. In today's context, it may mean a nuclear world war. That we let ourselves be trapped into a situation of that kind is the consequence of fifty years of a suicidal foreign policy. One cannot correct a consequence without correcting its cause. If such disasters could be solved pragmatically, i.e. out of context, on the spur and range of the moment, a nation would not need any foreign policy. And this is an example of why we do need a policy based on long-range principles, i.e. an ideology. But a revision of our foreign policy from its basic premises on up is what today's anti-ideologists dare not contemplate. The worse its results, the louder our public leaders proclaim that our foreign policy is bipartisan. A proper solution would be to elect statesmen, if such appeared, with a radically different foreign policy, a policy explicitly and proudly dedicated to the defense of America's rights and national self-interests, repudiating foreign aid and all forms of international self-immolation. On such a policy, we could withdraw from Vietnam at once, and the withdrawal would not be misunderstood by anyone, and the world would have a chance to achieve peace. But such statesmen do not exist at present. In today's conditions, the only alternative is to fight that war and win it as fast as possible, and thus gain time to develop new statesmen with a new foreign policy before the old one pushes us into another Cold War, just as the Cold War in Korea pushed us into Vietnam. The institution that enables our leaders to indulge in such recklessly irresponsible ventures is the military draft. The question of the draft is perhaps the most important single issue debated today, but the terms in which it is being debated are a sorry manifestation of our anti-ideological mainstream. Of all the statist violations of individual rights in a mixed economy, the military draft is the worst. It is an abrogation of rights. It negates man's fundamental right, the right to life, and establishes the fundamental principle of statism, that a man's life belongs to the state, and the state may claim it by compelling him to sacrifice it in battle. Once that principle is accepted, the rest is only a matter of time. If the state may force a man to risk death or hideous maiming and crippling in a war declared at the state's discretion, for a cause he may neither approve of nor even understand, if his consent is not required to send him into unspeakable martyrdom, then in principle all rights are negated in that state, and its government is not man's protector any longer. What else is there left to protect? The most immoral contradiction in the chaos of today's anti-ideological groups is that of the so-called conservatives, who posture as defenders of individual rights, particularly property rights, but uphold and advocate the draft. By what infernal evasion can they hope to justify the proposition that creatures who have no right to life have the right to a bank account? A slightly higher, though not much higher, rung of hell should be reserved for those liberals who claim that man has the right to economic security, public housing, medical care, education, recreation, but no right to life, or that man has the right to livelihood, but not to life. One of the notions used by all sides to justify the draft is that rights impose obligations. Obligations to whom? And imposed by whom? Ideologically, that notion is worse than the evil it attempts to justify. It implies that rights are a gift from the state, and that a man has to buy them by offering something, his life, in return. Logically, that notion is a contradiction. Since the only proper function of a government is to protect man's rights, it cannot claim title to his life in exchange for that protection. The only obligation involved in individual rights is an obligation imposed not by the state, but by the nature of reality. 
i.e. by the law of identity, consistency, which in this case means the obligation to respect the rights of others if one wishes one's own rights to be recognized and protected. Politically, the draft is clearly unconstitutional. No amount of rationalization, neither by the Supreme Court nor by private individuals, can alter the fact that it represents involuntary servitude. A volunteer army is the only proper, moral, and practical way to defend a free country. Should a man volunteer to fight if his country is attacked? Yes, if he values his own rights and freedom. A free or even semi-free country has never lacked volunteers in the face of foreign aggression. Many military authorities have testified that a volunteer army, an army of men who know what they are fighting for and why, is the best, most effective army, and that a drafted one is the least effective. It is often asked, but what if a country cannot find a sufficient number of volunteers? Even so, this would not give the rest of the population a right to the lives of the country's young men. But in fact, the lack of volunteers occurs for one or two reasons. One, if a country is demoralized by a corrupt authoritarian government, its citizens will not volunteer to defend it. But neither will they fight for long if drafted. For example, observe the literal disintegration of the Tsarist Russian army in World War I. Two, if a country's government undertakes to fight a war for some reason other than self-defense, for a purpose which the citizens neither share nor understand, it will not find many volunteers. Thus, a volunteer army is one of the best protectors of peace, not only against foreign aggression, but also against any warlike ideologies or projects on the part of a country's own government. Not many men would volunteer for such wars as Korea or Vietnam. Without the power to draft, the makers of our foreign policy would not be able to embark on adventures of that kind. This is one of the best practical reasons for the abolition of the draft. Consider another practical reason. The age of large mass armies is past. A modern war is a war of technology. It requires a highly trained scientific personnel, not hordes of passive, unthinking, bewildered men. It requires brains, not brawn, intelligence, not blind obedience. One can force men to die. One cannot force them to think. Observe that the more technological branches of our armed services, such as the Navy and the Air Force, do not accept draftees and are made up of volunteers. The draft, therefore, applies only to the least efficacious and, in today's conditions, the least essential part of our armed forces, the infantry. If so, then is national defense the main consideration of those who advocate and uphold the draft? The practical question of the country's military protection is not the issue at stake. It is not the chief concern of the draft's supporters. Some of them may be motivated by routine, traditional notions and fears, but on a national scale there is a deeper motive involved. When a vicious principle is accepted implicitly, it does not take long to become explicit. Pressure groups are quick to find practical advantages in its logical implications. For instance, in World War II, the military draft was used as a justification for proposals to establish labor conscription, i.e. compulsory labor service for the entire population, with the government empowered to assign anyone to any job of its choice. If men can be drafted to die for their country, it was argued, why can't they be drafted to work for their country? Two bills embodying such proposals were introduced in Congress, but fortunately were defeated. The second of those bills had an interesting quirk. Drafted labor, it proposed, would be paid a union scale of wages, in order not to undercut union scales. But in fairness to the military draftees, the labor draftees would be given only the equivalent of army pay, and the rest of their wages would go to the government. What political group do you suppose came up with a notion of this kind? Both bills were introduced by Republicans and were defeated by organized labor, which was the only large economic group standing between us and a totalitarian state. Now observe the terms in which the draft is being debated today. The main reason advanced for the continuation of the draft is not military, but financial. It is generally conceded that the draft is unnecessary, but, it is argued, a volunteer army would cost too much. As matters stand, the Army is one of the lowest-paid groups in the country. 
a drafted soldier's pay in cash or equivalent, i.e. including room and board, amounts to about one dollar an hour. To attract volunteers, it would be necessary to offer higher pay and better conditions, thus making an army career comparable to the standards of the civilian labor market. No exact estimates of the cost of a volunteer army have been offered, but the approximate estimate places it at about four billion dollars a year. Hold this figure in mind. Hold it while you read about our national budget in the daily papers, and while you will hold also, clearly and specifically, the image of what this figure would buy. The years from about 15 to 25 are the crucial formative years of a man's life. This is the time when he confirms his impressions of the world, of other men, of the society in which he is to live, when he acquires conscious convictions, defines his moral values, chooses his goals and plans his future, developing or renouncing ambition. These are the years that mark him for life, and it is these years that an allegedly humanitarian society forces him to spend in terror. The terror of knowing that he can plan nothing and count on nothing, that any road he takes can be blocked at any moment by an unpredictable power, that barring his vision of the future there stands the gray shape of the barracks, and perhaps beyond it, death for some unknown reason in some alien jungle. A pressure of that kind is devastating to a young man's psychology if he grasps the issue consciously, and still worse if he doesn't. The first thing he's likely to give up in either case is his intellect. An intellect does not function on the premise of its own impotence. If he acquires the conviction that existence is hopeless, that his life is in the hands of some enormous, incomprehensible evil, if he develops a helpless, searing contempt for the hypocrisy of his elders and a profound hatred for all mankind, if he seeks to escape from that inhuman psychological pressure by turning to the beatnik cult of the immediate moment, by screaming, Now, 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 he has nothing else but that now, or by dulling his terror and killing the last of his mind with LSD, don't blame him. Brothers, you asked for it. This is what four billion dollars would buy. This is what it would spare him and every other young man in the country and every person who loves them. Remember, down what drains our money is being poured today. According to the federal budget for fiscal year 1968, we will spend $4.5 billion on foreign aid and allied projects, $5.3 billion on space programs, $11.3 billion on just one of the many, many departments dealing with public welfare, yet we claim that we cannot afford $4 billion to save our youth from the agony of a mangling, brutalizing psychological torture. But, of course, the real motive behind that social crime is not financial. The issue of costs is merely a rationalization. The real motive may be detected in the following statement made by Lieutenant General Louis B. Hershey, Director of the Selective Service System, on June 24, 1966. I am not concerned with the uncertainty involved in keeping our citizenry believing that they owe something to their country. There are too many, too many people that think individualism has to be completely recognized, even if the group rights go to the devil. The same motive was made fully clear in a proposal which was advanced by Secretary of Defense Robert S. McNamara and is now being plugged with growing insistence by the press. On May 18, 1966, Mr. McNamara said the following, As matters stand, our present selective system draws on only a minority of eligible young men. That is an inequity. It seems to me that we could move toward remedying that inequity by asking every young person in the United States to give two years of service to his country, whether in one of the military services, in the Peace Corps, or in some other volunteer developmental work at home or abroad. Developmental work devoted to whose development? Apparently planting rice or digging ditches in Asia, Africa, and South America constitutes service to the United States, but preparing oneself for a productive career does not. This book is continued on Disc 9. Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal by Ayn Rand. Continued. Disc 9. Developmental work devoted to whose development? 
Apparently, planting rice or digging ditches in Asia, Africa, and South America constitutes service to the United States. But preparing oneself for a productive career does not. Teaching our own illiterates in hillbilly regions or city slums constitutes service to the United States, but going to college does not. Teaching retarded children to weave baskets constitutes service to the United States, but acquiring a Ph.D. does not. Isn't the unnamed principle clear? Developing yourself into a productive, ambitious, independent person is not regarded as a value to the United States. Turning yourself into an abject, sacrificial animal is. This, I submit, is a moral obscenity. Whatever country such a principle could apply to, it is not the United States. It is not even Soviet Russia, where they do destroy the minds of their youth, but not in so mawkishly, wantonly senseless a manner. That proposal represents the naked essence of altruism in its pure and fully consistent form. It does not seek to sacrifice men for the alleged benefit of the state. It seeks to sacrifice them for the sake of the sacrifice. It seeks to break man's spirit, to destroy his mind, his ambition, his self-esteem, his self-confidence, his self, during the very years when he is in the process of acquiring them. Mr. McNamara's trial balloon did not go over too well at first. There were outcries of protest and indignation, which compelled the government to issue a hasty disclaimer. The Johnson administration, said the New York Times of May 20, 1966, quickly made it plain today that it had no plans to draft young Americans for civilian duty or to let such duty become an alternative to military service. The same news story said that officials called upon to interpret his, McNamara's, words stressed that he had suggested asking rather than compelling young people to serve. Well, I want to stress that if a government intends to ask rather than compel, it does not choose the Secretary of Defense to do the asking, and he does not ask it in the context of a passage dealing with the military draft. The suggestion of voluntary service under a threat to one's life is blackmail. Blackmail directed at the entire American youth. Blackmail demanding their surrender into explicit serfdom. After that initial suggestion, obviously as an intermediary step to condition the sacrificial animals, the statist altruist gangs began to plug the notion of voluntary social service. On September 14, 1966, James Reston of the New York Times quoted President Johnson as saying, I do hope to see a day when some form of voluntary service to the community and the nation and the world is as common in America as going to school, when no man has truly lived who only served himself. The motivation of all this is obvious. The draft is not needed for military purposes. It is not needed for the protection of this country. But the statists are struggling not to relinquish the power it gave them and the unnamed principle and precedent it established. Above all, not to relinquish the principle that man's life belongs to the state. This is the real issue, and the only issue, and there is no way to fight it or to achieve the abolition of the draft except by upholding the principle of man's right to his own life. There is no way to uphold that right without a full, consistent, moral, political ideology. But that is not the way the issue is now debated by the frantic anti-ideologists of all sides. It is the conservatives, the alleged defenders of freedom and capitalism, who should be opposing the draft. They are not. They are supporting it. Early in the presidential election campaign of 1964, Barry Goldwater made a vague suggestion favoring the abolition of the draft, which aroused the public's hopeful attention. He promptly dropped it and devoted his campaign to denouncing the morals of Bobby Baker. Who brought the issue of the draft into public focus and debate, demanding its repeal? The extreme left, the Vietniks and Peaceniks. In line with the anti-ideological methods of all other groups, the Vietniks, whose sympathies are on the side of Russia, China, and North Vietnam, are screaming against the draft in the name of their individual rights. Individual rights, believe it or not. They are proclaiming their right to choose which war they'll fight in while sympathizing with countries where the individual does not even have the right to choose and utter a thought of his own. What is still worse is the fact that they are the only group that even mentions individual rights.
if newspaper reports are to be trusted. But of all this anti-ideological mess, I would pick one small incident as morally the worst. I quote from the New York Times of February 6, 1967. Leaders of 15 student organizations, representing both political extremes as well as the center, called today for the abolition of the draft and the encouragement of volunteer service in humanitarian pursuits. In a resolution ending a two-day conference on the draft and national service at the Shoreham Hotel, Washington, D.C., the student leaders declared, The present draft system, with its inherent injustices, is incompatible with traditional American principles of individual freedom within a democratic society, and for this reason the draft should be eliminated. An urgent need exists within our society for young people to become involved in the elimination of such social ills as ignorance, poverty, racial discrimination, and war. Among those who signed the resolution were leading members of the left-wing Students for a Democratic Society, the right-wing Young Americans for Freedom, and the moderate Youth and College Division of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Although no unanimity on concrete recommendations was arrived at, Mr. Chickering, the sponsor of the conference, said he believed that most of the student leaders favored his proposal for the creation of a system of voluntary national service. Under this proposal, students at campuses throughout the country will be asked to fill out cards expressing their willingness to serve in humanitarian work. Observe the formulation, traditional American principles of individual freedom within a democratic society, instead of individual right to life. What is individual freedom within a democratic society? What is a democratic society? Individual freedom is not a primary political principle and cannot be defined, defended, or practiced without the primary principle of individual rights. And a democratic society traditionally means unlimited majority rule. This is an example of the method by which today's anti-ideologists are obliterating the concept of rights. Observe also that the leaders of the conservative Young Americans for Freedom signed a document of that kind. These are not men who are being whipped. These are men who take the lash obediently and whip themselves. Politically, that proposal is much worse than the draft. The draft, at least, offers the excuse that one is serving one's own country in time of danger. And its political implications are diluted by a long historical tradition associated with patriotism. But if young men accept the belief that it is their duty to spend their irreplaceable formative years on growing rice and carrying bedpans, they're done for psychologically, and so is this country. The same news story carried some shocking statistics on the attitude of college students at large. It quoted a poll conducted by the National Students Association at 23 campuses throughout the country. If that poll is to be trusted, Approximately 75% said they preferred the establishment of some means to allow work in the Peace Corps, the Teachers Corps, or volunteers in service to America as an alternative to military service. About 90%, however, said they believed that the government has a right to conscript its citizens, and 68% thought such conscription was necessary in periods other than those of a declared national emergency. This is an example on a grand scale of what I call the sanction of the victim. It is also an example of the fact that men cannot be enslaved politically until they have been disarmed ideologically. When they are so disarmed, it is the victims who take the lead in the process of their own destruction. Such is the swamp of contradictions swallowing the two most immediately prominent issues of today, Vietnam and the draft. The same is true of all the other issues and pseudo-issues now clogging all the avenues of public communication. And adding insult to injury, the anti-ideologists who are responsible for it are complaining about the public's lethargy. Lethargy is only a precarious psychological cover for confusion, disgust, and despair. The country at large is bitterly dissatisfied with the status quo, disillusioned with the stale slogans of welfare statism, and desperately seeking an alternative, i.e. an intelligible program and course. The intensity of that need may be gauged by the fact that a single good speech raised a man who had never held public office to the governorship of California. The statists of both parties, 
who are now busy smearing Governor Reagan, are anxious not to see and not to let others discover the real lesson and meaning of his election, that the country is starved for a voice of consistency, clarity, and moral self-confidence, which were the outstanding qualities of his famous speech, and which cannot be achieved or projected by consensus-seeking anti-ideologists. As of this date, Governor Reagan seems to be a promising public figure. I do not know him and cannot speak for the future. It is difficult to avoid a certain degree of skepticism. We have been disappointed too often. But whether he lives up to the promise or not, the people's need, quest for, and response to clear-cut ideas remain a fact, and will become a tragic fact if the intellectual leaders of this country continue to ignore it. Since the elections of 1966, some commentators have been talking about the country's swing to the right. There was no swing to the right, except perhaps in California. There was only a swing against the left, if by right we mean capitalism and by left statism. Without a firm, consistent ideological program and leadership, the people's desperate protest will be dissipated in the blind alleys of the same statism that they are opposing. It is futile to fight against if one does not know what one is fighting for. A merely negative trend or movement cannot win, and historically has never won. It leads nowhere. The consensus doctrine has achieved the exact opposite of its alleged goal. Instead of creating unity or agreement, it has disintegrated and atomized the country to such an extent that no communication, let alone agreement, is possible. It is not unity but intellectual coherence that a country needs. That coherence can be achieved only by fundamental principles, not by compromises among groups of men, by the primacy of ideas, not of gangs. The task of defining ideas and goals is not the province of politicians and is not accomplished at election time. Elections are merely consequences. The task belongs to the intellectuals. The need is more urgent than ever. Postscript Once in a while I receive letters from young men asking me for personal advice on problems connected with the draft. Morally, no one can give advice in any issue where choices and decisions are not voluntary. Morality ends where a gun begins. As to the practical alternatives available, the best thing to do is to consult a good lawyer. There is, however, one moral aspect of the issue that needs clarification. Some young men seem to labor under the misapprehension that since the draft is a violation of their rights, compliance with the draft law would constitute a moral sanction of that violation. This is a serious error. A forced compliance is not a sanction. All of us are forced to comply with many laws that violate our rights, but so long as we advocate the repeal of such laws, our compliance does not constitute a sanction. Unjust laws have to be fought ideologically. They cannot be fought or corrected by means of mere disobedience and futile martyrdom. To quote from an editorial on this subject in the April 1967 issue of Persuasion, one does not stop the juggernaut by throwing oneself in front of it. Chapter 22 The Cashing In The Student Rebellion by Ayn Rand the so-called student rebellion, which was started and keynoted at the University of California at Berkeley, has profound significance, but not of the kind that most commentators have ascribed to it, and the nature of the misrepresentations is part of its significance. The events at Berkeley began in the fall of 1964 ostensibly as a student protest against the university administration's order forbidding political activity, specifically the recruiting fundraising and organizing of students for political action off campus on a certain strip of ground adjoining the campus which was owned by the university. Claiming that their rights had been violated, a small group of rebels rallied thousands of students of all political views, including many conservatives, and assumed the title of the free speech movement. The movement staged sit-in protests in the administration building and committed other acts of physical force such as assaults on the police and the seizure of a police car for use as a rostrum. The spirit, style, and tactics of the rebellion are best illustrated by one particular incident. The university administration called a mass meeting, which was attended by 18,000 students and faculty members, 
to hear an address on the situation by the university president, Clark Kerr. It had been expressly announced that no student speakers would be allowed to address the meeting. Kerr attempted to end the rebellion by capitulating. He promised to grant most of the rebels' demands. It looked as if he had won the audience to his side, whereupon Mario Savio, the rebel leader, seized the microphone in an attempt to take over the meeting, ignoring the rules and the fact that the meeting had been adjourned. When he was properly dragged off the platform, the leaders of the FSM admitted openly and jubilantly that they had almost lost their battle but had saved it by provoking the administration to an act of violence, thus admitting that the victory of their publicly proclaimed goals was not the goal of their battle. What followed was nationwide publicity of a peculiar kind. It was a sudden and seemingly spontaneous outpouring of articles, studies, surveys, revealing a strange unanimity of approach in several basic aspects. In ascribing to the FSM the importance of a national movement, unwarranted by the facts, in blurring the facts by means of unintelligible generalities, in granting to the rebels the status of spokesmen for American youth, acclaiming their idealism and commitment to political action, hailing them as a symptom of the awakening of college students from political apathy. If ever a puff job was done by a major part of the press, this was it. In the meantime, what followed at Berkeley was a fierce three-cornered struggle among the university administration, the Board of Regents, and its faculty, a struggle so sketchily reported in the press that its exact nature remains fog-bound. One can gather only that the regents were apparently demanding a tough policy toward the rebels, that the majority of the faculty were on the rebels' side, and that the administration was caught in the moderate middle of the road. The struggle led to the permanent resignation of the university's chancellor, as the rebels had demanded, the temporary resignation and later reinstatement of President Kerr, and ultimately an almost complete capitulation to the FSM with the administration granting most of the rebels' demands. These included the right to advocate illegal acts and the right to an unrestricted freedom of speech on campus. To the astonishment of the naive, this did not end the rebellion. The more demands were granted, the more were made. As the administration intensified its efforts to appease the FSM, the FSM intensified its provocations. The unrestricted freedom of speech took the form of a filthy language movement, which consisted of students carrying placards with four-letter words and broadcasting obscenities over the university loudspeakers, which movement was dismissed with mild reproof by most of the press as a mere adolescent prank. This apparently was too much even for those who sympathized with the rebellion. The FSM began to lose its following and was eventually dissolved. Mario Savio quit the university, declaring that he could not keep up with the undemocratic procedures that the administration is following, and departed reportedly to organize a nationwide revolutionary student movement. This is a bare summary of the events as they were reported by the press, but some revealing information was provided by volunteers outside the regular news channels, such as in the letters to the editor columns. An eloquent account was given in a letter to the New York Times, March 31, 1965, by Alexander Grendon, a biophysicist in the Donner Laboratory, University of California. The FSM has always applied coercion to ensure victory. One-party democracy, as in the communist countries or the lily-white portions of the South, corrects opponents of the party line by punishment. The punishment of the recalcitrant university administration and more than 20,000 students who avoided participation in the conflict was to bring the university to a grinding halt by physical force. To capitulate to such corruption of democracy is to teach students that these methods are right. President Kerr capitulated repeatedly. Kerr agreed that the university would not control advocacy of illegal acts an abstraction until illustrated by examples. In a university lecture hall, a self-proclaimed anarchist advises students how to cheat to escape military service. A nationally known communist uses the university facilities to condemn our government in vicious terms for its action in Vietnam, while funds to support the Viet Cong are illegally solicited. 
Propaganda for the use of marijuana with instructions where to buy it is openly distributed on campus. Even the abstraction obscenity is better understood when one hears a speaker using the university's amplifying equipment describe in vulgar words his experiences in group sexual intercourse and homosexuality and recommend these practices, while another suggests students should have the same sexual freedom on campus as dogs. Clark Kerr's negotiation, a euphemism for surrender, on each deliberate defiance of orderly university processes contributes not to a liberal university, but to a lawless one. David S. Landis, professor of history, Harvard University, made an interesting observation in a letter to the New York Times, December 29, 1964, stating that the Berkeley Revolt represents potentially one of the most serious assaults on academic freedom in America, he wrote, in conclusion, I should like to point out the deleterious implications of this dispute for the University of California. I know personally of five or six faculty members who are leaving, not because of lack of sympathy with free speech or political action, but because, as one put it, who wants to teach at the University of Saigon? The clearest account and most perceptive evaluation were offered in an article in the Columbia University Forum, Spring 1965, entitled What's Left at Berkeley, by William Peterson, professor of sociology at the University of California at Berkeley. He writes, The first fact one must know about the free speech movement is that it has little or nothing to do with free speech. If not free speech, what then is the issue? In fact, preposterous as this may seem, the real issue is the seizure of power. That a tiny number, a few hundred, out of a student body of more than 27,000, was able to disrupt the campus is the consequence of more than vigor and skill in agitation. This minuscule group could not have succeeded in getting so many students into motion without three other, at times unwitting, sources of support. Off-campus assistance of various kinds, the university administration, and the faculty. Everyone who has seen the efficient, almost military organization of the agitators' program has a reasonable basis for believing that skilled personnel and money are being dispatched into the Berkeley battle. Around the Berkeley community, a dozen ad hoc committees to support this or that element of the student revolt sprang up spontaneously, as though out of nowhere. The course followed by the university administration could hardly have better fostered a rebellious student body if it had been devised to do so. To establish dubious regulations, and when they are attacked, to defend them by unreasonable argument is bad enough. Worse still, the university did not impose on the students any sanctions that did not finally evaporate. Obedience to norms is developed when it is suitably rewarded, and when noncompliance is suitably punished. That professional educators should need to be reminded of this axiom indicates how deep the roots of the Berkeley crisis lie. But the most important reason that the extremists won so many supporters among the students was the attitude of the faculty. Perhaps their most notorious capitulation to the FSM was a resolution passed by the Academic Senate on December 8th, by which the faculty notified the campus not only that they supported all of the radicals' demands, but also that, in effect, they were willing to fight for them against the Board of Regents, should that become necessary. When that resolution passed by an overwhelming majority, 824 to 115 votes, it effectively silenced the anti-FSM student organizations. The free speech movement is reminiscent of the communist fronts of the 1930s, but there are several important differences. The key feature that a radical core uses legitimate issues ambiguously in order to manipulate a large mass is identical. The core in this case, however, is not the disciplined Communist Party, but a heterogeneous group of radical sects. Professor Peterson lists the various socialist, Trotskyist, communist, and other groups involved. His conclusion is, The radical leaders on the Berkeley campus, like those in Latin American or Asian universities, are not the less radical for being in many cases outside the discipline of a formal political party. They are defined not by whether they pay dues to a party, but by their actions, their vocabulary, their way of thinking. 
The best term to describe them, in my opinion, is Castroite. This term, he explains, applies primarily to their choice of tactics, to the fact that, in critical respects, all of them imitate the Castro movement. At Berkeley, provocative tactics applied not against a dictatorship, but against the liberal, divided, and vacillating university administration proved to be enormously effective. Each provocation and subsequent victory led to the next. Professor Peterson ends his article on a note of warning. By my diagnosis, not only has the patient, the university, not recovered, but he is sicker than ever. The fever has gone down temporarily, but the infection is spreading and becoming more virulent. Now let us consider the ideology of the rebels, from such indications as were given in the press reports. The general tone of the reports was best expressed by a headline in the New York Times, March 15, 1965. The New Student Left Movement represents serious activists in drive for changes. What kind of changes? No specific answer was given in the almost full-page story, just changes. Some of these activists, who liken their movement to a revolution, want to be called radicals. Most of them, however, prefer to be called organizers. Organizers of what? Of deprived people. For what? No answer, just organizers. Most express contempt for any specific labels, and they don't mind being called cynics. The great majority of those questioned said they were as skeptical of communism as they were of any other form of political control. You might say we're a communist, said one of them, just as you might say we're amoral and a almost everything else. There are exceptions, however. A girl from the University of California, one of the leaders of the Berkeley Revolt, is quoted as saying, At present the socialist world, even with all its problems, is moving closer than any other countries toward the sort of society I think should exist. In the Soviet Union it has almost been achieved. Another student from the City College of New York is quoted as concurring. The Soviet Union and the whole socialist bloc are on the right track, he said. In view of the fact that most of the young activists were active in the civil rights movement, and that the Berkeley rebels had started by hiding behind the issue of civil rights, attempting unsuccessfully to smear all opposition as of racist origin, it is interesting to read that there is little talk among the activists about racial integration. Some of them consider the subject passé. They declare that integration will be almost as evil as segregation if it results in a complacent middle-class interracial society. The central theme and basic ideology of all the activists is anti-ideology. They are militantly opposed to all labels, definitions, and theories. They proclaim the supremacy of the immediate moment and commitment to action, to subjectively, emotionally motivated action. Their anti-intellectual attitude runs like a stressed light motif through all the press reports. An article in the New York Times Magazine, February 14, 1965, declares, The Berkeley mutineers did not seem political in the sense of those student rebels in the turbulent thirties. They are too suspicious of all adult institutions to embrace wholeheartedly even those ideologies with a stake in smashing the system. An anarchist or IWW strain seems as pronounced as any Marxist doctrine. Theirs is a sort of political existentialism, says Paul Jacobs, a research associate at the university's Center for the Study of Law and Society, who is one of the FSM's applauders. All the old labels are out. The proudly immoderate zealots of the FSM pursue an activist creed that only commitment can strip life of its emptiness, its absence of meaning in a great knowledge factory like Berkeley. An article in the Saturday Evening Post, May 8, 1965, discussing the various youth groups on the left, quotes a leader of Students for a Democratic Society. We began by rejecting the old sectarian left and its ancient quarrels, and with a contempt for American society which we saw as depraved. We are interested in direct action and specific issues. We do not spend endless hours debating the nature of Soviet Russia, or whether Yugoslavia is a degenerate workers' state. And, with sit-ins we saw for the first time the chance for direct participation in meaningful social revolution. 
in their off-picket line hours, states the same article, the PL, Progressive Labor Youngsters, hang out at the experimental theaters and coffee shops of Manhattan's East Village. Their taste in reading runs more to Sartre than to Marx. With an interesting touch of unanimity, a survey in Newsweek, March 22, 1965, quotes a young man on the other side of the continent. These students don't read Marx, said one Berkeley free student movement leader. They read Camus. If they are rebels, the survey continues, they are rebels without an ideology and without long-range revolutionary programs. They rally over issues, not philosophies, and seem unable to formulate or sustain a systemized political theory of society either from the left or right. Today's student seeks to find himself through what he does, not what he thinks, the survey declares explicitly, and quotes some adult authorities in sympathetic confirmation. What you have now, as in the 30s, says New York Post editor James A. Wexler, are groups of activists who really want to function in life, but not ideologically. We used to sit around and debate Marxism, but students now are working for civil rights and peace. Richard Unsworth, chaplain at Dartmouth, is quoted as saying, In the world of today's campus, the avenue now is doing, and then reflecting on your doing, instead of reflecting, then deciding, and then doing, the way it was a few years ago. Paul Goodman, described as writer, educator, and one of the students' current heroes, is quoted as hailing the Berkeley movement because the leaders of the insurrection, he says, didn't play it cool, they took risks. They were willing to be confused. They didn't know whether it all would be a success or a failure. Now they don't want to be cool anymore. They want to take over. The same tribute could be paid to any drunken driver. The theme of taking over is repeated again and again. The immediate target, apparently, is the takeover of the universities. The New York Times Magazine article quotes one of the FSM leaders, our idea is that the university is composed of faculty, students, books, and ideas. In a literal sense, the administration is merely there to make sure the sidewalks are kept clean. It should be the servant of the faculty and the students. The climax of this particular line was a news story in the New York Times, March 29, 1965, under the heading, Collegians Adopt a Bill of Rights. A group of Eastern College students declared here in Philadelphia this weekend that college administrators should be no more than housekeepers in the educational community. The modern college or university, they said, should be run by the students and the professors. Administrators would be maintenance, clerical, and safety personnel whose purpose is to enforce the will of faculty and students. A manifesto to this effect was adopted at a meeting held at the University of Pennsylvania and attended by 200 youths. From 39 colleges in the Philadelphia and New York areas, Harvard, Yale, the University of California at Berkeley, and from schools in the Midwest. A recurring theme in the meeting was that colleges and universities had become servants of the financial, industrial, and military establishment, and that students and faculty were being sold down the river by administrators. Among the provisions of the manifesto were declarations of freedom to join, organize, or hold meetings of any organization, abolition of tuition fees, Control of law enforcement by the students and faculty, an end to the reserve officer training corps, abolition of loyalty oaths, student-faculty control over curriculum. The method used to adopt that manifesto is illuminating. About 200 students attended the meeting, 45 remaining until the end when the Student Bill of Rights was adopted. So much for democratic procedures and for the activists' right to the title of spokesman for American youth. What significance is ascribed to the student rebellion by all these reports and by the authorities they choose to quote? Moral courage is not a characteristic of today's culture, but in no other contemporary issue has moral cowardice been revealed to such a naked, ugly extent. Not only do most of the commentators lack an independent evaluation of the events, not only do they take their cue from the rebels, but of all the rebels' complaints, it is the most superficial, irrelevant, and therefore the safest that they choose to support and to accept as the cause of the rebellion, the complaint that the universities have grown too big. As if they had mushroomed overnight, 
the bigness of the universities is suddenly decried by the consensus as a national problem and blamed for the unrest of the students whose motives are hailed as youthful idealism. In today's culture it has always been safe to attack bigness, and since the meaningless issue of mere size has long served as a means of evading real issues on all sides of all political fences, a new catchphrase has been added to the list of big business, big labor, big government, etc. Big University For a more sophisticated audience, the socialist magazine The New Leader, December 21, 1964, offers a Marxist-Freudian appraisal, ascribing the rebellion primarily to alienation, quoting Savio, somehow people are being separated off from something, and to generational revolt. Spontaneously, the natural idiom of the student political protest was that of sexual protest against the forbidding university administrator who ruled in loco parentis. But the prize for expressing the moral intellectual essence of today's culture should go to Governor Brown of California. Remember that the University of California is a state institution, that its regents are appointed by the governor, and that he, therefore, was the ultimate target of the revolt, including all its manifestations from physical violence to filthy language. Have we made our society safe for students with ideas, said Governor Brown at a campus dinner. We have not. Students have changed, but the structure of the university and its attitudes towards its students have not kept pace with that change. Therefore, some students felt they had the right to go outside the law to force the change, but in so doing they displayed the height of idealistic hypocrisy. On the one hand, they held up the federal constitution demanding their rights of political advocacy, but at the same time they threw away the principle of due process in favor of direct action. In doing so, they were as wrong as the university. This, then, is the great challenge that faces us, the challenge of change. Consider the fact that Governor Brown is generally regarded as a powerful chief executive, and by California Republicans as a formidable opponent. Consider the fact that, according to the California Public Opinion Poll, 74% of the people disapprove of the student protest movement in Berkeley. Then observe that Governor Brown did not dare denounce a movement led or manipulated by a group of 45 students, and that he felt obliged to qualify the term hypocrisy by the adjective idealistic, thus creating one of the weirdest combinations in today's vocabulary of evasion. Now observe that in all that mass of comments, appraisals, and interpretations, including the ponderous survey in Newsweek, which offered statistics on every imaginable aspect of college life, not one word was said about the content of modern education, about the nature of the ideas that are being inculcated by today's universities. Every possible question was raised and considered except, what are the students taught to think? This apparently was what no one dared discuss. This is what we shall now proceed to discuss. If a dramatist had the power to convert philosophical ideas into real flesh-and-blood people and attempted to create the walking embodiments of modern philosophy, the result would be the Berkeley Rebels. These activists are so fully, literally, loyally, devastatingly the products of modern philosophy that someone should cry to the university administrations and faculties, Brothers, you asked for it! Mankind could not expect to remain unscathed after decades of exposure to the radiation of intellectual fission debris, such as reason is impotent to know things as they are, reality is unknowable, certainty is impossible, knowledge is mere probability, truth is that which works, mind is a superstition, logic is a social convention, ethics is a matter of subjective commitment to an arbitrary postulate, and the consequent mutations are those contorted young creatures who scream in chronic terror that they know nothing and want to rule everything. If that dramatist were writing a movie, he could justifiably entitle it Mario Savio, Son of Immanuel Kant. With rare and academically neglected exceptions, the philosophical mainstream that seeps into every classroom, subject, and brain in today's universities is epistemological agnosticism, avowed irrationalism, 
ethical subjectivism. Our age is witnessing the ultimate climax, the cashing in on a long process of destruction at the end of the road laid out by Kant. Ever since Kant divorced reason from reality, his intellectual descendants have been diligently widening the breach. In the name of reason, pragmatism established a range-of-the-moment view as an enlightened perspective on life, context dropping as a rule of epistemology, expediency as a principle of morality, and collective subjectivism as a substitute for metaphysics. Logical positivism carried it farther, and in the name of reason elevated the immemorial psycho-epistemology of shyster lawyers to the status of a scientific epistemological system by proclaiming that knowledge consists of linguistic manipulations. Taking this seriously, linguistic analysis declared that the task of philosophy is not to identify universal principles, but to tell people what they mean when they speak, which they are otherwise unable to know, which last by that time was true in philosophical circles. This was the final stroke of philosophy breaking its moorings and floating off like a lighter-than-air balloon, losing any semblance of connection to reality, any relevance to the problems of man's existence. No matter how cautiously the proponents of such theories skirted any reference to the relationship between theory and practice, no matter how coyly they struggled to treat philosophy as a parlor or classroom game, the fact remained that young people went to college for the purpose of acquiring theoretical knowledge to guide them in practical action. Philosophy teachers evaded questions about the application of their ideas to reality by such means as declaring that reality is a meaningless term, or by asserting that philosophy has no purpose other than the amusement of manufacturing arbitrary constructs, or by urging students to temper every theory with common sense, the common sense they had spent countless hours trying to invalidate. As a result, a student came out of a modern university with the following sediment left in his brain by his four to eight years of study. Existence is an uncharted, unknowable jungle. Fear and uncertainty are man's permanent state. Skepticism is the mark of maturity. Cynicism is the mark of realism. And above all, the hallmark of an intellectual is the denial of the intellect. When and if academic commentators gave any thought to the practical results of their theories, they were predominantly united in claiming that uncertainty and skepticism are socially valuable traits which would lead to tolerance of differences, flexibility, social adjustment, and willingness to compromise. Some went so far as to maintain explicitly that intellectual certainty is the mark of a dictatorial mentality and that chronic doubt, the absence of firm convictions, the lack of absolutes, is the guarantee of a peaceful, democratic society. They miscalculated. It has been said that Kant's dichotomy led to two lines of Kantian philosophers, both accepting his basic premises but choosing opposite sides, those who chose reason, abandoning reality, and those who chose reality, abandoning reason. The first delivered the world to the second. The collector of the Kantian rationalizer's efforts, the receiver of the bankrupt shambles of sophistry, casuistry, sterility, and abysmal triviality to which they had reduced philosophy, was existentialism. Existentialism, in essence, consists of pointing to modern philosophy and declaring, since this is reason, to hell with it. In spite of the fact that the pragmatists, positivists, analysts had obliterated reason, the existentialists accepted them as reason's advocates, held them up to the world as examples of rationality, and proceeded to reject reason altogether, proclaiming its impotence, rebelling against its failure, calling for a return to reality, to the problems of human existence, to values, to action, to subjective values and mindless action. In the name of reality, they proclaimed the moral supremacy of instincts, urges, feelings, and the cognitive powers of stomachs, muscles, kidneys, hearts, blood. It was a rebellion of headless bodies. The battle is not over. 
The philosophy departments of today's universities are the battleground of a struggle which in fact is only a family quarrel between the analysts and the existentialists. Their progeny are the activists of the student rebellion. If these activists choose the policy of doing and then reflecting on your doing, hasn't pragmatism taught them that truth is to be judged by consequences? If they seem unable to formulate or sustain a systematized political theory of society, yet shriek with moral righteousness that they propose to achieve their social goals by physical force, hasn't logical positivism taught them that ethical propositions have no cognitive meaning and are merely a report on one's feelings or the equivalent of emotional ejaculations? If they are savagely blind to everything but the immediate moment, Hasn't logical positivism taught them that nothing else can be claimed with certainty to exist? And while the linguistic analysts are busy demonstrating that the cat is on the mat, does not mean that the mat is an attribute of the cat, nor that on the mat is the genus to which the cat belongs, nor yet that the cat equals on the mat. Is it any wonder that students stormed the Berkeley campus with placards inscribed Strike Now, Analyze Later? This slogan is quoted by Professor Peterson in the Columbia University Forum. On June 14th, CBS televised a jumbled, incoherent, unintelligible, and for these very reasons authentic and significant, documentary entitled The Berkeley Story. There is method in every kind of madness, and for those acquainted with modern philosophy, that documentary was like a display of sideshow mirrors, throwing off twisted reflections and random echoes of the carnage perpetrated in the academic torture chambers of the mind. Our generation has no ideology, declared the first boy interviewed, in the tone of defiance and hatred once reserved for saying, down with Wall Street, clearly projecting that the enemy now is not the so-called robber barons but the mind. The older generation, he explained scornfully, had a neat little pill to solve everything, but the pill didn't work and they merely got their hearts busted. We don't believe in pills, he said. We've learned that there are no absolute rules, said a young girl, hastily and defensively, as if uttering an axiom, and proceeded to explain inarticulately, with the help of gestures pointing inward, that we make rules for ourselves and that what is right for her may not be right for others. A girl described her classes as words, 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 paper, 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 and quietly, in a tone of authentic despair, said that she stopped at times to wonder, what am I doing here? I'm not learning anything. An intense young girl who talked volubly, never quite finishing a sentence nor making a point, was denouncing society in general, trying to say that since people are social products, Society has done a bad job. In the middle of a sentence, she stopped and threw in as a casual aside, Whatever way I turn out, I still am a product. Then went on. She said it with the simple earnestness of a conscientious child, acknowledging a self-evident fact of nature. It was not an act. The poor little creature meant it. The helpless bewilderment on the face of Harry Reasoner, the commentator, when he tried to sum up what he had presented, was an eloquent indication of why the press is unable properly to handle the student rebellion. Now, immediacy, any situation must be solved now, he said incredulously, describing the rebels' attitude, neither praising nor blaming, in the faintly astonished, faintly helpless tone of a man unable to believe that he is seeing savages running loose on the campus of one of America's great universities. Such are the products of modern philosophy. They are the type of students who are too intelligent not to see the logical consequences of the theories they have been taught, but not intelligent or independent enough to see through the theories and reject them. So they scream their defiance against the system, not realizing that they are its most consistently docile pupils, that theirs is a rebellion against the status quo by its archetypes, against the intellectual establishment by its robots who have swallowed every shop-worn premise of the liberals of the 1930s, including the catchphrase of altruism, the dedication to deprived people, to such a safely conventional cause as the war on poverty. 
a rebellion that brandishes banners inscribed with bromides, is not a very convincing nor very inspiring sight. As in any movement, there is obviously a mixture of motives involved. There are the little shysters of the intellect who have found a gold mine in modern philosophy, who delight in arguing for argument's sake and stumping opponents by means of ready-to-wear paradoxes. There are the little role-players who fancy themselves as heroes and enjoy defiance for the sake of defiance. There are the nihilists who, moved by a profound hatred, seek nothing but destruction for the sake of destruction. There are the hopeless dependents who seek to belong to any crowd that would have them. And there are the plain hooligans who are always there on the fringes of any mob action that smells of trouble. Whatever the combination of motives, neurosis is stamped in capital letters across the whole movement, since there is no such thing as rejecting reason through an innocent error of knowledge. But whether the theories of modern philosophy serve merely as a screen, a defense mechanism, a rationalization of neurosis, or are in part its cause, the fact remains that modern philosophy has destroyed the best in these students and fostered the worst. Young people do seek a comprehensive view of life, i.e. a philosophy. They do seek meaning, purpose, ideals, and most of them take what they get. It is in their teens and early twenties that most people seek philosophical answers and set their premises for good or evil for the rest of their lives. Some never reach that stage. Some never give up the quest but the majority are open to the voice of philosophy for a few brief years. These last are the permanent, if not innocent, victims of modern philosophy. They are not independent thinkers nor intellectual originators. They are unable to answer or withstand the flood of modern sophistries. So some of them give up, after one or two unintelligible courses, convinced that thinking is a waste of time, and turn into lethargic cynics or stultified babbits by the time they reach twenty-five. Others accept what they hear. They accept it blindly and literally. These are today's activists. And no matter what tangle of motives now moves them, every teacher of modern philosophy should cringe in their presence, if he is still open to the realization that it is by means of the best within them, by means of their twisted, precarious groping for ideas, that he has turned them into grotesque little monstrosities. Now what happens to the better minds in modern universities, to the students of above-average intelligence who are actually eager to learn? What they find and have to endure is a long, slow process of psycho-epistemological torture. Directly or indirectly, the influence of philosophy sets the epistemological standards and methods of teaching for all departments in the physical sciences as well as in the humanities. The consequence today is a chaos of subjective whims setting the criteria of logic, of communication, demonstration, evidence, proof, which differ from class to class, from teacher to teacher. I'm not speaking of a difference in viewpoint or content, but of the absence of basic epistemological principles and the consequent difference in the method of functioning required of a student's mind. It is as if each course were given in a different language, each requiring that one think exclusively in that language, none providing a dictionary. The result, to the extent that one would attempt to comply, is intellectual disintegration. Add to this the opposition to system building, i.e. to the integration of knowledge, with the result that the material taught in one class contradicts the material taught in the others, each subject hanging in a vacuum, and to be accepted out of context, while any questions on how to integrate it are rejected, discredited, and discouraged. Add to this the arbitrary, senseless, haphazard conglomeration of most curricula, the absence of any hierarchical structure of knowledge, any order, continuity, or rationale, the jumble of courses on out-of-context minutiae and out-of-focus surveys, the all-pervading unintelligibility, the arrogantly self-confessed irrationality, and consequently the necessity to memorize rather than learn, to recite rather than understand, to hold in one's mind a cacophony of undefined jargon long enough to pass the next exam. Add to this 
the professors who refuse to answer questions, the professors who answer by evasion and ridicule, the professors who turn their classes into bull sessions on the premise that we're here to mull things over together, the professors who do lecture but in the name of anti-dogmatism take no stand, express no viewpoint, and leave the students in a maze of contradictions with no lead to a solution, the professors who do take a stand and invite the students' comments then penalize dissenters by means of lower grades, particularly in political courses. Add to this the moral cowardice of most university administrations, the policy of permanent moral neutrality, of compromising on anything, of evading any conflict at any price, and the students' knowledge that the worst classroom injustice will remain uncorrected, that no appeal is practicable and no justice is to be found anywhere. Yes, of course, there are exceptions. There are competent educators, brilliant minds, and rational men on the university staffs. But they are swallowed in the rampaging mainstream of irrationality and too often defeated by the hopeless pessimism of bitter, long-repressed frustration. And further, most professors and administrators are much more competent and rational as individuals than they are in their collective performance. Most of them realize and privately complain about the evils of today's educational world. But each of them feels individually impotent before the enormity of the problem, so they blame it on some nameless, disembodied, almost mystical power which they designate as the system and too many of them take it to be a political system, specifically capitalism. They do not realize that there is only one human discipline which enables men to deal with large-scale problems, which has the power to integrate and unify human activities, and that that discipline is philosophy, which they have set instead to the task of disintegrating and destroying their work. What does all this do to the best minds among the students? Most of them endure their college years with the teeth-clenched determination of serving out a jail sentence. The psychological scars they acquire in the process are incalculable, but they struggle as best they can to preserve their capacity to think, sensing dimly that the essence of the torture is an assault on their mind. And what they feel toward their schools ranges from mistrust to resentment to contempt to hatred, intertwined with a sense of exhaustion and excruciating boredom. To various extents and various degrees of conscious awareness, these feelings are shared by the entire pyramid of the student body, from intellectual top to bottom. This is the reason why the handful of Berkeley rebels was able to attract thousands of students who did not realize at first the nature of what they were joining, and who withdrew when it became apparent. Those students were moved by a desperate, incoherent frustration, by a need to protest, not knowing fully against what, by a blind desire to strike out at the university somehow. I asked a small group of intelligent students at one of New York's best universities, who were ideologically opposed to the rebels, whether they would fight for the university administration if the rebellion came to their campus. All of them shook their heads with faint, wise, bitter smiles. The philosophical impotence of the older generation is the reason why the adult authorities, from the Berkeley administration to the social commentators to the press to Governor Brown, were unable to take a firm stand and had no rational answer to the Berkeley Rebellion. Granting the premises of modern philosophy, logic was on the side of the rebels. To answer them would require a total philosophical reevaluation down to basic premises, which none of those adults would dare attempt. Hence, the incredible spectacle of brute force, hoodlum tactics, and militantly explicit irrationality being brought to a university campus, and being met by the vague, uncertain, apologetic concessions, the stale generalities, the evasive platitudes of the alleged defenders of academic law and order. In a civilized society, a student's declaration that he rejects reason and proposes to act outside the bounds of rationality, would be taken as sufficient grounds for immediate expulsion, let alone if he proceeded to engage in mob action and physical violence on a university campus. But modern universities have long since lost the moral right to oppose the first, 
and are therefore impotent against the second. The student rebellion is an eloquent demonstration of the fact that when men abandon reason they open the door to physical force as the only alternative and the inevitable consequence. The rebellion is also one of the clearest refutations of the argument of those intellectuals who claimed that skepticism and chronic doubt would lead to social harmony. When men reduce their virtues to the approximate, then evil acquires the force of an absolute. When loyalty to an unyielding purpose is dropped by the virtuous, it's picked up by scoundrels, and you get the indecent spectacle of a cringing, bargaining, traitorous good and a self-righteously uncompromising evil. Atlas shrugged. Who stands to profit by that rebellion? The answer lies in the nature and goals of its leadership. If the rank and file of the college rebels are victims, at least in part, this cannot be said of their leaders. Who are their leaders? Any and all of the statist collectivist groups that hover like vultures over the remnants of capitalism, hoping to pounce on the carcass and to accelerate the end whenever possible. Their minimal goal is just to make trouble, to undercut, to confuse, to demoralize, to destroy. Their ultimate goal is to take over. To such leadership, the college rebels are merely cannon fodder, intended to stick their headless necks out, to fight on campuses, to go to jail, to lose their careers and their future, and, eventually, if the leadership succeeds, to fight in the streets and lose their non-absolute lives, paving the way for the absolute dictatorship of whoever is the bloodiest among the thugs scrambling for power. Young fools who refuse to look beyond the immediate now have no way of knowing whose long-range goals they are serving. The communists are involved, among others, but like the others, they are merely the manipulators, not the cause of the student rebellion. This is an example of the fact that whenever they win, they win by default, like germs feeding on the sores of a disintegrating body. They did not create the conditions that are destroying American universities. They did not create the hordes of embittered, aimless, neurotic teenagers, but they do know how to attack through the sores which their opponents insist on evading. They are professional ideologists and it is not difficult for them to move into an intellectual vacuum and to hang the cringing advocates of anti-ideology by their own contradictions. For its motley leftist leadership, the student rebellion is a trial balloon, a kind of cultural temperature-taking. It is a test of how much they can get away with and what sort of opposition they will encounter. For the rest of us, it is a miniature preview in the microcosm of the academic world of what is to happen to the country at large if the present cultural trend remains unchallenged. The country at large is a mirror of its universities. The practical result of modern philosophy is today's mixed economy with its moral nihilism, its range-of-the-moment pragmatism, its anti-ideological ideology, and its truly shameful recourse to the notion of government by consensus. Rule by pressure groups is merely the prelude, the social conditioning for mob rule. Once a country has accepted the obliteration of moral principles, of individual rights, of objectivity, of justice, of reason, and has submitted to the rule of legalized brute force, the elimination of the concept legalized does not take long to follow. Who is to resist it? And in the name of what? When numbers are substituted for morality, and no individual can claim a right, but any gang can assert any desire whatever, when compromise is the only policy expected of those in power, and the preservation of the moment's stability, of peace at any price, is their only goal, the winner necessarily is whoever presents the most unjust and irrational demands. The system serves as an open invitation to do so. If there were no communists or other thugs in the world, such a system would create them. The more an official is committed to the policy of compromise, the less able he is to resist anything. To give in is his instinctive response in any emergency, his basic principle of conduct which makes him an easy mark. In this connection, the extreme of naive superficiality was reached by those commentators who expressed astonishment 
that the student rebellion had chosen Berkeley as its first battleground and President Kerr as its first target in spite of his record as a liberal and as a renowned mediator and arbitrator. Ironically, some of the least mature student spokesmen tried to depict Mr. Kerr as the illiberal administrator, said an editorial in the New York Times, March 11, 1965. This was, of course, absurd in view of Mr. Kerr's long and courageous battle to uphold academic freedom and students' rights in the face of those right-wing pressures that abound in California. Other commentators pictured Mr. Kerr as an innocent victim caught between the conflicting pressures of the conservatives on the Board of Regents and the liberals on the faculty. But in fact and in logic, the middle of the road can lead to no other final destination, and it is clear that the rebels chose Clark Kerr as their first target, not in spite of, but because of his record. Now project what would happen if the technique of the Berkeley Rebellion were repeated on a national scale. Contrary to the fanatical belief of its advocates, compromise does not satisfy, but dissatisfies everybody. It does not lead to general fulfillment, but to general frustration. Those who try to be all things to all men end up by not being anything to anyone, and more, the partial victory of an unjust claim encourages the claimant to try further. The partial defeat of a just claim discourages and paralyzes the victim. If a determined, disciplined gang of statists were to make an assault on the crumbling remnants of a mixed economy, boldly and explicitly proclaiming the collectivist tenets which the country had accepted by tacit default, what resistance would they encounter? The dispirited, demoralized, embittered majority would remain lethargically indifferent to any public event and many would support the gang at first, moved by a desperate incoherent frustration, by a need to protest, not knowing fully against what, by a blind desire to strike out somehow at the suffocating hopelessness of the status quo. Who would feel morally inspired to fight for Johnson's consensus? Who fought for the aimless platitudes of the Kerensky government in Russia, or the Weimar Republic in Germany, or the nationalist government in China? But no matter how badly demoralized and philosophically disarmed a country might be, it has to reach a certain psychological turning point before it can be pushed from a state of semi-freedom into surrender to full-fledged dictatorship. And this was the main ideological purpose of the student rebellion's leaders, whoever they were, to condition the country to accept force as the means of settling political controversies. Observe the ideological precedents which the Berkeley rebels were striving to establish. All of them involved the abrogation of rights and the advocacy of force. These notions have been publicized, yet their meaning has been largely ignored and left unanswered. 1. The main issue was the attempt to make the country accept mass civil disobedience as a proper and valid tool of political action. This attempt has been made repeatedly in connection with the civil rights movement. But there, the issue was confused by the fact that the Negroes were the victims of legalized injustice, and therefore the matter of breaching legality did not become unequivocally clear. The country took it as a fight for justice, not as an assault on the law. Civil disobedience may be justifiable in some cases when and if an individual disobeys a law in order to bring an issue to court as a test case. Such an action involves respect for legality and a protest directed only at a particular law which the individual seeks an opportunity to prove to be unjust. The same is true of a group of individuals, when and if the risks involved are their own. But there is no justification in a civilized society for the kind of mass civil disobedience that involves the violation of the rights of others, regardless of whether the demonstrator's goal is good or evil. The end does not justify the means. No one's rights can be secured by the violation of the rights of others. Mass disobedience is an assault on the concept of rights. It is a mob's defiance of legality as such. The forcible occupation of another man's property or the obstruction of a public thoroughfare is so blatant a violation of rights that an attempt to justify it becomes an abrogation of morality. An individual has no right to do a sit-in in the home or office of a person he disagrees with, 
and he does not acquire such a right by joining a gang. Rights are not a matter of numbers, and there can be no such thing in law or in morality as actions forbidden to an individual but permitted to a mob. The only power of a mob as against an individual is greater muscular strength, i.e. plain brute physical force. The attempt to solve social problems by means of physical force is what a civilized society is established to prevent. The advocates of mass civil disobedience admit that their purpose is intimidation. A society that tolerates intimidation as a means of settling disputes, the physical intimidation of some men or groups by others, loses its moral right to exist as a social system, and its collapse does not take long to follow. Politically, mass civil disobedience is appropriate only as a prelude to civil war, as the declaration of a total break with a country's political institutions. And the degree of today's intellectual chaos and context dropping was best illustrated by some conservative California official who rushed to declare that he objects to the Berkeley Rebellion but respect civil disobedience as a valid American tradition. Don't forget the Boston Tea Party, he said, forgetting it. If the meaning of civil disobedience is somewhat obscured in the civil rights movement, and therefore the attitude of the country is inconclusive, that meaning becomes blatantly obvious when a sit-in is staged on a university campus. If the universities, the supposed citadels of reason, knowledge, scholarship, civilization, can be made to surrender to the rule of brute force, the rest of the country is cooked. 2. To facilitate the acceptance of force, the Berkeley rebels attempted to establish a special distinction between force and violence. Force, they claimed explicitly, is a proper form of social action, but violence is not. This book is continued on Disc 10. Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal, by Ayn Rand. Continued. Disc 10. 2. To facilitate the acceptance of force, the Berkeley rebels attempted to establish a special distinction between force and violence. Force, they claimed explicitly, is a proper form of social action, but violence is not. Their definition of the terms was as follows. Coercion, by means of a literal physical contact, is violence and is reprehensible. Any other way of violating rights is merely force and is a legitimate, peaceful method of dealing with opponents. For instance, if the rebels occupy the administration building, that is force. If policemen drag them out, that is violence. If Savio grabs a microphone he has no right to use, that is force. If a policeman drags him away from it, that is violence. Consider the implications of that distinction as a rule of social conduct. If you come home one evening, find a stranger occupying your house, and throw him out bodily, he has merely committed a peaceful act of force, but you are guilty of violence, and you are to be punished. The theoretical purpose of that grotesque absurdity is to establish a moral inversion, to make the initiation of force moral, and resistance to force immoral, and thus to obliterate the right of self-defense. The immediate practical purpose is to foster the activities of the lowest political breed, the provocateurs, who commit acts of force and place the blame on their victims. 3. To justify that fraudulent distinction, the Berkeley rebels attempted to obliterate a legitimate one, the distinction between ideas and actions. They claimed that freedom of speech means freedom of action, and that no clear line of demarcation can be drawn between them. For instance, if they have the right to advocate any political viewpoint, they claimed, they have the right to organize on campus any off-campus activities, even those forbidden by law. As Professor Peterson put it, they were claiming the right to use the university as a sanctuary from which to make illegal raids on the general community. The difference between an exchange of ideas and an exchange of blows is self-evident. The line of demarcation between freedom of speech and freedom of action is established by the ban on the initiation of physical force. It is only when that ban is abrogated that such a problem can arise. But when that ban is abrogated, 
no political freedom of any kind can remain in existence. At a superficial glance, the rebels' package deal may seem to imply a sort of anarchistic extension of freedom, but in fact and in logic, it implies the exact opposite, which is a grim joke on those unthinking youths who joined the rebellion in the name of free speech. If the freedom to express ideas were equated with the freedom to commit crimes, it would not take long to demonstrate that no organized society can exist on such terms, and therefore that the expression of ideas has to be curtailed, and some ideas have to be forbidden, just as criminal acts are forbidden. Thus the gullible would be brought to concede that the right of free speech is undefinable and impracticable. 4. An indication of such a motive was given by the rebels' demand for unrestricted freedom of speech on campus, with the consequent filthy language movement. There can be no such thing as the right to an unrestricted freedom of speech or of action on someone else's property. The fact that the university at Berkeley is owned by the state merely complicates the issue, but does not alter it. The owners of a state university are the voters and taxpayers of that state. The university administration, appointed directly or indirectly by an elected official, is theoretically the agent of the owners and has to act as such, so long as state universities exist. Whether they should exist is a different question. In any undertaking or establishment involving more than one man, it is the owner or owners who set the rules and terms of appropriate conduct. The rest of the participants are free to go elsewhere and seek different terms if they do not agree. There can be no such thing as the right to act on whim, to be exercised by some participants at the expense of others. Students who attend a university have the right to expect that they will not be subjected to hearing the kind of obscenities for which the owner of a semi-decent bar room would bounce hoodlums out on the street. The right to determine what sort of language is permissible belongs to the administration of a university, fully as much as to the owner of a bar room. The technique of the rebels, as of all statists, was to take advantage of the principles of a free society in order to undercut them by an alleged demonstration of their impracticability, in this case the impracticability of the right of free speech. But in fact what they have demonstrated is a point farthest removed from their goals, that no rights of any kind can be exercised without property rights. It is only on the basis of property rights that the sphere and application of individual rights can be defined in any given social situation. Without property rights, there is no way to solve or to avoid a hopeless chaos of clashing views, interests, demands, desires, and whims. There is no way for the Berkeley administration to answer the rebels except by invoking property rights. It is obvious why neither modern liberals nor conservatives would care to do so. It is not the contradictions of a free society that the rebels were exposing and cashing in on, but the contradictions of a mixed economy. As to the question of what ideological policy should properly be adopted by the administration of a state university, it is a question that has no answer. There are no solutions for the many contradictions inherent in the concept of public property, particularly when the property is directly concerned with the dissemination of ideas. This is one of the reasons why the rebels would choose a state university as their first battleground. A good case could be made for the claim that a state university has no right to forbid the teaching or advocacy of any political viewpoint whatever, as for instance of communism, since some of the taxpaying owners may be communists. An equally good case could be made for the claim that a state university has no right to permit the teaching and advocacy of any political viewpoint which, as for instance communism, is a direct threat to the property, freedom, and lives of the majority of the taxpaying owners. Majority rule is not applicable in the realm of ideas. An individual's convictions are not subject to a majority vote, but neither an individual nor a minority nor a majority should be forced to support their own destroyers. On the one hand, a government institution has no right to forbid the expression of any ideas. On the other hand, a government institution has no right to harbor, assist, and finance the country's enemies, as, for instance, the collectors of funds for the Viet Cong. 
The source of these contradictions does not lie in the principle of individual rights, but in their violation of the collectivist institution of public property. This issue, however, has to be fought in the field of constitutional law, not on campus. As students, the rebels have no greater rights in a state university than in a private one. As taxpayers, they have no greater rights than the millions of other California taxpayers involved. If they object to the policies of the Board of Regents, they have no recourse except at the polls at the next election, if they can persuade a sufficient number of voters. This is a pretty slim chance, and this is a good argument against any type of public property. But it is not an issue to be solved by physical force. What is significant here is the fact that the rebels, who, to put it mildly, are not champions of private property, refuse to abide by the kind of majority rule which is inherent in public ownership. That is what they were opposing when they complained that universities have become servants of the financial, industrial, and military establishment. It is the rights of these particular groups of taxpayers, the right to a voice in the management of state universities, that they were seeking to abrogate. If anyone needs proof of the fact that the advocates of public ownership are not seeking democratic control of property by majority rule, but control by dictatorship, this is one eloquent piece of evidence. 5. As part of the ideological conditioning for that ultimate goal, the rebels attempted to introduce a new variant on an old theme that has been the object of an intense drive by all statist collectivists for many years past the obliteration of the difference between private action and government action. This has always been attempted by means of a package deal ascribing to private citizens the specific violations constitutionally forbidden to the government, and thus destroying individual rights while freeing the government from any restrictions. The most frequent example of this technique consists of accusing private citizens of practicing censorship, a concept applicable only to the government, and thus negating their right to disagree. The new variant provided by the rebels was their protest against alleged double jeopardy. It went as follows. If the students commit illegal acts, they will be punished by the courts, and must not therefore be penalized by the university for the same offense. Double jeopardy is a concept applicable only to the government, and only to one branch of the government the judiciary, and only to a specific judiciary action, it means that a man must not be put on trial twice for the same offense. To equate private judgment and action, or in this context a government official's judgment and action, with a court trial is worse than absurd. It is an outrageous attempt to obliterate the right to moral judgment and moral action. It is a demand that a lawbreaker suffer no civil consequences of his crime. If such a notion were accepted, individuals would have no right to evaluate the conduct of others, nor to act according to their evaluation. They would have to wait until a court had declared whether a given man was guilty or innocent, and even after he was pronounced guilty, they would have no right to change their behavior toward him, and would have to leave the task of penalizing him exclusively to the government. For instance, if a bank employee were found guilty of embezzlement and had served his sentence, the bank would have no right to refuse to give him back his former job, since a refusal would constitute double jeopardy. Or, a government official would have no right to watch the legality of the actions of his department's employees, nor to lay down rules for their strict observance of the law, but would have to wait until a court had found them guilty of law-breaking and would have to reinstate them in their jobs after they had served their sentences for influence peddling or bribe taking or treason. The notion of morality as a monopoly of the government and of a single branch or group within the government is so blatantly a part of the ideology of a dictatorship that the rebels' attempt to get away with it is truly shocking. 6. The rebels' notion that universities should be run by students and faculties was an open, explicit assault on the right attacked implicitly by all their other notions, the right of private property, and of all the various statist collectivist systems, the one they chose as their goal is politico-economically the least practical, intellectually the least defensible, 
morally the most shameful. Guild Socialism Guild Socialism is a system that abolishes the exercise of individual ability by chaining men into groups according to their line of work and delivering the work into the group's power as its exclusive domain with the group dictating the rules, standards, and practices of how the work is to be done and who shall or shall not do it. Guild socialism is the concrete-bound, routine-bound mentality of a savage elevated into a social theory. Just as a tribe of savages seizes a piece of jungle territory and claims it as a monopoly by reason of the fact of being there, so guild socialism grants a monopoly not on a jungle forest or water hole, but on a factory or a university, not by reason of a man's ability, achievement, or even public service, but by reason of the fact that he is there. Just as savages have no concept of causes or consequences, of past or future, and no concept of efficacy beyond the muscular power of their tribe, so guild socialists, finding themselves in the midst of an industrial civilization, regard its institutions as phenomena of nature, and see no reason why the gang should not seize them. If there is any one proof of a man's incompetence, it is the stagnant mentality of a worker or of a professor who, doing some small routine job in a vast undertaking, does not care to look beyond the lever of a machine or the lectern of a classroom, does not choose to know how the machine or the classroom got there or what makes his job possible, and proclaims that the management of the undertaking is parasitical and unnecessary. Managerial work, the organization and integration of human effort into purposeful, large-scale, long-range activities, is in the realm of action what man's conceptual faculty is in the realm of cognition. It is beyond the grasp and therefore is the first target of the self-arrested sensory perceptual mentality. If there is any one way to confess one's own mediocrity, it is the willingness to place one's work in the absolute power of a group, particularly a group of one's professional colleagues. Of any forms of tyranny, this is the worst. It is directed against a single human attribute, the mind, and against a single enemy, the innovator. The innovator, by definition, is the man who challenges the established practices of his profession. To grant a professional monopoly to any group is to sacrifice human ability and abolish progress. To advocate such a monopoly is to confess that one has nothing to sacrifice. Guild socialism is the rule of, by and for, mediocrity. Its cause is a society's intellectual collapse. Its consequence is a quagmire of stagnation. Its historical example is the guild system of the Middle Ages, or in modern times the fascist system of Italy under Mussolini. The rebels' notion that students, along with faculties, should run universities and determine their curricula, is a crude absurdity. If an ignorant youth comes to an institution of learning in order to acquire knowledge of a certain science, by what means is he to determine what is relevant and how he should be taught? In the process of learning, he can judge only whether his teacher's presentation is clear or unclear, logical or contradictory. He cannot determine the proper course and method of teaching ahead of any knowledge of the subject. It is obvious that a student who demands the right to run a university or to decide who should run it has no knowledge of the concept of knowledge, that his demand is self-contradictory and disqualifies him automatically. The same is true, with a much heavier burden of moral guilt, of the professor who taught him to make such demands and who supports them. Would you care to be treated in a hospital where the methods of therapy were determined by a vote of doctors and patients? Yet the absurdity of these examples is merely more obvious, not more irrational or more vicious, than the standard collectivist claim that workers should take over the factories created by men whose achievement they can neither grasp nor equal. The basic epistemological moral premise and pattern are the same. The obliteration of reason obliterates the concept of reality, which obliterates the concept of achievement, which obliterates the concept of the distinction between the earned and the unearned. Then the incompetent can seize factories, 
the ignorant can seize universities, the brutes can seize scientific research laboratories, and nothing is left in a human society but the power of whim and fist. What makes guild socialism cruder than, but not different from, most statist collectivist theories is the fact that it represents the other, the usually unmentioned side of altruism. It is the voice, not of the givers, but of the receivers. While most altruistic theorists proclaim the common good as their justification, advocate self-sacrificial service to the community, and keep silent about the exact nature or identity of the recipients of sacrifices, guild socialists brazenly declare themselves to be the recipients and present their claims to the community, demanding its services. If they want a monopoly on a given profession, they claim, the rest of the community must give up the right to practice it. If they want a university, they claim, the community must provide it. And if selfishness is taken by the altruists, to mean the sacrifice of others to self, I challenge them to name an uglier example of it than the pronouncement of the little Berkeley collectivist who declared, Our idea is that the university is composed of faculty, students, books, and ideas. In a literal sense, the administration is merely there to make sure the sidewalks are kept clean. It should be the servant of the faculty and the students. What did that little disembodied mystic omit from his idea of a university? Who pays the salaries of the faculty? Who provides the livelihood of the students? Who publishes the books? Who builds the classrooms, the libraries, the dormitories, and the sidewalks? Leave it to a modern mystic of muscle to display the kind of contempt for vulgar material concerns that an old-fashioned mystic would not quite dare permit himself. Who, besides the university administration, is to be the voiceless, rightless servant and sidewalk sweeper of the faculty and students? No, not only the men of productive genius who create the material wealth that makes universities possible, not only the tycoons of business, not only the financial, industrial, and military establishment, but every taxpayer of the state of California, every man who works for a living, high or low, every human being who earns his sustenance, struggles with his budget, pays for what he gets, and does not permit himself to evade the reality of vulgar material concerns. Such is the soul revealed by the ideology of the Berkeley Rebellion. Such is the meaning of the rebels' demands and of the ideological precedents they were trying to establish. Observe the complexity, the equivocations, the tricks, the twists, the intellectual acrobatics performed by these avowed advocates of unbridled feelings, and the ideological consistency of these activists who claim to possess no ideology. The first round of the student rebellion has not gone over too well. In spite of the gratuitous puff job done by the press, the attitude of the public is a mixture of bewilderment, indifference, and antagonism. Indifference because the evasive vagueness of the press reports was self-defeating. People do not understand what it is all about and see no reason to care. Antagonism because the American public still holds a profound respect for universities, as they might be and ought to be, but are not any longer, and the commentator's half-laudatory, half-humorous platitudes about the idealism of youth have not succeeded in whitewashing the fact that brute physical force was brought to a university campus. That fact has aroused a vague sense of uneasiness in people, a sense of undefined, apprehensive condemnation. The rebellion's attempt to invade other campuses did not get very far. There were some disgraceful proclamations of appeasement by some university administrators and commencement orators this spring, but no discernible public sympathy. There were a few instances of a proper attitude on the part of university administrations, an attitude of firmness, dignity, and uncompromising severity, notably at Columbia University. A commencement address by Dr. Meng, president of Hunter College, is also worth noting, declaring that the violation of the rights of others is intolerable in an academic community, and that any student or teacher guilty of it deserves instant expulsion, he said. Yesterday's ivory tower has become today's foxhole. 
the leisure of the theory class is increasingly occupied in the organization of picket lines, teach-ins, think-ins, and stake-outs of one sort or another. But even though the student rebellion has not aroused much public sympathy, the most ominous aspect of the situation is the fact that it has not met any ideological opposition, that the implications of the rebels' stand have neither been answered nor rejected, that such criticism as it did evoke was, with rare exceptions, evasively superficial. As a trial balloon, the rebellion has accomplished its leader's purpose. It has demonstrated that they may have gone a bit too far, bared their teeth and claws a bit too soon, and antagonized many potential sympathizers, even among the liberals, but that the road ahead is empty, with no intellectual barricades in sight. The battle is to continue. The long-range intentions of the student rebellion have been proclaimed repeatedly by the same activists who proclaim their exclusive dedication to the immediate moment. The remnants of the free speech movement at Berkeley have been reorganized into a free student union, which is making militant noises in preparation for another assault. No matter how absurd their notions, the rebels' assaults are directed at the most important philosophical-political issues of our age. These issues cannot be ignored, evaded, or bribed away by compromise. When brute force is on the march, compromise is the red carpet. When reason is attacked, common sense is not enough. Neither a man nor a nation can exist without some form of philosophy. A man has the free will to think or not. If he does not, he takes what he gets. The free will of a nation is its intellectuals. The rest of the country takes what they offer. They set the terms, the values the course, the goal. In the absence of intellectual opposition, the rebels' notions will gradually come to be absorbed into the culture. The uncontested absurdities of today are the accepted slogans of tomorrow. They come to be accepted by degrees, by precedent, by implication, by erosion, by default, by dint of constant pressure on one side and constant retreat on the other, until the day when they are suddenly declared to be the country's official ideology. That is the way welfare statism came to be accepted in this country. What we are witnessing today is an acceleration of the attempts to cash in on the ideological implications of welfare statism and to push beyond it. The college rebels are merely the commandos charged with the task of establishing ideological beachheads for a full-scale advance of all the statist collectivist forces against the remnants of capitalism in America, and part of their task is the takeover of the ideological control of America's universities. If the collectivists succeed, the terrible historical irony will lie in the fact that what looks like a noisy, reckless, belligerent confidence is in fact a hysterical bluff. The acceleration of collectivism's advance is not the march of winners, but the blind stampede of losers. Collectivism has lost the battle for men's minds. Its advocates know it. Their last chance consists of the fact that no one else knows it. If they are to cash in on decades of philosophical corruption, on all the gnawing, scrapping, scratching, burrowing to dig a maze of philosophical rat holes which is about to cave in, it's now or never. As a cultural intellectual power and a moral ideal, collectivism died in World War II. If we are still rolling in its direction, it is only by the inertia of a void and the momentum of disintegration. A social movement that began with the ponderous, brain-cracking dialectical constructs of Hegel and Marx and ends up with a horde of morally unwashed children stamping their foot and shrieking, I want it now, is through. All over the world, while mowing down one helpless nation after another, Collectivism has been steadily losing the two elements that hold the key to the future, the brains of mankind and its youth. In regard to the first, observe Britain's brain drain. In regard to the second, consider the fact, which was not mentioned in the press comments on the student rebellion, that in a predominant number of American universities, the political views of the faculty are perceptibly more liberal than those of the student body. The same is true of the youth of the country at large, as against the older generation, the 35 to 50 age bracket, who were reared under the New Deal and who hold the country's leadership at present. That is one of the facts which the student rebellion was intended to disguise. 
This is not to say that the anti-collectivists represent a numerical majority among college students. The passive supporters of the status quo are always the majority in any group, culture, society, or age. But it is not by passive majorities that the trends of a nation are set. Who sets them? Anyone who cares to do so, if he has the intellectual ammunition to win on the battlefield of ideas, which belongs to those who do care. Those who don't are merely social ballast by their own choice and predilection. The fact that the non-liberals among college students and among the youth of the world can be identified at present only as anti-collectivists is the dangerous element and the question mark in today's situation. They are the young people who are not ready to give up, who want to fight against a swamp of evil, but do not know what is the good. They have rejected the sick, worn platitudes of collectivism, along with all of its cultural manifestations, including the cult of despair and depravity, the studied mindlessness of jerk-and-moan dancing, singing, or acting, the worship of anti-heroes, the experience of looking up to the dissection of a psychotic's brain for inspiration, and to the bare feet of an inarticulate brute for guidance, the stupor of reduction to sensory stimuli, the sense of life of a movie such as Tom Jones, but they have found as yet no direction, no consistent philosophy, no rational views, no long-range goals. Until and unless they do, their incoherent striving for a better future will collapse before the final thrust of the collectivists. Historically, we are now in a kind of intellectual no-man's land, and the future will be determined by those who venture out of the trenches of the status quo. Our direction will depend on whether the venturers are crusaders fighting for a new renaissance or scavengers pouncing upon the wreckage left of yesterday's battles. The crusaders are not yet ready. The scavengers are. That is why, in a deeper sense than the little zombies of college campuses will ever grasp, now, now, now is the last slogan and cry of the ragged, bearded stragglers who had once been an army rallied by the promise of a scientifically planned society. The two most accurate characterizations of the student rebellion given in the press were political existentialism and Castroite. Both are concepts pertaining to intellectual bankruptcy. The first stands for the abdication of reason, the second for that state of hysterical panic which brandishes a fist as its sole recourse. In preparation for its published survey, March 22, 1965, Newsweek conducted a number of polls among college students at large on various subjects, one of which was the question of who are the students' heroes. The editors of Newsweek informed me that my name appeared on the resultant list and sent an interviewer to question me about my views on the state of modern universities. For reasons best known to themselves, they chose not to publish any part of that interview. What I said in briefer form was what I am now saying in this article, with the exception of the concluding remarks which follow and which I want to address most particularly to those college students who chose me as one of their heroes. Young people are constantly asking what they can do to fight today's disastrous trends. They are seeking some form of action and wrecking their hopes in blind alleys, particularly every four years at election time. Those who do not realize that the battle is ideological had better give up, because they have no chance. Those who do realize it should grasp that the student rebellion offers them a chance to train themselves for the kind of battle they will have to fight in the world when they leave the university. A chance not only to train themselves, but to win the first rounds of that wider battle. If they seek an important cause, they have the opportunity to fight the rebels, to fight ideologically on moral intellectual grounds by identifying and exposing the meaning of the rebels' demands, by naming and answering the basic principles which the rebels dare not admit. The battle consists above all of providing the country, or all those within hearing, with ideological answers, a field of action from which the older generation has deserted under fire. Ideas cannot be fought except by means of better ideas. The battle consists not of opposing but of exposing, not of denouncing but of disproving, not of evading but of boldly proclaiming a full, consistent, and radical alternative. 
This does not mean that rational students should enter debates with the rebels or attempt to convert them. One cannot argue with self-confessed irrationalists. The goal of an ideological battle is to enlighten the vast, helpless, bewildered majority in the universities, in the country at large, or rather, the minds of those among the majority who are struggling to find answers, or those who, having heard nothing but collectivist sophistries for years, have withdrawn in revulsion and given up. The first goal of such a battle is to wrest from a handful of beatniks the title of spokesman for American youth, which the press is so anxious to grant them. The first step is to make oneself heard, on the campus and outside. There are many civilized ways to do it. Protest meetings, public petitions, speeches, pamphlets, letters to editors. It is a much more important issue than picketing the United Nations or parading in support of the House Un-American Activities Committee. And while such futile groups as Young Americans for Freedom are engaged in such undertakings, they are letting the collectivist vanguard speak in their name, in the name of American college students, without any audible sound of protest. But in order to be heard, one must have something to say. To have that, one must know one's case. One must know it fully, logically, consistently, all the way down to philosophical fundamentals. One cannot hope to fight nuclear experts with Republican pea shooters, and the leaders behind the student rebellion are experts at their particular game. But they are dangerous only to those who stare at the issues out of focus and hope to fight ideas by means of faith, feelings, and fundraising. You would be surprised how quickly the ideologists of collectivism retreat when they encounter a confident intellectual adversary. Their case rests on appealing to human confusion, ignorance, dishonesty, cowardice, despair. Take the side they dare not approach. Appeal to human intelligence. Collectivism has lost the two crucial weapons that raised it to world power and made all of its victories possible, intellectuality and idealism, or reason and morality. It had to lose them precisely at the height of its success, since its claim to both was a fraud. The full actual reality of socialist, communist, fascist states has demonstrated the brute irrationality of collectivist systems and the inhumanity of altruism as a moral code. Yet reason and morality are the only weapons that determine the course of history. The collectivists dropped them because they had no right to carry them. Pick them up. You have. Chapter 23 Alienation by Nathaniel Brandon And how am I to face the odds of man's bedevilment and God's, I a stranger and afraid in a world I never made? In the writings of contemporary psychologists and sociologists, one encounters these lines from A. E. Hausman's poem more and more often today, quoted as an eloquent summation of the sense of life and psychological plight of twentieth-century man. In book after book of social commentary one finds the same message. Modern man is overwhelmed by anxiety. Modern man suffers from an identity crisis. Modern man is alienated. Who am I? Where am I going? Do I belong? These are the crucial questions man asks himself in modern mass society, declares the sociologist and psychoanalyst Heinrich M. Reutenbeek in The Individual and the Crowd, a study of identity in America. The concept of alienation, in its original psychiatric usage, denoted the mentally ill, the severely mentally ill, often particularly in legal contexts, the insane. It conveyed the notion of the breakdown of rationality and self-determination, the notion of a person driven by forces which he cannot grasp or control, which are experienced by him as compelling and alien, so that he feels estranged from himself. Centuries earlier, medieval theologians had spoken with distress of man's alienation from God, of an over-concern with the world of the senses that caused man to become lost to himself, estranged from his proper spiritual estate. It was the philosopher Hegel who introduced the concept of alienation outside of its psychiatric context to the modern world. The history of man, maintained Hegel, is the history of man's self-alienation. Man is blind to his true essence. He is lost in the dead world of social institutions and of property 
which he himself has created, he is estranged from the universal being of which he is a part, and human progress consists of man's motion toward that whole as he transcends the limitations of his individual perceptions. Alienation was taken over by Karl Marx, and given a narrower, less cosmic meaning, he applied the concept primarily to the worker. The worker's alienation was inevitable, he asserted, with the development of the division of labor, specialization, exchange, and private property. The worker must sell his services, thus he comes to view himself as a commodity. He becomes alienated from the product of his own labor, and his work is no longer the expression of his powers, of his inner self. The worker who is alive is ruled by that which is dead, i.e. capital, machinery. The consequence, says Marx, is spiritual impoverishment and mutilation. The worker is alienated from himself, from nature, and from his fellow men. He exists only as an animated object, not as a human being. Since the time of Marx, the idea of alienation has been used more and more extensively by psychologists, sociologists, and philosophers, gathering to itself a wide variety of usages and meanings. But from Hegel and Marx onward, there appears to be an almost universal reluctance on the part of those who employ the term to define it precisely. It is as if one were expected to feel its meaning rather than to grasp it conceptually. In a two-volume collection of essays entitled Alienation, the editor Gerald Sykes specifically scorns those who are too eager for a definition of the term. Haste for a definition, he declares, reveals that one suffers from an advanced case of alienation. Certain writers, notably those of a Freudian or Jungian orientation, declare that the complexity of modern industrial society has caused man to become over-civilized, to have lost touch with the deeper roots of his being, to have become alienated from his instinctual nature. Others, notably those of an existentialist or Zen Buddhist orientation, complain that our advanced technological society compels man to live too intellectually, to be ruled by abstractions, thus alienating him from the real world which can be experienced in its wholeness only via his emotions. Others, especially those of a petulant mediocrity orientation, decry specifically the alienation of the artist. They assert that with the vanishing of the age of patrons, with the artist thrown on his own resources to struggle in the marketplace, which is ruled by Philistines, the artist is condemned to fight a losing battle for the preservation of his spiritual integrity. He is too besieged by material temptations. Most of these writers declare that the problem of alienation and of man's search for identity is not new, but has been a source of anguish to man in every age and culture. But they insist that today in Western civilization, above all in America, the problem has reached an unprecedented severity. It has become a crisis. What is responsible for this crisis? What has alienated man and deprived him of identity? The answer given by most writers on alienation is not always stated explicitly, but in their countless disparaging references to the dehumanizing effects of industrialism, soul-destroying commercialism, the arid rationalism of a technological culture, the vulgar materialism of the West, etc., the villain in their view of things, the destroyer whom they hold chiefly responsible is not hard to identify. It is capitalism. This should not be startling. Since its birth, capitalism has been made the scapegoat responsible for almost every real or imagined evil denounced by anyone. As the distinguished economist Ludwig von Mises observes, Nothing is more unpopular today than the free market economy, i.e. capitalism. Everything that is considered unsatisfactory in present-day conditions is charged to capitalism. The atheists make capitalism responsible for the survival of Christianity. But the papal encyclicals blame capitalism for the spread of irreligion and the sins of our contemporaries. And the Protestant churches and sects are no less vigorous in their indictment of capitalist greed. Friends of peace consider our wars as an offshoot of capitalist imperialism. But the adamant nationalist warmongers of Germany and Italy indicted capitalism for its bourgeois pacifism, contrary to human nature and to the inescapable laws of history. 
Sermonizers accuse capitalism of disrupting the family and fostering licentiousness, but the progressives blame capitalism for the preservation of allegedly outdated rules of sexual restraint. Almost all men agree that poverty is an outcome of capitalism. On the other hand, many deplore the fact that capitalism in catering lavishly to the wishes of people intent upon getting more amenities and a better living promotes a crass materialism. These contradictory accusations of capitalism cancel one another, but the fact remains that there are few people left who would not condemn capitalism altogether. It is true that a great many men suffer from a chronic feeling of inner emptiness, of spiritual impoverishment, the sense of lacking personal identity. It is true that a great many men feel alienated from something, even if they cannot say from what, from themselves or other men or the universe. And it is profoundly significant that capitalism should be blamed for this, not because there is any justification for the charge, but because by analyzing the reasons given for the accusation, one can learn a good deal about the nature and meaning of men's sense of alienation and non-identity, and simultaneously about the psychological motives that give rise to hostility toward capitalism. The writers on alienation, as I have indicated, are not an intellectually homogeneous group. They differ in many areas, in their view of what the problem of alienation exactly consists of, in the aspects of modern industrial society and a free market economy, which they find most objectionable, in the explicitness with which they identify capitalism as the villain, and in the details of their own political inclinations. Some of these writers are socialists, some are fascists, some are medievalists, some are supporters of the welfare state, some scorn politics altogether. Some believe that the problem of alienation is largely or entirely solvable, by a new system of social organization. Others believe that the problem at bottom is metaphysical and that no entirely satisfactory solution can be found. Fortunately for the purposes of this analysis, however, there is one contemporary writer who manages to combine in his books virtually all of the major errors perpetrated by commentators in this field. Psychologist and sociologist Eric Fromm let us therefore consider Fromm's view of man and his theory of alienation in some detail. Man, declares Eric Fromm, is the freak of the universe. This theme is crucial and central throughout his writings. Man is radically different from all other living species. He is estranged and alienated from nature. He is overwhelmed by a feeling of isolation and separateness. He has lost, in the process of evolution, the undisturbed tranquility of other organisms. He has lost the pre-human harmony with nature which is enjoyed by an animal, a bird, or a worm. The source of his curse is the fact that he possesses a mind. Self-awareness, reason, and imagination, Frome writes in Man for Himself, have disrupted the harmony which characterizes animal existence. Their emergence has made man into an anomaly, into the freak of the universe, Man cannot live as an animal, he is not equipped to adapt himself automatically and unthinkingly to his environment. An animal blindly repeats the pattern of the species. Its behavior is biologically prescribed and stereotyped. It either fits in or it dies out. But it does not have to solve the problem of survival. It is not conscious of life and death as an issue. Man does and is. This is his tragedy. Reason, man's blessing is also his curse. In The Art of Loving, he writes, What is essential in the existence of man is the fact that he has emerged from the animal kingdom, from instinctive adaptation, that he has transcended nature. Although he never leaves it, he is part of it, and yet once torn away from nature, he cannot return to it. Once thrown out of paradise, a state of original oneness with nature, Cherubim with flaming swords block his way if he should try to return. That man's rational faculty deprives man of paradise, alienating and estranging him from nature, is clearly revealed, says Fromm, in the existential dichotomies which his mind dooms man to confront, contradictions inherent in life itself. What are these tragic dichotomies? He names three as central and basic. Man's mind permits him to 
visualize his own end, death, yet his body makes him want to be alive. Man's nature contains innumerable potentialities, yet the short span of his life does not permit their full realization under even the most favorable circumstances. Man must be alone when he has to judge or to make decisions solely by the power of his reason, yet he cannot bear to be alone, to be unrelated to his fellow men. These contradictions, says Fromm, constitute the dilemma of the human situation, contradictions with which man is compelled to struggle, but which he can never resolve or annul, and which alienate man from himself, from his fellow men, and from nature. If the logic of the foregoing is not readily perceivable, the reason does not lie in the brevity of the synopsis, it lies in the unmitigated arbitrariness of Fromm's manner of presenting his ideas. He writes not like a scientist, but like an oracle who is not obliged to give reasons or proof. It is true that man differs fundamentally from all other living species by virtue of possessing a rational conceptual faculty. It is true that for man survival is a problem to be solved by the exercise of his intelligence. It is true that no man lives long enough to exhaust his every potentiality. It is true that every man is alone, separate and unique. It is true that thinking requires independence. These are the facts that grant glory to man's existence. Why would one choose to regard these facts as a terrifying cosmic paradox and to see in them the evidence of monumentally tragic human problems? There are men who resent the fact that their life is their responsibility and that the task of their reason is to discover how to maintain it. Large numbers of such men, men who prefer the state of animals, may be found, or used to be found, sleeping on the benches of any public park. They are called tramps. There are men who find thought abnormal and unnatural. Large numbers of such men may be found in mental institutions. They are called morons. There are men who suffer a chronic preoccupation with death, who bitterly resent the fact that they cannot simultaneously be a concert pianist, a business tycoon, a railroad engineer, a baseball player, and a deep-sea diver who find their existence as separate independent entities an unendurable burden. Large numbers of such men may be found in the offices of psychotherapists. They are called neurotics. But why does Fromm choose tramps, morons, and neurotics as his symbols of humanity, as his image of man? And why does he choose to claim that theirs is the state in which all men are destined to start and out of which they must struggle to rise? Fromm does not tell us. Nowhere does he establish any logical connection between the facts he observes and the conclusions he announces. If we are not to regard his conclusions as arbitrary, as mystical revelations in effect, then we must assume that he does not bother to give reasons for his position, because he regards his conclusions as virtually self-evident, as irresistibly conveyed by the facts he cites, easily available to everyone's experience and introspection. But if he feels it is readily apparent by introspection that the facts he cites constitute an agonizing problem for man, the most appropriate answer one can give is, speak for yourself, brother. Reason, Fromm insists, and the self-awareness which reason makes possible, turns man's separate, disunited existence into an unbearable prison, and man would become insane could he not liberate himself from this prison and reach out unite himself in some form or other with men, with the world outside. The following paragraph is typical of what Fromm considers an explanation. The experience of separateness arouses anxiety. It is indeed the source of all anxiety. Being separate means being cut off without any capacity to use my human powers. Hence to be separate means to be helpless, unable to grasp the world, things, and people actively. It means that the world can invade me without my ability to react. Thus separateness is the source of intense anxiety. Beyond that, it arouses shame and the feeling of guilt. This experience of guilt and shame and separateness is expressed in the biblical story of Adam and Eve. After Adam and Eve have eaten of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, after they have disobeyed, after they have become human by having emancipated themselves from the original animal harmony with nature, i.e., after their birth as human beings, they saw that they were naked and they were ashamed. 
should we assume that a myth as old and elementary as this has the prudish morals of the nineteenth-century outlook, and that the important point the story wants to convey to us is the embarrassment that their genitals were visible? This can hardly be so, and by understanding the story in a Victorian spirit we miss the main point, which seems to be the following. After man and woman have become aware of themselves and of each other, they are aware of their separateness and of their difference, inasmuch as they belong to different sexes. But while recognizing their separateness, they remain strangers because they have not yet learned to love each other, as is also made very clear by the fact that Adam defends himself by blaming Eve, rather than by trying to defend her. The awareness of human separation without reunion by love is the source of shame. It is at the same time the source of guilt and anxiety. All social institutions, all cultures, all religions and philosophies, all progress, asserts Fromm, are motivated by man's need to escape the terrifying sense of helplessness and aloneness to which his reason condemns him. The necessity to find ever new solutions for the contradictions in his existence, to find ever higher forms of unity with nature, his fellow men and himself, is the source of all psychic forces which motivate man. In Man for Himself, Fromm states that only through reason, productiveness, and love can man solve the problem of his separateness and achieve a new union with the world around him. Fromm's claim to be an advocate of reason is disingenuous, to say the least. He speaks of reason and love as being only two different forms of comprehending the world. As if this were not an unequivocal proof of his mysticism, he goes on to speak, in The Art of Loving, of the paradoxical logic of Eastern religions, which he tells us approvingly is not encumbered by the Aristotelian law of contradiction, and which teaches that man can perceive reality only in contradictions. Hegel and Marx, he asserts correctly, belong to his paradoxical epistemological line. His discussion of what he means by productiveness is scarcely more gratifying. In The Art of Loving, written some years after Man for Himself, he declares that reason and productive work, though certainly important, provide only partial and by themselves very unsatisfactory solutions. The unity they achieve is not interpersonal, and the desire for interpersonal fusion is the most powerful striving in man. Frome pulls an unexplained switch at this point. What began as a problem between man and nature is now to be solved, in some unspecified manner, by human togetherness. One is not surprised. In reading Frome, this is the sort of pronouncement for which one is waiting. There is a sense of inevitability about it. Love and love alone, he tells us with wonderful originality, can allay man's terror. Love is the only sane and satisfactory answer to the problem of human existence. Only through relating oneself positively to others, only through feeling care and responsibility for them, while preserving one's personal integrity, he adds somewhat mysteriously, can man establish new ties, a new union, that will release him from alienated aloneness. The cat is now ready to be let fully out of the bag. The preceding is Frome's view of alienation as a metaphysical problem, its full meaning and implication become clear when one turns to his social-political analysis of alienation. In the context of the latter, one can see clearly what sort of ties, what sort of union, and what sort of love Frome has in mind. Every society, as a system of human relationships, may be evaluated by how well it satisfies man's basic psychological needs, says Frome, i.e., he explains, by the possibilities for love, relatedness, and the experience of personal identity which it offers man. Capitalism, Fromm declares, has been disastrous in this regard. Far from solving the problem of man's alienation, it worsens it immeasurably in many respects. In liberating man from medieval regulation and authority, in breaking the chains of ecclesiastical, economic, and social tyranny, in destroying the stability of the feudal order, capitalism and individualism thrust upon man an unprecedented freedom that was bound to create a deep feeling of insecurity, powerlessness, doubt, 
aloneness, and anxiety. Scratch a collectivist and you will usually find a medievalist. Frome is not an exception. Like so many socialists, he is a glamorizer of the Middle Ages. He perfunctorily acknowledges the faults of that historical period, but in contrasting it with the capitalism that succeeded it, he is enchanted by what he regards as its virtues. What characterizes medieval in contrast to modern society is its lack of individual freedom. But although a person was not free in the modern sense, neither was he alone or isolated. In having a distinct, unchangeable, and unquestionable place in the social world from the moment of birth, man was rooted in a structuralized whole, and thus life had a meaning which left no place and no need for doubt. A person was identical with his role in society. He was a peasant, an artisan, a knight, and not an individual who happened to have this or that occupation. The social order was conceived as a natural order, and being a definite part of it gave man a feeling of security and of belonging. There was comparatively little competition. One was born into a certain economic position, which guaranteed a livelihood determined by tradition, just as it carried economic obligations to those higher in the social hierarchy. But within the limits of his social sphere, the individual actually had much freedom to express his self in his work and in his emotional life. Although there was no individualism in the modern sense of the unrestricted choice between many possible ways of life, a freedom of choice which is largely abstract, there was a great deal of concrete individualism in real life. It is not uncommon to encounter this sort of perspective on the Middle Ages among writers on alienation, but what makes the above passage especially shocking and offensive in the case of Frome is that he repeatedly professes to be a lover of freedom and a valuer of human life. The complete lack of control over any aspect of one's existence, the ruthless suppression of intellectual freedom, the paralyzing restrictions on any form of individual initiative and independence, these are cardinal characteristics of the Middle Ages. But all of this is swept aside by Frome, along with the famines, the plagues, the exhausting labor from sunrise to sunset, the suffocating routine, the superstitious terror, the attacks of mass hysteria afflicting entire towns, the nightmare brutality of men's dealings with one another, the use of legalized torture as a normal way of life. All of this is swept aside, so entranced is Frome by the vision of a world in which men did not have to invent and compete, they had only to submit and obey. Nowhere does he tell us what specifically the medieval man's concrete individualism consisted of. One is morbidly curious to know what he would say. With the collapse of medievalism and the emergence of a free market society, Frome declares, man was compelled to assume total responsibility for his own survival. He had to produce and to trade. He had to think and to judge. He had no authority to guide him and nothing but his own ability to keep him in existence. No longer could he, by virtue of the class into which he was born, inherit his sense of personal identity. Henceforward he had to achieve it. This posed a devastating psychological problem for man, intensifying his basic feeling of isolation and separateness. It is true, Frome remarks, that the capitalistic mode of production is conducive to political freedom, while any centrally planned social order is in danger of leading to political regimentation and eventually to dictatorship. Capitalism, he further concedes, has proven itself superlatively capable of producing goods and of raising men's material standard of living to undreamed-of heights. But a sane society must have more to offer man than political freedom and material well-being. Capitalism, Frome insists, is destructive of man's spirit. He offers several reasons for this charge, which are very revealing. 1. Like Marx, Frome decries the humiliating predicament of the worker who has to sell his services. Capitalism condemns the worker to experience himself not as a man, but as a commodity, as a thing to be traded. Furthermore, since he is only a tiny part of a vast production process, since, for example, he does not build an entire automobile himself and then drive home in it, but builds only a small part of it, 
the total being subsequently sold to some unknown distant party, the worker feels alienated from the product of his own labor, and therefore feels alienated from his own labor as such. Unlike the artisan of the Middle Ages whose labor could express the full richness of his personality. It is an elementary fact of economics that specialization and exchange under a division of labor make a level of productivity possible which otherwise would not be remotely attainable. In pre-capitalist centuries, when a man's economic well-being was limited by the goods he himself could produce with his own primitive tools, an unconscionable amount of labor was required to make or acquire the simplest necessities, and the general standard of living was appallingly low. Human existence was a continual, exhausting struggle against imminent starvation. About half of the children born perished before the age of ten. But with the development of the wages system under capitalism, the introduction of machinery and the opportunity for a man to sell his labor, life, to say nothing of an ever-increasing standard of material well-being, was made possible for millions who could have had no chance at survival in pre-capitalist economies. However, for Fromm and those who share his viewpoint, these considerations are doubtless too materialistic. To offer men a chance to enjoy an unprecedented material well-being is evidently to sentence them to alienation, whereas to hold them down to the stagnant level of a medieval serf or guildsman is to offer them spiritual fulfillment. 2. Fromm decries the anonymity of the social forces inherent in the structure of the capitalistic mode of production. The laws of the market, of supply and demand, of economic cause and effect, are ominously impersonal. No single individual's wishes control them. Is it the worker who determines how much he is to be paid? No. It is not even the employer. It is that faceless monster, the market. It determines the wage level in some manner beyond the worker's power to grasp. As for the capitalist, his position is scarcely better. He, too, is helpless. The individual capitalist expands his enterprise not primarily because he wants to, but because he has to, because postponement of further expansion would mean regression. If he attempts to stagnate, he will go out of business. Under such a system, asks Fromm, how can man not feel alienated? Consider what Fromm is denouncing. Under capitalism, the wages paid to a man for his work are determined objectively, by the law of supply and demand. The market, reflecting the voluntary judgments of all those who participate in it, all those who buy and sell, produce and consume, offer or seek employment, establishes the general price level of goods and services. This is the context which men are obliged to consider in setting the prices they will ask for their work or offer for the work of others. If a man demands more than the market value of his work, he will remain unemployed. If a particular employer offers him less than the market value of his work, the man will seek and find employment elsewhere. The same principle applies to the capitalist who offers his goods for sale. If the prices and quality of his goods are comparable or preferable to those of other men in the same field of production, he will be able to compete. If others can do better than he can, if they can offer superior goods, and or lower prices, he will be obliged to improve, to grow, to equal their achievement, or else he will lose his customers. The standard determining a producer's success or failure is the objective value of his product, as judged within the context of the market, and of their knowledge, by those to whom he offers his product. This is the only rational and just principle of exchange, but this is what Fromm considers evil. What he rebels against is objectivity. How, he demands, can a man not feel alienated in a system where his wishes are not omnipotent, where the unearned is not to be had, where growth is rewarded and stagnation is penalized? It is clear from the foregoing that Fromm's basic quarrel is with reality. Since nature confronts man with the identical conditions which a free economy merely reflects, nature too holds man to the law of cause and effect, Nature, too, makes constant growth a condition of successful life. There are writers on alienation who recognize this and do not bother to center their attacks on capitalism. They damn nature outright. 
They declare that man's life is intrinsically and inescapably tragic, since reality is tyrannical, since contradictory desires cannot be satisfied, since objectivity is a prison, since time is a net that no one can elude, etc. Existentialists in particular specialize in this sort of pronouncement. 3. As consumer in a capitalist economy, Frome contends man is subject to further alienating pressures. He is overwhelmed with innumerable products among which he must choose. He is bewildered and brainwashed by the blandishments of advertisers forever urging him to buy their wares. This staggering multiplicity of possible choices is threatening to his sanity. Moreover, he is conditioned to consume for the sake of consuming to long for an ever higher standard of living merely in order to keep the system going. With automatic washing machines, automatic cameras, and automatic can openers, modern man's relationship to nature becomes more and more remote. He is increasingly condemned to the nightmare of an artificial world. No such problem confronted the feudal serf. This much is true. Sleeping on an earthen floor, the medieval serf, to say nothing of the caveman, was much closer to nature in one uncomfortable and unhygienic sense of the word. The above criticism of capitalism has become very fashionable among social commentators. What is remarkable is that almost invariably, as in the case of Frome, the criticism is made by the same writers who are loudest in crying that man needs more leisure. Yet the purpose of the gadgets they condemn is specifically to liberate man's time. Thus they wish to provide man with more leisure, while damning the material means that make leisure possible. As for the charge, equally popular, that the multiplicity of choices offered to man in capitalistic society is threatening to his mental equilibrium, it should be remembered that fear of choices and decisions is a basic symptom of mental illness. To whose mentality, then, do these critics of capitalism demand that society be adjusted? 4. The development of a complex, highly industrialized society requires an extreme degree of quantification and abstraction in man's method of thinking, observes Fromm. And this, in still another way, estranges man from the world around him. He loses the ability to relate to things in their concreteness and uniqueness. One can agree with Fromm in part. An industrial technological society demands the fullest development and exercise of man's conceptual faculty, i.e. of his instinctively human form of cognition. The sensory perceptual level of consciousness, the level of an animal's cognition, will not do. Those who assert that the conceptual level of consciousness alienates men from the real world merely confess that their concepts bear no relation to reality or that they do not understand the relation of concepts to reality. But it should be remembered that the capacity to abstract and conceptualize offers man, to the extent that he is rational, a means of relating to the world around him immeasurably superior to that enjoyed by any other species. It does not alienate man from nature. It makes him nature's master. An animal obeys nature blindly. Man obeys her intelligently and thereby acquires the power to command her. 5. Finally, most alienating of all, perhaps, are the sort of relationships that exist among men under capitalism, says Fromm. What is the modern man's relationship to his fellow man? It is one between two abstractions, two living machines who use each other. The employer uses the ones whom he employs, the salesman uses his customers. There is not much love or hate to be found in human relations of our day, there is rather a superficial friendliness and a more than superficial fairness, but behind that surface is distance and indifference. This book is continued on Disc 11. Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal by Ayn Rand Continued, Disc 11 The employer uses the ones whom he employs. The salesman uses his customers. There is not much love or hate to be found in human relations of our day. There is rather a superficial friendliness and a more than superficial fairness. 
but behind that surface is distance and indifference. The alienation between man and man results in the loss of those general and social bonds which characterize medieval as well as most other pre-capitalist societies. Fromm is claiming that there existed in pre-capitalist societies a mutual goodwill among men, an attitude of respect and benevolent solidarity, a regard for the value of the human person that vanished with the rise of a free market society. This is worse than false. The claim is absurd historically and disgraceful morally. It is notorious that in the Middle Ages, human relationships were characterized by mutual suspiciousness, hostility, and cruelty. Everyone regarded his neighbor as a potential threat, and nothing was held more cheaply than human life. Such invariably is the case in any society where men are ruled by brute force. In putting an end to slavery and serfdom, Capitalism introduced a social benevolence that would have been impossible under earlier systems. Capitalism valued a man's life as it had never been valued before. Capitalism is the politico-economic expression of the principle that a man's life, freedom, and happiness are his by moral right. There is a passage in the Fountainhead that bears on this issue. Civilization is the progress toward a society of privacy. The savage's whole existence is public, ruled by the laws of his tribe. Civilization is the process of setting man free from men. Under capitalism, men are free to choose their social bonds, meaning to choose whom they will associate with. Men are not trapped within the prison of their family, tribe, caste, class, or neighborhood. They choose whom they will value, whom they will befriend, whom they will deal with, what kind of relationships they will enter. This implies and entails men's responsibility to form independent value judgments. It implies and entails also that a man must earn the social relationships he desires. But this clearly is anathema to Fromm. Love, he has told us, is the only sane and satisfactory answer to the problem of human existence. But, he asserts, love and capitalism are inimical. The principle underlying capitalistic society and the principle of love are incompatible. The principle of capitalism, says Fromm, is that of fairness ethics, of trade, of the exchange of values, without recourse to force or fraud. Individuals deal with one another only on the premise of mutual self-interest. They exchange only in those transactions from which they expect a profit, reward, or gain. It may even be said that the development of fairness ethics is the particular ethical contribution of capitalist society. But to approach love with any concern for one's self-interest is, he asserts, to negate the very essence of love. To love an individual is to feel care and responsibility for him. It is not to appraise his character or personality as a commodity from which one expects pleasure. To love ideally is to love unconditionally. It is to love a human being not for the fact of what he is, but for the fact that he is. It is to love without reference to values or standards or judgment. In essence, all human beings are identical. We are all part of one. We are one. This being so, it should not make any difference whom we love. It should not, in other words, make any difference whether the person we love is a being of stature or a total non-entity, a genius or a fool, a hero or a scoundrel. We are all part of one. Is it necessary to point out who stands to gain and who to lose by this view of love? The desire to be loved unconditionally, the desire to be loved with no concern for his objective personal worth, is one of man's deepest longings, Fromm insists, whereas to be loved on the basis of merit, because one deserves it, invokes doubt and uncertainty, since merit has to be struggled for, and since such love can be withdrawn should the merit cease to exist. Furthermore, deserved love easily leaves a bitter feeling that one is not loved for oneself, that one is loved only because one pleases. It is typical of Frome that he should deliver what is in fact, though not in Frome's estimate, a deadly insult to human nature, without offering any justification for his charge. He assumes that all men by nature are so profoundly lacking in self-esteem 
that they crave a love which bears no relation to their actions, achievement, or character, a love not to be earned but to be received only as a free gift. What does it mean to be loved for oneself? In reason it can mean only to be loved for the values one has achieved in one's character and person. The highest compliment one can be paid by another human being is to be told, Because of what you are, you are essential to my happiness. But this is the love that, according to Fromm, leaves one with a bitter feeling. It is the capitalistic culture, he declares, that inculcates such concepts as the deserved and the undeserved, the earned and the unearned, and thus poisons the growth of proper love. Proper love, Fromm tells us, should be given solely out of the richness of the spirit of the giver, in demonstration of the giver's potency. Fromm nowhere reveals the exact nature of this potency, of course. Love is an act of faith. Proper love should raise no questions about the virtue or character of its object. It should desire no joy from such virtue as the object might possess. For if it does, it is not proper love, it is only capitalistic selfishness. But Fromm asks, how can one act within the framework of existing society and at the same time practice love? He does not declare that love is impossible under capitalism, merely that it is exceptionally difficult. Commenting in Who is Ayn Rand on Fromm's theory of love, I wrote, To love is to value. Love, properly, is the consequence and expression of admiration, the emotional price paid by one man for the joy he receives from the virtues of another, Atlas shrugged. Love is not alms, but a moral tribute. If love did not imply admiration, if it did not imply an acknowledgment of moral qualities that the recipient of love possessed, what meaning or significance would love have? And why would Fromm or anyone consider it desirable? Only one answer is possible, and it is not an attractive one. When love is divorced from values, then love becomes not a tribute, but a moral blank check, a promise that one will be forgiven anything, that one will not be abandoned, that one will be taken care of. This view of love is not, of course, peculiar to Fromm. It is a central component of the mystic altruist tradition and is as prevalent among psychologists, sociologists, and philosophers as it is among religionists. Perhaps the simplest and most eloquent answer to this view of love is one sentence of John Galt in Atlas Shrugged. A morality that professes the belief that the values of the spirit are more precious than matter. A morality that teaches you to scorn a whore who gives her body indiscriminately to all men. This same morality demands that you surrender your soul to promiscuous love for all comers. To divorce love from values and value judgments is to confess one's longing for the unearned. The idealization of this longing as a proper moral goal is a constant theme running through Fromm's writing. That the underlying motive is the desire to be taken care of, the desire to be spared the responsibility of independence, is revealed explicitly in Fromm's socio-political solution to the problem of alienation. In order that man may be enabled to conquer his feeling of aloneness and alienation, to practice love and to achieve a full sense of personal identity, a new social system must be established, Fromm declares. Private ownership of the means of production must be abolished. The profit motive must be forbidden. Industry must be decentralized. Society should be divided into self-governing industrial guilds. Factories should be owned and run by all those who work in them. Why, according to Fromm's social philosophy, should a janitor in an industrial plant not have the same right to determine its management as the man who happened to create the plant? Does not the janitor's personality require as much self-expression as anyone else? Under capitalism, says Fromm, Men are overwhelmed by and are the pawns of a complex industrial machine whose omnipotent forces and laws are beyond their comprehension or control. Under the decentralized democratic system he proposes, which is some sort of blend of guild socialism and syndicalism, industrial establishments will be broken down into units whose function is within everyone's easy comprehension, with no alienating demands made on anyone's abstract capacity. 
Under this system, he explains, every person will be provided with his minimum subsistence whether the person wishes to work or not. This is necessary if man is to develop healthily and happily. However, to discourage parasitism, Frome suggests that this support should not extend beyond two years. Who is to provide the support, whether they will be willing to do so, and what will happen if they are not willing, are questions Frome does not discuss. So long as men are occupied with the problem of survival, Frome feels, their spiritual concerns, the concerns that really matter, are almost inevitably neglected. How can the worker's personality not be impoverished if he must face daily the necessity of earning a livelihood? How can the businessman develop his creative potentialities if he is in bondage to his obsession with production? How can the artist preserve his soul's integrity if he is plagued with temptations by Hollywood and Madison Avenue? How can the consumer cultivate individual tastes and preferences if he is surrounded by the standardized commodities begotten by mass production. If one wishes to understand the relevance of epistemology to politics, one should observe what is gained for Frome by that paradoxical logic of which he writes so approvingly. If, as it teaches, man can perceive reality only in contradictions, then Frome does not have to be troubled by the conflict between his claim to be an advocate of reason and his enthusiasm for Eastern mysticism. Nor does he have to be troubled by the conflict between his claim to be a defender of individualism and his advocacy of political collectivism. His disdain for the law of contradiction permits him to announce that true individualism is possible only in the collectivized community, that true freedom is possible only when production is taken out of the hands of private individuals and placed under the absolute control of the group that men will cease to be objects of use by others only when they are willing to renounce personal profit and make social usefulness the goal of their lives. Frome calls his proposed system humanistic communitarian socialism. Under it, he maintains, man will achieve a new harmony with nature to replace the one he has lost. Man will enjoy the tranquility and self-fulfillment of the animals whose state Frome finds so enviable. If, often, Frome is more than a little disingenuous in the presentation of his views, he is nonetheless extremely explicit. This is what is unusual about him. Most writers of his persuasion twist themselves for pages and pages in order to obscure their advocacy of the ideas and contradictions which he announces openly. With rare exceptions, one will find comparable candor only among the existentialists and Zen Buddhists, many of whose premises Frome shares. His explicitness notwithstanding, he is very representative culturally and should be recognized as such. The recurrent themes running through the literature on alienation and through today's social commentary generally are the themes which Frome brings into naked focus, that reason is unnatural, that a non-contradictory objective reality restricts one's individuality that the necessity of choice is an awesome burden, that it is tragic not to be able to eat one's cake and have it too, that self-responsibility is frightening, that the achievement of personal identity is a social problem, that love is the omnipotent solution, and that the political implementation of this solution is socialism. The transparent absurdity or the unintelligibility of most discussions of alienation might tempt one to believe that the issue is entirely illusory, but this would be an error. Although the explanations offered for it are spurious, the problem of alienation is real. A great many men do recognize the painful emotional state which writers on alienation describe. A great many men do lack a sense of personal identity. A great many men do feel themselves to be strangers and afraid in a world they never made. But why? What is the problem of alienation? What is personal identity? Why should so many men experience the task of achieving it as a dreaded burden? And what is the significance of the attacks on capitalism in connection with this issue? These are the questions we must now proceed to answer. The problem of alienation and the problem of personal identity are inseparable. The man who lacks a firm sense of personal identity feels alienated. 
The man who feels alienated lacks a firm sense of personal identity. Pain is an organism's alarm signal, warning of danger. The particular species of pain, which is the feeling of alienation, announces to a man that he is existing in a psychological state improper to him, that his relationship to reality is wrong. No animal faces such questions as, what should I make of myself? What manner of life is proper to my nature? Such questions are possible only to a rational being, i.e. a being whose characteristic method of cognitive functioning, of apprehending reality, is conceptual, who is not only conscious but also self-conscious, and whose power of abstraction enables him to project many alternative courses of action. Further, such questions are possible only to a being whose cognitive faculty is exercised volitionally. Thinking is not automatic. A being who is self-directing and self-regulating in thought and action, and whose existence, therefore, entails a constant process of choice. As a living entity, man is born with specific needs and capacities. These constitute his species identity, so to speak, i.e., they constitute his human nature. How he exercises his capacities to satisfy his needs, i.e., how he deals with the facts of reality, how he chooses to function in thought and in action, constitutes his personal or individual identity. His sense of himself, his implicit concept or image of the kind of person he is, including his self-esteem or lack of it, is the cumulative product of the choices he makes. This is the meaning of Ayn Rand's statement that Man is a being of self-made soul. A man's I, his ego, his deepest self, is his faculty of awareness, his capacity to think, to choose to think, to identify the facts of reality, to assume the responsibility of judging what is true or false, right or wrong, is man's basic form of self-assertiveness. It is his acceptance of his own nature as a rational being, his acceptance of the responsibility of intellectual independence, his commitment to the efficacy of his own mind. The essence of selflessness is the suspension of one's consciousness. When and to the extent that a man chooses to evade the effort and responsibility of thinking, of seeking knowledge, of passing judgment, his action is one of self-abdication, to relinquish thought is to relinquish one's ego, and to pronounce oneself unfit for existence, incompetent to deal with the facts of reality. To the extent that a man chooses to think, his premises and values are acquired firsthand, and they are not a mystery to him. He experiences himself as the active cause of his character, behavior, and goals. To the extent that a man attempts to live without thinking, he experiences himself as passive. His person and actions are the accidental products of forces he does not understand, of his range of the moment feelings and random environmental influences. When a man defaults on the responsibility of thought, he is left at the mercy of his involuntary subconscious reactions, and these will be at the mercy of the outside forces impinging upon him, at the mercy of whoever and whatever is around him. By his default, such a person turns himself into the social determinist's view of man, into an empty mold waiting to be filled, into a willless robot waiting to be taken over by any environment and any conditioners. A strong sense of personal identity is the product of two things, a policy of independent thinking, and as a consequence the possession of an integrated set of values. Since it is his values that determine a man's emotions and goals and give direction and meaning to his life, a man experiences his values as an extension of himself, as an integral part of his identity, as crucial to that which makes him himself. Values in this context refers to fundamental and abstract values, not to concrete value judgments. For example, a man holding rationality as his abstract value may choose a friend who appears to embody this value. If subsequently he decides that he was mistaken in his judgment, that his friend is not rational, and that their relationship should be ended, 
this does not alter his personal identity. But if instead he decides that he no longer values rationality, his personal identity is altered. If a man holds contradictory values, these necessarily do violence to his sense of personal identity. They result in a splintered sense of self, a self broken into unintegratable fragments. To avoid this painful experience of a splintered identity, a man whose values are contradictory will commonly seek to escape knowledge of his contradictions by means of evasion, repression, rationalization, etc. Thus, to escape a problem created by a failure of thought, he suspends thinking. To escape a threat to his sense of personal identity, he suspends his ego. He suspends his self qua thinking, judging entity. Thus, he displaces his sense of self downward, so to speak, from his reason, which is the active, initiating element in man, to his emotions, which are the passive, reactive element. Moved by feelings whose source he does not understand, and by contradictions whose existence he does not acknowledge, he suffers a progressive sense of self-estrangement, of self-alienation. A man's emotions are the product of his premises and values, of the thinking he has done or has failed to do. But the man who is run by his emotions, attempting to make them a substitute for rational judgment, experiences them as alien forces. The paradox of his position is this. His emotions become his only source of personal identity, but his experience of identity becomes a being ruled by demons. It is important to observe that the experience of self-alienation and the feeling of being alienated from reality, from the world around one, proceed from the same cause, one's default on the responsibility of thinking. The suspension of proper cognitive contact with reality and the suspension of one's ego are a single act. A flight from reality is a flight from self. One of the consequences is a feeling of alienation from other men, the sense that one is not part of the human race, that one is in effect a freak. In betraying one's status as a human being, one makes oneself a metaphysical outcast. This is not altered by the knowledge that many other human beings have committed the same betrayal. One feels alone and cut off, cut off by the unreality of one's own existence, by one's desolate inner sense of spiritual impoverishment. The same failure of rationality and independence by which men rob themselves of personal identity leads them most commonly to the self-destructive policy of seeking a substitute for identity, or more precisely, seeking a second-hand identity, through mindless conformity to the values of others. This is the psychological phenomenon which I have designated as social metaphysics. In my article, Rogue's Gallery, dealing with different types of social metaphysicians, I commented on the type most relevant to the present context, the conventional social metaphysician. This is the person who accepts the world and its prevailing values ready-made. His is not to reason why. What is true, what others say is true. What is right, what others believe is right. How should one live, as others live? This is the person whose sense of identity and personal worth is explicitly a function of his ability to satisfy the values, terms, and expectations of those omniscient and omnipresent others. In a culture such as the present one, with its disintegrating values, its intellectual chaos, its moral bankruptcy, where the familiar guideposts and rules are vanishing, where the authoritative mirrors reflecting reality are splintering into a thousand unintelligible subcults, where adjustment is becoming harder and harder. The conventional social metaphysician is the first to run to a psychiatrist crying that he has lost his identity because he no longer knows unequivocally what he is supposed to do and be. It would never occur to a person of self-esteem and independent judgment that one's identity is a thing to be gained from or determined by others. To a person untouched by self-doubt, the wails heard today about the anguish of modern man as he confronts the question, Who am I? are incomprehensible. But in the light of the above, the wailing becomes more intelligible. It is the cry of social metaphysicians who no longer know which authorities to obey, 
and who are moaning that it is someone's duty to herd them to a sense of self, that the system must provide them with self-esteem. This is the psychological root of the modern intellectual's mystique of the Middle Ages, of the dazed longing for that style of life, and of the massive evasion concerning the actual conditions of existence during that period. The Middle Ages represents the social metaphysician's unconfessed dream, a system in which his dread of independence and self-responsibility is proclaimed to be a virtue and is made a social imperative. When, in any age, a man attempts to evade the responsibility of intellectual independence and to derive his sense of identity from belonging, he pays a deadly price in terms of the sabotaging of his mental processes thereafter. The degree to which a man substitutes the judgment of others for his own, failing to look at reality directly, is the degree to which his mental processes are alienated from reality. He functions not by means of concepts, but by means of memorized cue words, i.e. learned sounds associated with certain contexts and situations, but lacking authentic cognitive content for their user. This is the unidentified, unrecognized phenomenon that prompts unthinking people today to grant validity to the charge that modern man lives too abstractly, too intellectually, and that he needs to get back to nature. They sense dimly that they are out of contact with reality, that something is wrong with their grasp of the world around them, but they accept an entirely fallacious interpretation of their problem. The truth is not that they are lost among abstractions, but that they have failed to discover the nature and proper use of abstractions. They are not lost among concepts, they are lost among cue words. They are cut off from reality not because they attempt to grasp it too intellectually, but because they attempt to grasp it only as seen by others. They attempt to grasp it second-hand, and they move through an unreal world of verbal rituals mouthing the slogans and phrases they hear repeated by others, falsely imagining that those empty words are concepts, and never apprehending the proper use of their conceptual faculty, never learning what first-hand conceptual knowledge consists of. Then they are ready for the Zen Buddhist who tells them that the solution to their alienation from reality is to empty their mind of all thought and sit for an hour cross-legged contemplating the pattern of veins on a leaf. It is a well-known psychological fact that when men are neurotically anxious, when they suffer from feelings of dread for which they cannot account, they often attempt to make their plight more tolerable by directing their fear at some external object. They seek to persuade themselves that their fear is a rational response to the threat of germs or the possible appearance of burglars or the danger of lightning or the brain-controlling radiations of Martians. The process by which men decide that the cause of their alienation is capitalism is not dissimilar. There are reasons, however, why capitalism is the target for their projection and rationalization. The alienated man is fleeing from the responsibility of a volitional, i.e. self-directing, consciousness. The freedom to think or not to think, to initiate a process of reason or to evade it, is a burden he longs to escape. But since this freedom is inherent in his nature as man, there is no escape from it. Hence his guilt and anxiety when he abandons reason and sight in favor of feelings and blindness. But there is another level on which man confronts the issue of freedom, the existential or social level, and here escape is possible. Political freedom is not a metaphysical given. It has to be achieved. Hence it can be rejected. The psychological root of the revolt against freedom in one's existence is the revolt against freedom in one's consciousness. The root of the revolt against self-responsibility in action is the revolt against self-direction in thought. The man who does not want to think does not want to bear responsibility for the consequences of his actions nor for his own life. It is appropriate in this connection to quote a passage from Who is Ayn Rand, in which I discuss the similarity of the attacks against capitalism launched by 19th century medievalists and socialists. In the writings of both medievalists and socialists, 
one can observe the unmistakable longing for a society in which man's existence will be automatically guaranteed to him, that is, in which man will not have to bear responsibility for his own survival. Both camps project their ideal society as one characterized by that which they call harmony, by freedom from rapid change or challenge or the exacting demands of competition a society in which each must do his prescribed part to contribute to the well-being of the whole, but in which no one will face the necessity of making choices and decisions that will crucially affect his life and future, in which the question of what one has or has not earned, and does or does not deserve, will not come up, in which rewards will not be tied to achievement, and in which someone's benevolence will guarantee that one need never bear the consequences of one's errors. The failure of capitalism to conform to what may be termed this pastoral view of existence is essential to the medievalists' and socialists' indictment of a free society. It is not a garden of Eden that capitalism offers men. Today, of course, capitalism has largely been abandoned in favor of a mixed economy, i.e. a mixture of freedom and statism, moving steadily in the direction of increasing statism. Today we are far closer to the ideal society of the socialists than when Marx first wrote of the workers' alienation. Yet with every advance of collectivism, the cries concerning man's alienation grow louder. The problem, we are told, is getting worse. In communist countries, when such criticisms are allowed to be voiced, some commentators are beginning to complain that the Marxist solution to the workers' alienation has failed, that man under communism is still alienated, that the new harmony with nature and one's fellow men has not come. It didn't come to the medieval serf or guildsman either, the propaganda of commentators such as Eric Fromm notwithstanding. Man cannot escape from his nature and if he establishes a social system which is inimical to the requirements of his nature, a system which forbids him to function as a rational, independent being, psychological and physical disaster is the result. A free society, of course, cannot automatically guarantee the mental well-being of all its members. Freedom is not a sufficient condition to assure man's proper fulfillment, but it is a necessary condition. And capitalism, laissez-faire capitalism, is the only system which provides that condition. The problem of alienation is not metaphysical. It is not man's natural fate, never to be escaped like some sort of original sin. It is a disease. It is not the consequence of capitalism or industrialism or bigness, and it cannot be legislated out of existence by the abolition of property rights. The problem of alienation is psychoepistemological. It pertains to how man chooses to use his own consciousness. It is the product of man's revolt against thinking, which means against reality. If a man defaults on the responsibility of seeking knowledge, choosing values and setting goals, if this is the sphere he surrenders to the authority of others, how is he to escape the feeling that the universe is closed to him? It is, by his own choice. The proper answer to the question... And how am I to face the odds of man's bedevilment and God's, I a stranger and afraid in a world I never made, is, why didn't you? Chapter 24, Requiem for Man, by Ayn Rand, the last chapter. In advocating capitalism, I have said and stressed for years that capitalism is incompatible with altruism and mysticism. Those who chose to doubt that the issue is either or have now heard it from the highest authority of the opposite side, Pope Paul VI. The encyclical Populorum Progressio, on the development of peoples, is an unusual document. It reads as if a long repressed emotion broke out into the open, past the barrier of carefully measured, cautiously calculated sentences, with the hissing pressure of centuries of silence. The sentences are full of contradictions. The emotion is consistent. The encyclical is the manifesto of an impassioned hatred for capitalism. But its evil is much more profound, and its target is more than mere politics. 
It is written in terms of a mystic altruist sense of life. A sense of life is the subconscious equivalent of metaphysics, a preconceptual, emotionally integrated appraisal of man's nature and of his relationship to existence. To a mystic altruist sense of life, words are mere approximations, hence the encyclical's tone of evasion. But what is eloquently revealing is the nature of that which is being evaded. On the question of capitalism, the encyclical's position is explicit and unequivocal. Referring to the Industrial Revolution, the encyclical declares, But it is unfortunate that on these new conditions of society, a system has been constructed which considers profit as the key motive for economic progress, competition as the supreme law of economics, and private ownership of the means of production as an absolute right that has no limits and carries no corresponding social obligation. But if it is true that a type of capitalism has been the source of excessive suffering, injustices, and fratricidal conflicts whose effects still persist, it would also be wrong to attribute to industrialization itself evils that belong to the woeful system which accompanied it. Paragraph 26 the Vatican is not the city room of a third-rate Marxist tabloid. It is an institution geared to a perspective of centuries, to scholarship and timeless philosophical deliberation. Ignorance, therefore, cannot be the explanation of the above. Even the leftists know that the advent of capitalism and industrialization was not an unfortunate coincidence, and that the first made the second possible. What are the excessive suffering, injustices, and fratricidal conflicts caused by capitalism? The encyclical gives no answer. What social system, past or present, has a better record in respect to any social evil that anyone might choose to ascribe to capitalism? Has the feudalism of the Middle Ages? Has absolute monarchy? Has socialism or fascism? No answer. If one is to consider excessive suffering, injustices, and fratricidal conflicts, what aspect of capitalism can be placed in the same category with the terror and wholesale slaughter of Nazi Germany or Soviet Russia? No answer. If there is no causal connection between capitalism and the people's progress, welfare, and standard of living, why are these highest in the countries whose systems have the largest element of capitalistic economic freedom? No answer. Since the encyclical is concerned with history and with fundamental political principles, yet does not discuss or condemn any social system other than capitalism, one must conclude that all other systems are compatible with the encyclical's political philosophy. This is supported by the fact that capitalism is condemned not for some lesser characteristics, but for its essentials, which are not the base of any other system. The profit motive competition, and private ownership of the means of production. By what moral standard does the encyclical judge a social system? Its most specific accusation directed at capitalism reads as follows. The desire for necessities is legitimate, and work undertaken to obtain them is a duty. If any man will not work, neither let him eat. But the acquiring of temporal goods can lead to greed, to the insatiable desire for more, and can make increased power a tempting objective. Individuals, families, and nations can be overcome by avarice, be they poor or rich, and all can fall victim to a stifling materialism. Paragraph 18 Since time immemorial and pre-industrial, greed has been the accusation hurled at the rich by the concrete-bound illiterates who were unable to conceive of the source of wealth or of the motivation of those who produce it but the above was not written by an illiterate. Terms such as greed and avarice connote the caricature image of two individuals, one fat, the other lean, one indulging in mindless gluttony, the other starving over chests of hoarded gold, both symbols of the acquisition of riches for the sake of riches. Is that the motive power of capitalism? If all the wealth spent on personal consumption by all the rich of the United States were expropriated, and distributed among our population, it would amount to less than a dollar per person. Try to figure out the amount it distributed to the entire population of the globe. The rest of American wealth is invested in production, and it is this constantly growing investment that raises America's standard of living 
by raising the productivity of its labor. This is primer economics, which Pope Paul VI cannot fail to know. To observe the technique of epistemological manipulation, read that quoted paragraph again and look past the images invoked by the window dressing of greed and avarice. You will observe that the evil being denounced is the insatiable desire for more. Of what? Of increased power. What sort of power? No direct answer is given in that paragraph. But the entire encyclical provides the answer by means of a significant omission. No distinction is drawn between economic power and political power, between production and force. They are used interchangeably in some passages and equated explicitly in others. If you look at the facts of reality, you will observe that the increased power which men of wealth seek under capitalism is the power of independent production, the power of an insatiable ambition to expand their productive capacity, and that this is what the encyclical damns. The evil is not work, but ambitious work. These implications are supported and gently stressed in a subsequent paragraph, which lists the encyclical's view of less human conditions of social existence. The lack of material necessities for those who are without the minimum essential for life, the moral deficiencies of those who are mutilated by selfishness, oppressive social structures, whether due to the abuses of ownership or to the abuses of power, and, as more human conditions, the passage from misery toward the possession of necessities. Paragraph 21 What necessities are the minimum essential for life? For what kind of life? Is it for mere physical survival? If so, for how long a survival? No answer is given. But the encyclical's principle is clear. Only those who rise no higher than the barest minimum of subsistence have the right to material possessions, and this right supersedes all the rights of all other men, including their right to life. This is stated explicitly. The Bible, from the first page on, teaches us that the whole of creation is for man, that it is his responsibility to develop it by intelligent effort and by means of his labor to perfect it, so to speak, for his use. If the world is made to furnish each individual with the means of livelihood and the instruments for his growth and progress, each man has therefore the right to find in the world what is necessary for himself. The recent council reminded us of this. God intended the earth and all that it contains for the use of every human being and people. Thus, as all men follow justice and charity, created goods should abound for them on a reasonable basis. All other rights whatsoever, including those of property and of free commerce, are to be subordinated to this principle. 22. Observe what element is missing from this view of the world, what human faculty is regarded as inessential or non-existent. I shall discuss this aspect later in more detail. For the moment I shall merely call your attention to the use of the word man in the above paragraph, which man, and to the term created goods, Created by whom? Blank out. That missing element becomes blatant in the encyclical's next paragraph. It is well known how strong were the words used by the fathers of the church to describe the proper attitude of persons who possess anything toward persons in need. To quote St. Ambrose, You are not making a gift of your possessions to the poor person. You are handing over to him what is his. For what has been given in common for the use of all, you have arrogated to yourself. The world is given to all and not only to the rich. That is, private property does not constitute for anyone an absolute and unconditional right. No one is justified in keeping for his exclusive use what he does not need when others lack necessities. 23. St. Ambrose lived in the fourth century when such views of property could conceivably have been explicable, if not justifiable. From the nineteenth century on, they can be neither. What solution does the encyclical offer to the problems of today's world? Individual initiative alone and the mere free play of competition could never assure successful development. One must avoid the risk of increasing still more the wealth of the rich and the dominion of the strong, while leaving the poor in their misery and adding to the servitude of the oppressed. Hence programs are necessary in order to encourage 
stimulate, coordinate, supplement, and integrate the activity of individuals and of intermediary bodies. It pertains to the public authorities to choose, even to lay down, the objectives to be pursued, the ends to be achieved, and the means for attaining these, and it is for them to stimulate all the forces engaged in this common activity. 33. A society in which the government, the public authorities, chooses and lays down the objectives to be pursued, the ends to be achieved, and the means for achieving them is a totalitarian state. It is therefore morally shocking to read the very next sentence. But let them take care to associate private initiative and intermediary bodies with this work. They will thus avoid the danger of complete collectivization or of arbitrary planning, which by denying liberty would prevent the exercise of the fundamental rights of the human person. 33. What are the fundamental rights of the human person, which are never defined in the encyclical, in a state where all other rights whatsoever are to be subordinated to this principle, the right to minimum sustenance? 22. What is liberty or private initiative in a state where the government lays down the ends and commandeers the means? What is incomplete collectivization? It is difficult to believe that modern compromisers, to whom that paragraph is addressed, could stretch their capacity for evasion far enough to take it to mean the advocacy of a mixed economy. A mixed economy is a mixture of capitalism and statism. When the principles and practices of capitalism are damned and annihilated at the root, what is to prevent the statist collectivization from becoming complete? The moral shock comes from the realization that the encyclical regards some men's capacity for evasion as infinitely elastic. Judging by the reactions it received, the encyclical did not miscalculate. I have always maintained that every political theory is based on some code of ethics. Here again, the encyclical confirms my statement, though from the viewpoint of a moral code which is the opposite of mine. The same duty of solidarity that rests on individuals exists also for nations. Advanced nations have a very heavy obligation to help the developing peoples. It is necessary to put this teaching of the Council into effect, although it is normal that a nation should be the first to benefit from the gifts that Providence has bestowed on it as the fruit of the labors of its people. Still no country can claim on that account to keep its wealth for itself alone. 48. This seems clear enough, but the encyclical takes pains not to be misunderstood. In other words, the rule of free trade taken by itself is no longer able to govern international relations. One must recognize that it is the fundamental principle of liberalism as the rule for commercial exchange which is questioned here. 58. We must repeat once more that the superfluous wealth of rich countries should be placed at the service of poor nations. The rule which up to now held good for the benefit of those nearest to us must today be applied to all the needy of this world. 49. If need, global need, is the criterion of morality, if minimum subsistence, the standard of living of the least developed savages, is the criterion of property rights, then every new shirt or dress, every ice cream cone, every automobile, refrigerator, or television set becomes superfluous wealth. Remember that rich is a relative concept and that the sharecroppers of the United States are fabulously rich compared to the laborers of Asia or Africa. Yet the encyclical denounces as unjust free trade among unequally developed countries on the grounds that highly industrialized nations export for the most part manufactured goods, while countries with less developed economies have only food, fibers, and other raw materials to sell. 57 alleging that this perpetuates the poverty of the undeveloped countries. The encyclical demands that international trade be ruled not by the laws of the free market, but by the need of its neediest participants. How this would work in practice is made explicitly clear. This demands great generosity, much sacrifice, and unceasing effort on the part of the rich man. Let each one examine his conscience, a conscience that conveys a new message for our times. Is he ready to pay higher taxes so that the public authorities can intensify their efforts in favor of development? 
Is he ready to pay a higher price for imported goods, so that the producer may be more justly rewarded? 47. It is not only the rich who pay taxes. The major share of the tax burden in the United States is carried by the middle and lower income classes. It is not for the exclusive personal consumption of the rich that foreign goods or raw materials are imported. The price of food is not a major concern to the rich, it is a crucial concern to the poor. And since food is listed as one of the chief products of the undeveloped countries, project what the encyclical's proposal would mean. It would mean that an American housewife would have to buy food produced by men who scratch the soil with bare hands or hand plows, and would pay prices which, if paid to America's mechanized farmers, would have given her a hundred or a thousand times more. Which items of her family budget would she have to sacrifice so that those undeveloped producers may be more justly rewarded? Would she sacrifice some purchases of clothing? But her clothing budget would have shrunk in the same manner and proportion, since she would have to provide the just rewards of the producers of fibers and other raw materials, and so on. What then would happen to her standard of living? And what would happen to the American farmers and producers of raw materials? Forced to compete, not in terms of productive competence, but of need, they would have to arrest their development and revert to the methods of the hand plow. What then would happen to the standard of living of the whole world? No, it is not possible that Pope Paul VI was so ignorant of economics and so lacking in the capacity to concretize his theories that he offered such proposals in the name of humanism without realizing the unspeakably inhuman cruelty they entail. It seems inexplicable, but there is a certain basic premise that would explain it. It would integrate the encyclical's clashing elements, the contradictions, the equivocations, the omissions, the unanswered questions, into a consistent pattern. To discover it, one must ask, what is the encyclical's view of man's nature? That particular view is seldom admitted or fully identified by those who hold it. It is less a matter of conscious philosophy than of a feeling dictated by a sense of life. The conscious philosophy of those who hold it consists predominantly of attempts to rationalize it. To identify that view, let us go to its roots, to the kind of phenomena which give rise to it in sense of life terms. I will ask you to project the look on a child's face when he grasps the answer to some problem he has been striving to understand. It is a radiant look of joy, of liberation, almost of triumph, which is unselfconscious, yet self-assertive, and its radiance seems to spread in two directions, outward as an illumination of the world, inward as the first spark of what is to become the fire of an earned pride. If you have seen this look or experienced it, you know that if there is such a concept as sacred, meaning the best, the highest possible to man, this look is the sacred the not to be betrayed, the not to be sacrificed for anything or anyone. This look is not confined to children. Comic strip artists are in the habit of representing it by means of a light bulb flashing on above the head of a character who has suddenly grasped an idea. In simple, primitive terms, this is an appropriate symbol. An idea is a light turned on in a man's soul. It is the steady, confident reflection of that light that you look for in the faces of adults, particularly of those to whom you entrust your most precious values. You look for it in the eyes of a surgeon performing an operation on the body of a loved one. You look for it in the face of a pilot at the controls of the plane in which you are flying. And if you are consistent, you look for it in the person of the man or woman you marry. That light bulb look is the flash of a human intelligence in action. It is the outward manifestation of man's rational faculty. It is the signal and symbol of man's mind. And to the extent of your humanity, it is involved in everything you seek, enjoy, value, or love. But suppose that admiration is not your response to that look on the face of a child or adult. Suppose that your response is a nameless fear then you will spend your life and your philosophical capacity on the struggle never to let that fear be named. You will find rationalizations to hide it, 
and you will call that child's look a look of selfishness or arrogance or intransigence or pride, all of which will be true, but not in the way you will struggle to suggest. You will feel that that look in man's eyes is your greatest, most dangerous enemy, and the desire to vanquish that look will become your only absolute, taking precedence over reason, logic, consistency, existence, reality. The desire to vanquish that look is the desire to break man's spirit. Thus you will acquire the kind of sense of life that produced the encyclical Populorum Progressio. It was not produced by the sense of life of any one person, but by the sense of life of an institution. The dominant chord of the encyclical sense of life is hatred for man's mind, hence hatred for man, hence hatred for life and for this earth, hence hatred for man's enjoyment of his life on earth, and hence as a last and least consequence, hatred for the only social system that makes all these values possible in practice, capitalism. I could maintain this on the grounds of a single example. Consider the proposal to condemn Americans to a lifetime of unrewarded drudgery at forced labor, making them work as hard as they do or harder, with nothing to gain but the barest subsistence, while savages collect the products of their effort. When you hear a proposal of this sort, what image leaps into your mind? What I see is the young people who start out in life with self-confident eagerness, who work their way through school, their eyes fixed on their future with a joyous, uncomplaining dedication. And what meaning a new coat, a new rug, an old car bought second hand, or a ticket to the movies has in their lives as the fuel of their courage. Anyone who evades that image while he plans to dispose of the fruit of the labors of people and declares that human effort is not a sufficient reason for a man to keep his own product may claim any motive but love of humanity. I could rest my case on this alone, but I shan't. The encyclical offers more than a sense of life. It contains specific, conscious, philosophical corroboration. Observe that it is not aimed at destroying man's mind, but at a slower, more agonizing equivalent, at enslaving it. The key to understanding the encyclical social theories is contained in a statement of John Galt. I am the man whose existence your blank outs were intended to permit you to ignore. I am the man whom you did not want either to live or to die. You did not want me to live because you were afraid of knowing that I carried the responsibility you dropped and that your lives depended upon me. You did not want me to die because you knew it. Atlas shrugged. The encyclical neither denies nor acknowledges the existence of human intelligence. It merely treats it as an inconsequential human attribute, requiring no consideration. The main and virtually only reference to the role of intelligence in man's existence reads as follows. The introduction of industry is a necessity for economic growth and human progress. It is also a sign of development and contributes to it. By persistent work and use of his intelligence, man gradually wrests nature's secrets from her and finds a better application for her riches. As his self-mastery increases, he develops a taste for research and discovery, an ability to take a calculated risk, boldness in enterprises, generosity in what he does, and a sense of responsibility. 25. Observe that the creative power of man's mind, of his basic means of survival, of the faculty that distinguishes him from animals, is described as an acquired taste like a taste for olives or for ladies' fashions. Observe that even this paltry acknowledgment is not allowed to stand by itself, lest research and discovery be taken as a value they are enmeshed in such irrelevancies as generosity. The same pattern is repeated in discussing the subject of work. The encyclical warns that it, work, can sometimes be given exaggerated significance, but admits that work is a creative process, then adds that when work is done in common, when hope, hardship, ambition, and joy are shared, men find themselves to be brothers, 27, and then work, of course, can have contrary effects, for it promises money, pleasure, and power, invites some to selfishness, others to revolt, 28. This means that pleasure, the kind of pleasure which is earned by productive work, is evil, 
Power, economic power, the kind earned by productive work, is evil, and money, the thing which the entire encyclical begs for passionately, is evil if kept in the hands of those who earned it. Do you see John Galt doing work in common, sharing hope, hardship, ambition, and joy with James Taggart, Wesley Mouch, and Dr. Floyd Ferris? But these are only fiction characters, you say. Okay. Do you see Pasteur? Do you see Columbus? Do you see Galileo? And what happened to him when he tried to share his hope, hardship, ambition, and joy with the Catholic Church? No. The encyclical does not deny the existence of men of genius. If it did, it would not have to plead so hard for global sharing. If all men were interchangeable, if degrees of ability were of no consequence, everyone would produce the same amount, and there would be no benefits for anyone to derive from sharing. The encyclical assumes that the unnamed, unrecognized, unacknowledged fountainheads of wealth would somehow continue to function, and proceeds to set up conditions of existence which would make their functioning impossible. Remember that intelligence is not an exclusive monopoly of genius. It is an attribute of all men, and the differences are only a matter of degree. If conditions of existence are destructive to genius, they are destructive to every man each in proportion to his intelligence. If genius is penalized, so is the faculty of intelligence in every other man. There is only this difference. The average man does not possess the genius's power of self-confident resistance and will break much faster. He will give up his mind in hopeless bewilderment under the first touch of pressure. There is no place for the mind in the world proposed by the encyclical and no place for man. The entities populating it are insentient robots geared to perform prescribed tasks in a gigantic tribal machine, robots deprived of choice, judgment, values, convictions, and self-esteem, above all self-esteem. You are not making a gift of your possessions to the poor person. You are handing over to him what is his. 23. Does the wealth created by Thomas A. Edison belong to the Bushman who did not create it? Does the paycheck you earned this week belong to the hippies next door who did not earn it? A man would not accept that notion. A robot would. A man would take pride in his achievement. It is the pride of achievement that has to be burned out of the robots of the future. For what has been given in common for the use of all you have arrogated to yourself, 23. God intended the earth and all that it contains for the use of every human being and people, 22. You are one of the things that the earth contains. Are you, therefore, intended for the use of every human being and people? The encyclical's answer is apparently yes, since the world it proposes is based on that premise in every essential respect. A man would not accept that premise. A man such as John Galt would say, You have never discovered the industrial age, and you cling to the morality of the barbarian eras when a miserable form of human subsistence was produced by the muscular labor of slaves. Every mystic had always longed for slaves, to protect him from the material reality he dreaded. But you, you grotesque little atavists, stare blindly at the skyscrapers and smokestacks around you and dream of enslaving the material providers who are scientists, inventors, industrialists, when you clamor for public ownership of the means of production, you are clamoring for public ownership of the mind. Atlas shrugged. But a robot would not say it. A robot would be programmed not to question the source of wealth, and would never discover that the source of wealth is man's mind. On hearing such notions as, The whole of creation is for man, 22, and The world is given to all, 23, a man would grasp that these are equivocations which evade the question of what is necessary to make use of natural resources. He would know that nothing is given to him, that the transformation of raw materials into human goods requires a process of thought and labor which some men will perform and others will not, and that in justice no man can have a primary right to the goods created by the thought and labor of others. A robot would not protest. It would see no difference between itself and raw materials. It would take its own motions as the given. A man who loves his work and knows what enormous virtue, what discipline of thought, of energy, of purpose, of devotion it requires, 
would rebel at the prospect of letting it serve those who scorn it, and scorn for material production is splattered all over the encyclical. Less well-off peoples can never be sufficiently on their guard against this temptation which comes to them from wealthy nations. This temptation is a way of acting that is principally aimed at the conquest of material prosperity. 41. Advocating a dialogue between different civilizations for the purpose of founding world solidarity, the encyclical stresses that it must be a dialogue based on man, not on commodities or technical skills. 73 which means that technical skills are a negligible characteristic, that no virtue was needed to acquire them, that the ability to produce commodities deserves no acknowledgment and is not part of the concept man. Thus, while the entire encyclical is a plea for the products of industrial wealth, it is scornfully indifferent to their source. It asserts a right to the effects but ignores the cause. It purports to speak on a lofty moral plane, but leaves the process of material production outside the realm of morality, as if that process were an activity of a low order that neither involved nor required any moral principles. I quote from Atlas Shrugged. An industrialist, blank out, there is no such person. A factory is a natural resource like a tree, a rock, or a mud puddle. Who solved the problem of production? Humanity, they answer. What was the solution? The goods are here. How did they get here? Somehow. What caused it? Nothing has causes. The last sentence is inapplicable. The encyclical's answer would be providence. The process of production is directed by man's mind. Man's mind is not an indeterminate faculty. It requires certain conditions in order to function, and the cardinal one among them is freedom. The encyclical is singularly eloquently devoid of any consideration of the mind's requirements, as if it expected human thought to keep on gushing forth anywhere under any conditions from under any pressures, or as if it intended that gusher to stop. If concern for human poverty and suffering were one's primary motive, one would seek to discover their cause. One would not fail to ask, why did some nations develop while others did not? Why have some nations achieved material abundance while others have remained stagnant in subhuman misery? History, and specifically the unprecedented prosperity explosion of the 19th century, would give an immediate answer. Capitalism is the only system that enables men to produce abundance, and the key to capitalism is individual freedom. It is obvious that a political system affects a society's economics by protecting or impeding men's productive activities. But this is what the encyclical will neither admit nor permit. The relationship of politics and economics is the thing it most emphatically ignores or evades and denies. It declares that no such relationship exists. In projecting its world of the future, where the civilized countries are to assume the burden of helping and developing the uncivilized ones, the encyclical states, and the receiving countries could demand that there be no interference in their political life or subversion of their social structures. As sovereign states, they have the right to conduct their own affairs, to decide on their policies, and to move freely toward the kind of society they choose. 54. What if the kind of society they choose makes production, development, and progress impossible? What if it practices communism like Soviet Russia, or exterminates minorities like Nazi Germany? or establishes a religious caste system like India, or clings to a nomadic anti-industrial form of existence like the Arab countries, or simply consists of tribal gangs ruled by brute force like some of the new countries in Africa. The encyclical's tacit answer is that these are the prerogatives of sovereign states, that we must respect different cultures, and that the civilized nations of the world must make up for these deficits, somehow. Some of the answer is not tacit. Given the increasing needs of the underdeveloped countries, it should be considered quite normal for an advanced country to devote a part of its production to meet their needs and to train teachers, engineers, technicians, and scholars prepared to put their knowledge and their skill at the disposal of less fortunate peoples. 48. The encyclical gives severely explicit instructions to such emissaries, 
They ought not to conduct themselves in a lordly fashion, but as helpers and co-workers. A people quickly perceives whether those who come to help them do so with or without affection. Their message is in danger of being rejected if it is not presented in the context of brotherly love. 71. They should be free of all nationalistic pride. They should realize that their competence does not confer on them a superiority in every field. They should realize that theirs is not the only civilization, nor does it enjoy a monopoly of valuable elements. They should be intent on discovering, along with its history, the component elements of the cultural riches of the country receiving them. Mutual understanding will be established which will enrich both cultures. 72. This is said to civilized men who are to venture into countries where sacred cows are fed while children are left to starve, where female infants are killed or abandoned by the roadside, where men go blind, medical help being forbidden by their religion, where women are mutilated to ensure their fidelity, where unspeakable tortures are ceremonially inflicted on prisoners, where cannibalism is practiced. Are these the cultural riches which a Western man is to greet with brotherly love? Are these the valuable elements which he is to admire and adopt? Are these the fields in which he is not to regard himself as superior, and when he discovers entire populations rotting alive in such conditions, is he not to acknowledge with a burning stab of pride, of pride and gratitude, the achievements of his nation and his culture, of the men who created them and left him a nobler heritage to carry forward? The encyclical's implicit answer is no. He is not to judge, not to question, not to... Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal, by Ayn Rand, concluded. Disc 12. He is not to judge, not to question, not to condemn, only to love. To love without cause, indiscriminately, unconditionally, in violation of any values, standards, or convictions of his own. The only valuable assistance that Western men could in fact offer to undeveloped countries is to enlighten them on the nature of capitalism and help them to establish it. But this would clash with the natives' cultural traditions. Industrialization cannot be grafted onto superstitious irrationality. The choice is either or. Besides, it is a knowledge which the West itself has lost, and it is the specific element which the encyclical damns. While the encyclical demands a kind of unfastidious relativism in regard to cultural values and stressedly urges respect for the right of primitive cultures to hold any values whatever, it does not extend this tolerance to Western civilization. Speaking of Western businessmen who deal with countries recently opened to industrialization, the encyclical states, Why then do they return to the inhuman principles of individualism when they operate in less developed countries? 70. Observe that the horrors of tribal existence in those undeveloped countries evoke no condemnation from the encyclical, only individualism. The principle that raised mankind out of the primordial swamps is branded as inhuman. In the light of that statement, observe the encyclical's contempt for conceptual integrity when it advocates the construction of a better world, one which shows deeper respect for the rights and the vocation of the individual. 65. What are the rights of the individual in a world that regards individualism as inhuman? No answer. There is another remark pertaining to Western nations which is worth noting. The encyclical states, We are pleased to learn that in certain nations, military service can be partially accomplished by doing social service, a service pure and simple. 74. It is interesting to discover the probable source of the notion of substituting social work for military service, of the claim that American youths owe their country some years of servitude, pure and simple, a vicious notion, more evil than the draft, a singularly un-American notion in that it contradicts every fundamental principle of the United States. The philosophy that created the United States is the encyclical's target, the enemy it seeks to obliterate. A casual reference that seems aimed at Latin America is a bit of window dressing, a booby trap for compromisers, upon which they did pounce eagerly, 
that reference states, If certain landed estates impede the general prosperity because they are extensive, unused, or poorly used, the common good sometimes demands their expropriation. 24. But whatever the sins of Latin America, capitalism is not one of them. Capitalism, a system based on the recognition and protection of individual rights, has never existed in Latin America. In the past and at present, Latin America was and is ruled by a primitive form of fascism, an unorganized, unstructured rule by coup d'etat, by militaristic gangs, i.e. by physical force, which tolerates a nominal pretense at private property, subject to expropriation by any gang in power, which is the cause of Latin America's economic stagnation. The encyclical is concerned with help to the undeveloped nations of the world. Latin America is high on the list of the undeveloped. It is unable to feed its own people. Can anyone imagine Latin America in the role of global provider, supplying the needs of the entire world? It is only the United States, the country created by the principles of individualism, the freest example of capitalism in history, the first and last exponent of the rights of man that could attempt such a role and would thereby be induced to commit suicide. Now observe that the encyclical is not concerned with man, with the individual. The unit of its thinking is the tribe, nations, countries, peoples and it discusses them as if they had a totalitarian power to dispose of their citizens, as if such entities as individuals were of no significance any longer. This is indicative of the encyclical strategy. The United States is the highest achievement of the millennia of Western civilization's struggle toward individualism, and its last precarious remnant. With the obliteration of the United States, i.e. of capitalism, there will be nothing left to deal with on the face of the globe but collectivized tribes. To hasten that day, the encyclical treats it as a fait accompli and addresses itself to the relationships among tribes. Observe that the same morality, altruism, the morality of self-immolation, which for centuries has been preached against the individual, is now preached against the civilized nations the creed of self-sacrifice, the primordial weapon used to penalize man's success on earth, to undercut his self-confidence, to cripple his independence, to poison his enjoyment of life, to emasculate his pride, to stunt his self-esteem and paralyze his mind, is now counted upon to wreak the same destruction on civilized nations and on civilization as such. I quote John Galt. You have reached the blind alley of the treason you committed when you agreed that you had no right to exist. Once you believed it was only a compromise, you conceded it was evil to live for yourself, but moral to live for the sake of your children. Then you conceded that it was selfish to live for your children, but moral to live for your community. Then you conceded that it was selfish to live for your community, but moral to live for your country. Now... You are letting this greatest of countries be devoured by any scum from any corner of the earth while you concede that it is selfish to live for your country and that your moral duty is to live for the globe. A man who has no right to life has no right to values and will not keep them. Atlas shrugged. Rights are conditions of existence required by man's nature for his proper survival, qua man i.e. qua rational being. They are not compatible with altruism. Man's soul or spirit is his consciousness. The motor of his consciousness is reason. Deprive him of freedom, i.e. of the right to use his mind, and what is left of him is only a physical body, ready to be manipulated by the strings of any tribe. Ask yourself whether you have ever read a document as body-oriented as that encyclical. The inhabitants of the world it proposes to establish are robots tuned to respond to a single stimulus, need. The lowest, grossest, physical, physicalistic need of any other robots anywhere. The minimum necessities, the barely sufficient to keep all robots in working order, eating, sleeping, eliminating, and procreating, to produce more robots to work, eat, sleep, eliminate, and procreate.
The most dehumanizing level of poverty is the level on which bare animal necessities become one's only concern and goal. This is the level which the encyclical proposes to institutionalize, and on which it proposes to immobilize all of mankind forever, with the animal needs of all as the only motivation of all. All other rights whatsoever are to be subordinated to this principle. If the encyclical charges that in a capitalist society men fall victim to a stifling materialism, what is the atmosphere of that proposed world? The survivor of one such plan described it as follows. We had no way of knowing their ability, the ability of others. We had no way of controlling their needs. All we knew was that we were beasts of burden, struggling blindly in some sort of place that was half hospital, half stockyards, a place geared to nothing but disability, disaster, disease, beasts put there for the relief of whatever, whoever chose to say was whichever's need, to work with no chance for an extra ration till the Cambodians have been fed and the Patagonians have been sent through college, to work on a blank check held by every creature born, by men whom you'll never see, whose needs you'll never know, whose ability or laziness or sloppiness or fraud you have no way to learn and no right to question, just to work and work and work, and leave it up to the ivies and the geralds of the world to decide whose stomach will consume the effort, the dreams, and the days of your life. Atlas shrugged. Do you think that I was exaggerating, and that no one preaches ideals of that kind? But, you say, the encyclical's ideal will not work. It is not intended to work. It is not intended to relieve suffering or to abolish poverty. It is intended to induce guilt. It is not intended to be accepted and practiced. It is intended to be accepted and broken, broken by man's selfish desire to live, which will thus be turned into a shameful weakness. Men who accept as an ideal an irrational goal which they cannot achieve never lift their heads thereafter and never discover that their bowed heads were the only goal to be achieved. The relief of suffering is not altruism's motive. It is only its rationalization. Self-sacrifice is not altruism's means to a happier end. It is its end. Self-sacrifice as man's permanent state, as a way of life and joyless toil, in the muck of a desolate earth where no why is ever to flash on in the veiled, extinguished eyes of children. The encyclical comes close to admitting this prospect and does not attempt to offer any earthly justification for altruistic martyrdom. It declares, Far from being the ultimate measure of all things, man can only realize himself by reaching beyond himself. 42. Beyond the grave? And, This road toward a greater humanity requires effort and sacrifice, but suffering itself, accepted for the love of our brethren favors the progress of the entire human family. 79. And, we are all united in this progress toward God. 80. As to the attitude toward man's mind, the clearest admission is to be found outside the encyclical. In a speech to a National Conference of Italian Bishops on April 7, 1967, Pope Paul VI denounced the questioning of any dogma that does not please and that demands the humble homage of the mind to be received. And he urged the bishops to combat the cult of one's own person. The New York Times, April 8, 1967. On the question of what political system it advocates, the encyclical is scornfully indifferent. It would apparently find any political system acceptable, provided it is a version of statism. The vague allusions to some nominal form of private property make it probable that the encyclical favors fascism. On the other hand, the tone, style, and vulgarity of argumentation suggest a shop-worn Marxism. But this very vulgarity seems to indicate a profound indifference to intellectual discourse. As if contemptuous of its audience, the encyclical picked whatever clichés were deemed to be safely fashionable today. The encyclical insists emphatically on only two political demands, that the nations of the future embrace statism with a totalitarian control of their citizens' economic activities, and that these nations unite into a global state 
with a totalitarian power over global planning. This international collaboration on a worldwide scale requires institutions that will prepare, coordinate, and direct it. Who does not see the necessity of thus establishing progressively a world authority capable of acting effectively in the juridical and political sectors? 78. Is there any difference between the encyclical's philosophy and communism? I am perfectly willing on this matter to take the word of an eminent Catholic authority. Under the headline, Encyclical Termed Rebuff to Marxism, the New York Times of March 31, 1967, reports, The Reverend John Courtney Murray, the prominent Jesuit theologian, described Pope Paul's newest encyclical yesterday as the Church's definitive answer to Marxism. The Marxists have proposed one way, and in pursuing their program they rely on man alone, Father Murray said. Now Pope Paul VI has issued a detailed plan to accomplish the same goal on the basis of true humanism, humanism that recognizes man's religious nature. Amen. So much for those American conservatives who claim that religion is the base of capitalism, and who believe that they can have capitalism and eat it too, as the moral cannibalism of the altruist ethics demands. And so much for those modern liberals who pride themselves on being the champions of reason, science, and progress, and who smear the advocates of capitalism as superstitious reactionary representatives of a dark past. Move over, comrades, and make room for your latest fellow travelers, who had always belonged on your side. Then take a look, if you dare, at the kind of past they represent. This is the spectacle of religion climbing on the bandwagon of statism, in a desperate attempt to recapture the power it lost at the time of the Renaissance. The Catholic Church has never given up the hope to reestablish the medieval union of church and state, with a global state and a global theocracy as its ultimate goal. Since the Renaissance, it has always been cautiously last to join that political movement which could serve its purpose at the time. This time it is too late. Collectivism is dead intellectually. The bandwagon on which the church has climbed is a hearse. But counting on that vehicle, the Catholic Church is deserting Western civilization and calling upon the barbarian hordes to devour the achievements of man's mind. There is an element of sadness in this spectacle. Catholicism had once been the most philosophical of all religions. Its long, illustrious philosophical history was illuminated by a giant, Thomas Aquinas. He brought an Aristotelian view of reason, an Aristotelian epistemology, back into European culture, and lighted the way to the Renaissance. For the brief span of the nineteenth century, when his was the dominant influence among Catholic philosophers, the grandeur of his thought almost lifted the Church close to the realm of reason, though at the price of a basic contradiction. Now we are witnessing the end of the Aquinas line. With the Church turning again to his primordial antagonist, who fits it better, to the mind-hating, life-hating St. Augustine. One could only wish they had given St. Thomas a more dignified requiem. The encyclical is the voice of the Dark Ages rising again in today's intellectual vacuum, like a cold wind whistling through the empty streets of an abandoned civilization. Unable to resolve a lethal contradiction, the conflict between individualism and altruism, the West is giving up. When men give up reason and freedom, the vacuum is filled by faith and force. No social system can stand for long without a moral base. Project a magnificent skyscraper being built on quicksands, while men are struggling upward to add the hundredth and two hundredth stories, the tenth and twentieth are vanishing, sucked under by the muck. That is the history of capitalism of its swaying, tottering attempt to stand erect on the foundation of the altruist morality. It's either or. If capitalism's befuddled, guilt-ridden apologists do not know it, two fully consistent representatives of altruism do know it, Catholicism and Communism. Their rapprochement, therefore, is not astonishing. Their differences pertain only to the supernatural, but here in reality on earth they have three cardinal elements in common. The same morality, altruism, the same goal, global rule by force, the same enemy, man's mind. There is a precedent for their strategy. 
In the German election of 1933, the communists supported the Nazis, on the premise that they could fight each other for power later, but must first destroy their common enemy, capitalism. Today, Catholicism and communism may well cooperate on the premise that they will fight each other for power later, but must first destroy their common enemy, the individual, by forcing mankind to unite to form one neck, ready for one leash. The encyclical was endorsed with enthusiasm by the communist press the world over. The French Communist Party newspaper L'Humanité said the encyclical was often moving and constructive for highlighting the evils of capitalism, long emphasized by Marxists, reports the New York Times, March 30, 1967. Those who do not understand the role of moral self-confidence in human affairs will not appreciate the sardonically ludicrous quality of the following item from the same report. The French communists, however, deplored the failure of the Pope to make a distinction between rich communist countries and rich capitalist countries in his general strictures against imbalance between the have and have not nations. Thus wealth acquired by force is rightful property, but wealth earned by production is not. Looting is moral, but producing is not. And while the looter's spokesmen object to the encyclical's damnation of wealth, the producer's spokesmen crawl, evading the issues, accepting the insults, promising to give their wealth away. If capitalism does not survive, this is the spectacle that will have made it unworthy of survival. The New York Times, March 30, 1967, declared editorially that the encyclical is remarkably advanced in its economic philosophy. It is sophisticated, comprehensive, and penetrating. If by advanced, the editorial meant that the encyclical's philosophy has caught up with that of modern liberals, one would have to agree, except that the Times is mistaken about the direction of the motion involved. It is not that the encyclical has progressed to the 20th century. It is that the liberals have reverted to the fourth. The Wall Street Journal, May 10, 1967, went further. It declared, in effect, that the Pope didn't mean it. The encyclical, it alleged, was just a misunderstanding caused by some mysterious conspiracy of the Vatican translators who misinterpreted the Pope's ideas in transferring them from the original Latin into English. His Holiness may not be showering compliments on the free market system, but he is not at all saying what the Vatican's English version appeared to make him say. Through minute comparisons of Latin paragraphs with their official and unofficial translations and columns of casuistic hair-splitting, the Wall Street Journal reached the conclusion that it was not capitalism that the Pope was denouncing, but only some opinions of capitalism. Which opinions? According to the unofficial translation, the encyclical's paragraph 26 reads as follows, But out of these new conditions we know not how... Some opinions have crept into human society, according to which profit was regarded, in these opinions, as the foremost incentive to encourage economic progress, free competition as the supreme rule of economics, private ownership of the means of production as an absolute right, which would accept neither limits nor a social duty related to it. In the Latin, said the article, Pope Paul is acknowledging the hardships in the development of some kinds of capitalism. But he puts the blame for that, not on the whole woeful system, i.e. the whole capitalistic system, but on some corrupt views of it. If the views advocating the profit motive, free competition, and private property were corrupt, just what is capitalism? Blank out. What is the Wall Street Journal's definition of capitalism? Blank out. What are we to designate as capitalism once all of its essential characteristics are removed? blank out. This last question indicates the unstated meaning of that article. Since the Pope does not attack capitalism, but only its fundamental principles, we don't have to worry. And for what do you suppose did that article find courage to reproach the encyclical? What might have been wished for in the encyclical was an acknowledgement that capitalism can accept, and in the United States as well as other places does accept, a great many social responsibilities. Sick Transit Gloria V.I. Wall A similar attitude with a similar range of vision is taken by Time magazine.
April 7, 1967. Although Pope Paul had probably tried to give a Christian message relevant to the world's contemporary economic situation, his encyclical virtually ignored the fact that old-style laissez-faire capitalism is about as dead as das Kapital. Quite clearly, the Pope's condemnation of capitalism was addressed to the unreconstructed variety that persists, for example, in Latin America. If this were a competition, the prize would go to Fortune, the Businessmen's Magazine, May 1967. Its attitude is aggressively amoral and a-philosophical. It is proudly determined to maintain the separation of economics and ethics. Capitalism is only an economic system, it says. First acknowledging the Pope's praiseworthy purpose, Fortune declares, But despite its modern and global vision, Populorum Progressio may be a self-defeating document. It takes a dated and suspicious view of the workings of economic enterprise. The Pope has set up a straw man that has few defenders. If this passage, paragraph 26, is taken literally, unalloyed laissez-faire in fact governs no significant part of the world's commerce, Ownership in advanced countries has evolved in a way that subsumes social obligations. Absolute private rights are irrelevant in advanced industrial societies. After conceding all that, Fortune seems to be astonished and hurt that the Pope did not find it necessary to include businessmen among the men of goodwill whom he calls upon to combat global poverty. In omitting any specific reference to the businessman, he slights a natural and necessary ally, who indeed is already deeply committed in many parts of the world to the kind of effort that Paul urges. Perhaps the businessman is taken for granted as a kind of primordial force that can be counted upon to provide motive power, and that needs only to be tamed and harnessed and carefully watched. And isn't that Fortune's own view of businessmen in their unalloyed state? The Vatican has seldom seemed able to look at capitalism as other than a necessary evil at best, and Popolorum Progressio suggests that a better understanding still comes hard. This is not to suggest that capitalism is a complete formula for social enlightenment and progress. It is only an economic system that men of goodwill can use, more successfully than any other system yet conceived, to attain the social goals that politics and religion help to define. Observe the indecency of trying to justify capitalism on the grounds of altruistic service. Observe also the naivete of the cynical. It is not their wealth nor their relief of poverty that the encyclical is after. Militantly concrete-bound, equating cynicism with practicality, modern pragmatists are unable to see beyond the range of the moment or to grasp what moves the world and determines its direction. Men who are willing to swim with any current to compromise on anything, to serve as means to anyone's ends, lose the ability to understand the power of ideas. And while two hordes of man-haters who do understand it are converging on civilization, they sit in the middle, declaring that principles are straw men. I have heard the same accusation directed at objectivism. We are fighting a straw man, they say. Nobody preaches the kind of ideas we are opposing. Well, as a friend of mine observed, only the Vatican, the Kremlin, and the Empire State Building know the real issues of the modern world. Appendix Man's Rights by Ayn Rand If one wishes to advocate a free society, that is capitalism, one must realize that its indispensable foundation is the principle of individual rights. If one wishes to uphold individual rights, one must realize that capitalism is the only system that can uphold and protect them. And if one wishes to gauge the relationship of freedom to the goals of today's intellectuals, one may gauge it by the fact that the concept of individual rights is evaded, distorted, perverted, and seldom discussed, most conspicuously seldom, by the so-called conservatives. Rights are a moral concept the concept that provides a logical transition from the principles guiding an individual's actions to the principles guiding his relationship with others, the concept that preserves and protects individual morality in a social context, the link between the moral code of a man and the legal code of a society, between ethics and politics. Individual rights are the means of subordinating society to moral law. 
Every political system is based on some code of ethics. The dominant ethics of mankind's history were variants of the altruist collectivist doctrine, which subordinated the individual to some higher authority, either mystical or social. Consequently, most political systems were variants of the same statist tyranny, differing only in degree, not in basic principle, limited only by the accidents of tradition, of chaos, of bloody strife and periodic collapse. Under all such systems, morality was a code applicable to the individual but not to society. Society was placed outside the moral law as its embodiment or source or exclusive interpreter, and the inculcation of self-sacrificial devotion to social duty was regarded as the main purpose of ethics in man's earthly existence. Since there is no such entity as society, since society is only a number of individual men, this meant in practice that the rulers of society were exempt from moral law. Subject only to traditional rituals, they held total power and exacted blind obedience on the implicit principle of the good is that which is good for society or for the tribe, the race, the nation, and the ruler's edicts are its voice on earth. This was true of all statist systems, under all variants of the altruist collectivist ethics, mystical or social. The divine right of kings summarizes the political theory of the first, vox populi vox dei, of the second. As witness the theocracy of Egypt, with the pharaoh as an embodied god, the unlimited majority rule or democracy of Athens, the welfare state run by the emperors of Rome, the Inquisition of the late Middle Ages, the absolute monarchy of France, the welfare state of Bismarck's Prussia, the gas chambers of Nazi Germany, the slaughterhouse of the Soviet Union. All these political systems were expressions of the altruist collectivist ethics, and their common characteristic is the fact that society stood above the moral law as an omnipotent sovereign whim-worshipper. Thus, politically, all these systems were variants of an amoral society. The most profoundly revolutionary achievement of the United States of America was the subordination of society to moral law. The principle of man's individual rights represented the extension of morality into the social system as a limitation on the power of the state, as man's protection against the brute force of the collective, as the subordination of might to right. The United States was the first moral society in history. All previous systems had regarded man as a sacrificial means to the ends of others, and society as an end in itself. The United States regarded man as an end in himself, and society as a means to the peaceful, orderly, voluntary coexistence of individuals. All previous systems had held that man's life belongs to society, that society can dispose of him in any way it pleases, and that any freedom he enjoys is his only by favor, by the permission of society, which may be revoked at any time. The United States held that man's life is his by right, which means by moral principle and by his nature, that a right is the property of an individual, that society as such has no rights, and that the only moral purpose of a government is the protection of individual rights. A right is a moral principle defining and sanctioning a man's freedom of action in a social context. There is only one fundamental right, all the others are its consequences or corollaries, a man's right to his own life. Life is a process of self-sustaining and self-generated action. The right to life means the right to engage in self-sustaining and self-generated action, which means the freedom to take all the actions required by the nature of a rational being for the support, the furtherance, the fulfillment, and the enjoyment of his own life, such as the meaning of the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The concept of a right pertains only to action, specifically to freedom of action. It means freedom from physical compulsion, coercion, or interference by other men. Thus, for every individual, a right is the moral sanction of a positive of his freedom to act on his own judgment, for his own goals, by his own voluntary, uncoerced choice. As to his neighbors, his rights impose no obligations on them except of a negative kind, to abstain from violating his rights. The right to life is the source of all rights, and the right to property is their only implementation. 
Without property rights, no other rights are possible. Since man has to sustain his life by his own effort, the man who has no right to the product of his effort has no means to sustain his life. The man who produces while others dispose of his product is a slave. Bear in mind that the right to property is a right to action like all the others. It is not the right to an object, but to the action and the consequences of producing or earning that object. It is not a guarantee that a man will earn any property, but only a guarantee that he will own it if he earns it. It is the right to gain, to keep, to use, and to dispose of material values. The concept of individual rights is so new in human history that most men have not grasped it fully to this day. In accordance with the two theories of ethics, the mystical or the social, some men assert that rights are a gift of God, others that rights are a gift of society, but in fact, the source of rights is man's nature. The Declaration of Independence stated that men are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights. Whether one believes that man is the product of a Creator or of nature, the issue of man's origin does not alter the fact that he is an entity of a specific kind, a rational being, that he cannot function successfully under coercion, and that rights are a necessary condition of his particular mode of survival. The source of man's rights is not divine law or congressional law, but the law of identity. A is A and man is man. Rights are conditions of existence required by man's nature for his proper survival. If man is to live on earth, it is right for him to use his mind. It is right to act on his own free judgment. It is right to work for his values and to keep the product of his work. If life on earth is his purpose, he has a right to live as a rational being. Nature forbids him the irrational. Atlas shrugged. To violate man's rights means to compel him to act against his own judgment, or to expropriate his values. Basically, there is only one way to do it, by the use of physical force. There are two potential violators of man's rights, the criminals and the government. The great achievement of the United States was to draw a distinction between these two by forbidding to the second the legalized version of the activities of the first. The Declaration of Independence laid down the principle that to secure these rights governments are instituted among men. This provided the only valid justification of a government and defined its only proper purpose to protect man's rights by protecting him from physical violence. Thus the government's function was changed from the role of ruler to the role of servant. The government was set to protect man from criminals, and the Constitution was written to protect man from the government. The Bill of Rights was not directed against private citizens, but against the government, as an explicit declaration that individual rights supersede any public or social power. The result was the pattern of a civilized society which, for the brief span of some 150 years, America came close to achieving. A civilized society is one in which physical force is banned from human relationships, in which the government, acting as a policeman, may use force only in retaliation and only against those who initiate its use. This was the essential meaning and intent of America's political philosophy, implicit in the principle of individual rights. But it was not formulated explicitly, nor fully accepted, nor consistently practiced, America's inner contradiction was the altruist collectivist ethics. Altruism is incompatible with freedom, with capitalism, and with individual rights. One cannot combine the pursuit of happiness with the moral status of a sacrificial animal. It was the concept of individual rights that had given birth to a free society. It was with the destruction of individual rights that the destruction of freedom had to begin. A collectivist tyranny dare not enslave a country by an outright confiscation of its values, material or moral. It has to be done by a process of internal corruption. Just as in the material realm the plundering of a country's wealth is accomplished by inflating the currency, so today one may witness the process of inflation being applied to the realm of rights. The process entails such a growth of newly promulgated rights that people do not notice the fact that the meaning of the concept is being reversed. Just as bad money drives out good money, so these printing press rights negate authentic rights. 
Consider the curious fact that never has there been such a proliferation all over the world of two contradictory phenomena, of alleged new rights and of slave labor camps. The gimmick was the switch of the concept of rights from the political to the economic realm. The Democratic Party platform of 1960 summarizes the switch boldly and explicitly. It declares that a democratic administration will reaffirm the economic bill of rights which Franklin Roosevelt wrote into our national conscience 16 years ago. Bear clearly in mind the meaning of the concept of rights when you read the list which that platform offers. 1. The right to a useful and remunerative job in the industries or shops or farms or mines of the nation. 2. The right to earn enough to provide adequate food and clothing and recreation. 3. The right of every farmer to raise and sell his products at a return which will give him and his family a decent living. 4. The right of every businessman, large and small, to trade in an atmosphere of freedom from unfair competition and domination by monopolies at home and abroad. 5. The right of every family to a decent home. 6. The right to adequate medical care and the opportunity to achieve and enjoy good health. 7. The right to adequate protection from the economic fears of old age, sickness, accidents, and unemployment. 8. The right to a good education. A single question added to each of the above eight clauses would make the issue clear. At whose expense? Jobs, food, clothing, recreation, homes, medical care, education, etc., do not grow in nature. These are man-made values, goods and services produced by men. Who is to provide them? If some men are entitled by right to the products of the work of others, it means that those others are deprived of rights and condemned to slave labor. Any alleged right of one man which necessitates the violation of the rights of another is not and cannot be a right. No man can have a right to impose an unchosen obligation, an unrewarded duty, or an involuntary servitude on another man. There can be no such thing as the right to enslave. A right does not include the material implementation of that right by other men. It includes only the freedom to earn that implementation by one's own effort. Observe in this context the intellectual precision of the Founding Fathers. They spoke of the right to the pursuit of happiness, not of the right to happiness. It means that a man has the right to take the actions he deems necessary to achieve his happiness. It does not mean that others must make him happy. The right to life means that a man has the right to support his life by his own work, on any economic level as high as his ability will carry him. It does not mean that others must provide him with the necessities of life. The right to property means that a man has the right to take the economic actions necessary to earn property, to use it and to dispose of it. It does not mean that others must provide him with property. The right of free speech means that a man has the right to express his ideas without danger of suppression, interference, or punitive action by the government. It does not mean that others must provide him with a lecture hall, a radio station, or a printing press through which to express his ideas. Any undertaking that involves more than one man requires the voluntary consent of every participant. Every one of them has the right to make his own decision, but none has the right to force his decision on the others. There's no such thing as a right to a job. There's only the right of free trade that is, a man's right to take a job if another man chooses to hire him. There is no right to a home, only the right of free trade, the right to build a home or to buy it. There are no rights to a fair wage or a fair price if no one chooses to pay it, to hire a man or to buy his product. There are no rights of consumers to milk, shoes, movies, or champagne if no producers choose to manufacture such items. There is only the right to manufacture them oneself. There are no rights of special groups. There are no rights of farmers, of workers, of businessmen, of employees, of employers, of the old, of the young, of the unborn. There are only the rights of man, rights possessed by every individual man and by all men as individuals. Property rights and the right of free trade are man's only economic rights. They are, in fact, political rights. And there can be no such thing as an economic bill of rights. 
but observe that the advocates of the latter have all but destroyed the former. Remember that rights are moral principles which define and protect a man's freedom of action, but impose no obligations on other men. Private citizens are not a threat to one another's rights or freedom. A private citizen who resorts to physical force and violates the rights of others is a criminal, and men have legal protection against him. Criminals are a small minority in any age or country, and the harm they have done to mankind is infinitesimal when compared to the horrors, the bloodshed, the wars, the persecutions, the confiscations, the famines, the enslavements, the wholesale destructions perpetrated by man's governments. Potentially a government is the most dangerous threat to man's rights. It holds a legal monopoly on the use of physical force against legally disarmed victims. When unlimited and unrestricted by individual rights, a government is man's deadliest enemy. It is not as protection against private actions, but against governmental actions that the Bill of Rights was written. Now observe the process by which that protection is being destroyed. The process consists of ascribing to private citizens the specific violations constitutionally forbidden to the government, which private citizens have no power to commit and thus freeing the government from all restrictions. The switch is becoming progressively more obvious in the field of free speech. For years, the collectivists have been propagating the notion that a private individual's refusal to finance an opponent is a violation of the opponent's right of free speech and an act of censorship. It is censorship, they claim, if a newspaper refuses to employ or publish writers whose ideas are diametrically opposed to its policy. It is censorship, they claim, if businessmen refuse to advertise in a magazine that denounces, insults, and smears them. It is censorship, they claim, if a TV sponsor objects to some outrage perpetrated on a program he is financing, such as the incident of Alger Hiss being invited to denounce former Vice President Nixon. And then there is Newton N. Minow, who declares, There is censorship by ratings, by advertisers, by networks, by affiliates which reject programming offered to their areas. It is the same Mr. Minow who threatens to revoke the license of any station that does not comply with his views on programming, and who claims that that is not censorship. Consider the implications of such a trend. Censorship is a term pertaining only to governmental action. No private action is censorship. No private individual or agency can silence a man or suppress a publication. Only the government can do so. The freedom of speech of private individuals includes the right not to agree, not to listen, and not to finance one's own antagonists. But according to such doctrines as the Economic Bill of Rights, an individual has no right to dispose of his own material means by the guidance of his own convictions, and must hand over his money indiscriminately to any speakers or propagandists who have a right to his property. This means that the ability to provide the material tools for the expression of ideas deprives a man of the right to hold any ideas. It means that a publisher has to publish books he considers worthless, false, or evil but a TV sponsor has to finance commentators who choose to affront his convictions, that the owner of a newspaper must turn his editorial pages over to any young hooligan who clamors for the enslavement of the press. It means that one group of men acquires the right to unlimited license, while another group is reduced to helpless irresponsibility. But since it is obviously impossible to provide every claimant with a job, a microphone, or a newspaper column, who will determine the distribution of economic rights and select the recipients when the owner's right to choose has been abolished? Well, Mr. Minow has indicated that quite clearly. And if you make the mistake of thinking that this applies only to big property owners, you had better realize that the theory of economic rights includes the right of every would-be playwright, every beatnik, poet, every noise composer, and every non-objective artist who have political pull to the financial support you did not give them when you did not attend their shows. What else is the meaning of the project to spend your tax money on subsidized art? And while people are clamoring about economic rights, the concept of political rights is vanishing. 
It is forgotten that the right of free speech means the freedom to advocate one's views and to bear the possible consequences, including disagreement with others, opposition, unpopularity, and lack of support. The political function of the right of free speech is to protect dissenters and unpopular minorities from forcible suppression, not to guarantee them the support, advantages, and rewards of a popularity they have not gained. The Bill of Rights reads, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. It does not demand that private citizens provide a microphone for the man who advocates their destruction, or a pass key for the burglar who seeks to rob them, or a knife for the murderer who wants to cut their throats. Such is the state of one of today's most crucial issues, political rights versus economic rights. It's either or. One destroys the other. But there are in fact no economic rights, no collective rights, no public interest rights. The term individual rights is a redundancy. There is no other kind of rights, and no one else to possess them. Those who advocate laissez-faire capitalism are the only advocates of man's rights. Appendix The Nature of Government by Ayn Rand a government is an institution that holds the exclusive power to enforce certain rules of social conduct in a given geographical area. Do men need such an institution, and why? Since man's mind is his basic tool of survival, his means of gaining knowledge to guide his actions, the basic condition he requires is the freedom to think and to act according to his rational judgment. This does not mean that a man must live alone and that a desert island is the environment best suited to his needs, men can derive enormous benefits from dealing with one another. A social environment is most conducive to their successful survival, but only on certain conditions. The two great values to be gained from social existence are knowledge and trade. Man is the only species that can transmit and expand his store of knowledge from generation to generation. The knowledge potentially available to man is greater than any one man could begin to acquire in his own lifespan. Every man gains an incalculable benefit from the knowledge discovered by others. The second great benefit is the division of labor. It enables a man to devote his effort to a particular field of work and to trade with others who specialize in other fields. This form of cooperation allows all men who take part in it to achieve a greater knowledge, skill, and productive return on their effort than they could achieve if each had to produce everything he needs on a desert island or on a self-sustaining farm. But these very benefits indicate, delimit, and define what kind of men can be of value to one another and in what kind of society. Only rational, productive, independent men in a rational, productive, free society. The objectivist ethics in the virtue of selfishness. A society that robs an individual of the product of his effort, or enslaves him, or attempts to limit the freedom of his mind, or compels him to act against his own rational judgment, a society that sets up a conflict between its edicts and the requirements of man's nature, is not, strictly speaking, a society, but a mob held together by institutionalized gang rule. Such a society destroys all the values of human coexistence, has no possible justification, and represents not a source of benefits, but the deadliest threat to man's survival. Life on a desert island is safer than and incomparably preferable to existence in Soviet Russia or Nazi Germany. If men are to live together in a peaceful, productive, rational society, and deal with one another to mutual benefit, they must accept the basic social principle without which no moral or civilized society is possible the principle of individual rights. To recognize individual rights means to recognize and accept the conditions required by man's nature for his proper survival. Man's rights can be violated only by the use of physical force. It is only by means of physical force that one man can deprive another of his life, or enslave him, or rob him, or prevent him from pursuing his own goals, or compel him to act against his own rational judgment. The precondition of a civilized society is the barring of physical force from social relationships, thus establishing the principle that if men wish to deal with one another, 
they may do so only by means of reason, by discussion, persuasion, and voluntary uncoerced agreement. The necessary consequence of man's right to life is his right to self-defense. In a civilized society, force may be used only in retaliation and only against those who initiate its use. All the reasons which make the initiation of physical force an evil make the retaliatory use of physical force a moral imperative. If some pacifist society renounced the retaliatory use of force, it would be left helplessly at the mercy of the first thug who decided to be immoral. Such a society would achieve the opposite of its intention. Instead of abolishing evil, it would encourage and reward it. If a society provided no organized protection against force, it would compel every citizen to go about armed, to turn his home into a fortress, to shoot any strangers approaching his door, or to join a protective gang of citizens who would fight other gangs, formed for the same purpose, and thus bring about the degeneration of that society into the chaos of gang rule, i.e. rule by brute force, into the perpetual tribe warfare of prehistorical savages. The use of physical force, even its retaliatory use, cannot be left at the discretion of individual citizens. Peaceful coexistence is impossible if a man has to live under the constant threat of force to be unleashed against him by any of his neighbors at any moment. Whether his neighbors' intentions are good or bad, whether their judgment is rational or irrational, whether they are motivated by a sense of justice or by ignorance or by prejudice or by malice, the use of force against one man cannot be left to the arbitrary decision of another. Visualize, for example, what would happen if a man missed his wallet, concluded that he had been robbed, broke into every house in the neighborhood to search it, and shot the first man who gave him a dirty look, taking the look to be a proof of guilt. The retaliatory use of force requires objective rules of evidence to establish that a crime has been committed and to prove who committed it, as well as objective rules to define punishments and enforcement procedures. Men who attempt to prosecute crimes without such rules are a lynch mob. If a society left the retaliatory use of force in the hands of individual citizens, it would degenerate into mob rule, lynch law, and an endless series of bloody private feuds or vendettas. If physical force is to be barred from social relationships, men need an institution charged with the task of protecting their rights under an objective code of rules. This is the task of a government of a proper government, its basic task, its only moral justification, and the reason why men do need a government. A government is the means of placing the retaliatory use of physical force under objective control, i.e., under objectively defined laws. The fundamental difference between private action and governmental action, a difference thoroughly ignored and evaded today, lies in the fact that a government holds a monopoly on the legal use of physical force. It has to hold such a monopoly since it is the agent of restraining and combating the use of force. And for that very same reason, its actions have to be rigidly defined, delimited, and circumscribed. No touch of whim or caprice should be permitted in its performance. It should be an impersonal robot with the laws as its only motive power. If a society is to be free, its government has to be controlled. Under a proper social system, a private individual is legally free to take any action he pleases, so long as he does not violate the rights of others, while a government official is bound by law in his every official act. A private individual may do anything except that which is legally forbidden. A government official may do nothing except that which is legally permitted. This is the means of subordinating might to right. This is the American concept of a government of laws and not of men. The nature of the laws proper to a free society and the source of its government's authority are both to be derived from the nature and purpose of a proper government. The basic principle of both is indicated in the Declaration of Independence. To secure these individual rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Since the protection of individual rights is the only proper purpose of a government. It is the only proper subject of legislation. All laws must be passed on individual rights 
and aimed at their protection. All laws must be objective and objectively justifiable. Men must know clearly and in advance of taking an action what the law forbids them to do and why, what constitutes a crime and what penalty they will incur if they commit it. The source of the government's authority is the consent of the governed. This means that the government is not the ruler, but the servant or agent of the citizens. It means that the government as such has no rights except the rights delegated to it by the citizens for a specific purpose. There is only one basic principle to which an individual must consent if he wishes to live in a free, civilized society. The principle of renouncing the use of physical force and delegating to the government his right of physical self-defense for the purpose of an orderly, objective, legally defined enforcement. Or to put it another way, he must accept the separation of force and whim, any whim including his own. Now what happens in a case of a disagreement between two men about an undertaking in which both are involved? In a free society, men are not forced to deal with one another. They do so only by voluntary agreement, and when a time element is involved, by contract. If a contract is broken by the arbitrary decision of one man, it may cause a disastrous financial injury to the other, and the victim would have no recourse except to seize the offender's property as compensation. But here again... The use of force cannot be left to the decision of private individuals, and this leads to one of the most important and most complex functions of the government, to the function of an arbiter who settles disputes among men according to objective laws. Criminals are in a small minority in any semi-civilized society, but the protection and enforcement of contracts through courts of civil law is the most crucial need of a peaceful society. Without such protection, no civilization could be developed or maintained. Man cannot survive as animals do, by acting on the range of the immediate moment. Man has to project his goals and achieve them across a span of time. He has to calculate his actions and plan his life long range. The better a man's mind and the greater his knowledge, the longer the range of his planning. The higher or more complex a civilization, the longer the range of activity it requires and therefore the longer the range of contractual agreements among men, and the more urgent their need of protection for the security of such agreements. Even a primitive barter society could not function if a man agreed to trade a bushel of potatoes for a basket of eggs, and having received the eggs refused to deliver the potatoes. Visualize what this sort of whim-directed action would mean in an industrial society, where men deliver a billion dollars' worth of goods on credit or contract to build multi-million dollar structures, or sign 99-year leases. A unilateral breach of contract involves an indirect use of physical force. It consists, in essence, of one man receiving the material values, goods, or services of another, then refusing to pay for them, and thus keeping them by force, by mere physical possession, not by right, i.e., keeping them without the consent of their owner. Fraud involves a similarly indirect use of force. It consists of obtaining material values without their owner's consent under false pretenses or false promises. Extortion is another variant of an indirect use of force. It consists of obtaining material values not in exchange for values, but by the threat of force, violence, or injury. Some of these actions are obviously criminal. Others such as a unilateral breach of contract, may not be criminally motivated, but may be caused by irresponsibility and irrationality. Still others may be complex issues with some claim to justice on both sides. But whatever the case may be, all such issues have to be made subject to objectively defined laws and have to be resolved by an impartial arbiter, administering the laws, i.e., by a judge and a jury when appropriate. Observe the basic principle governing justice in all these cases. It is the principle that no man may obtain any values from others without the owner's consent, and, as a corollary, that a man's rights may not be left at the mercy of the unilateral decision, the arbitrary choice, the irrationality, the whim of another man. Such, in essence, is the proper purpose of a government, to make social existence possible to men by protecting the benefits and combating the evils which men can cause to one another. 
The proper functions of a government fall into three broad categories, all of them involving the issues of physical force and the protection of men's rights. The police, to protect men from criminals. The armed services, to protect men from foreign invaders. The law courts, to settle disputes among men according to objective laws. These three categories involve many corollary and derivative issues, and their implementation in practice in the form of specific legislation is enormously complex. It belongs to the field of a special science, the philosophy of law. Many errors and many disagreements are possible in the field of implementation, but what is essential here is the principle to be implemented, the principle that the purpose of law and of government is the protection of individual rights. Today this principle is forgotten, ignored, and evaded. The result is the present state of the world, with mankind's retrogression to the lawlessness of absolutist tyranny, to the primitive savagery of rule by brute force. In unthinking protest against this trend, some people are raising the question of whether government as such is evil by nature, and whether anarchy is the ideal social system. Anarchy as a political concept is a naive, floating abstraction. For all the reasons discussed above, a society without an organized government would be at the mercy of the first criminal who came along and who would precipitate it into the chaos of gang warfare. But the possibility of human immorality is not the only objection to anarchy. Even a society whose every member were fully rational and faultlessly moral could not function in a state of anarchy. It is the need of objective laws and of an arbiter for honest disagreements among men that necessitates the establishment of a government. A recent variant of anarchistic theory, which is befuddling some of the younger advocates of freedom, is a weird absurdity called competing governments. Accepting the basic premise of the modern statists, who see no difference between the functions of government and the functions of industry, between force and production, and who advocate government ownership of business, the proponents of competing governments take the other side of the same coin and declare that since competition is so beneficial to business, it should also be applied to government. Instead of a single monopolistic government, they declare, there should be a number of different governments in the same geographical area competing for the allegiance of individual citizens, with every citizen free to shop and to patronize whatever government he chooses. Remember that forcible restraint of men is the only service a government has to offer. Ask yourself what a competition in forcible restraint would have to mean. One cannot call this theory a contradiction in terms, since it is obviously devoid of any understanding of the terms competition and government. Nor can one call it a floating abstraction, since it is devoid of any contact with or reference to reality and cannot be concretized at all not even roughly or approximately. One illustration will be sufficient. Suppose Mr. Smith, a customer of Government A, suspects that his next-door neighbor Mr. Jones, a customer of Government B, has robbed him. A squad of Police A proceeds to Mr. Jones's house and is met at the door by a squad of Police B, who declare that they do not accept the validity of Mr. Smith's complaint and do not recognize the authority of Government A. What happens then? You take it from there. The evolution of the concept of government has had a long, tortuous history. Some glimmer of the government's proper function seems to have existed in every organized society, manifesting itself in such phenomena as the recognition of some implicit, if often non-existent, difference between a government and a robber gang, the aura of respect and of moral authority granted to the government as the guardian of law and order, the fact that even the most evil types of government found it necessary to maintain some semblance of order and some pretense at justice, if only by routine and tradition, and to claim some sort of moral justification for their power of a mystical or social nature. Just as the absolute monarchs of France had to invoke the divine right of kings, so the modern dictators of Soviet Russia have to spend fortunes on propaganda to justify their rule in the eyes of their enslaved subjects. In mankind's history, the understanding of the government's proper function is a very recent achievement. It is only two hundred years old, and it dates from the founding fathers of the American Revolution. 
Not only did they identify the nature and the needs of a free society, but they devised the means to translate it into practice. A free society, like any other human product, cannot be achieved by random means, by mere wishing, or by the leader's good intentions. A complex legal system based on objectively valid principles is required to make a society free and to keep it free. A system that does not depend on the motives, the moral character, or the intentions of any given official. A system that leaves no opportunity, no legal loophole for the development of tyranny. The American system of checks and balances was just such an achievement. And although certain contradictions in the Constitution did leave a loophole for the growth of statism, the incomparable achievement was the concept of a Constitution as a means of limiting and restricting the power of the government. Today, when a concerted effort is made to obliterate this point, it cannot be repeated too often that the Constitution is a limitation on the government, not on private individuals that it does not prescribe the conduct of private individuals, only the conduct of the government, that it is not a charter for government power, but a charter of the citizens' protection against the government. Now consider the extent of the moral and political inversion in today's prevalent view of government. Instead of being a protector of man's rights, the government is becoming their most dangerous violator. Instead of guarding freedom, the government is establishing slavery. Instead of protecting men from the initiators of physical force, the government is initiating physical force and coercion in any manner and issue it pleases. Instead of serving as the instrument of objectivity in human relationships, the government is creating a deadly subterranean reign of uncertainty and fear by means of non-objective laws whose interpretation is left to the arbitrary decisions of random bureaucrats. Instead of protecting men from injury by whim, the government is arrogating to itself the power of unlimited whim, so that we are fast approaching the stage of the ultimate inversion, the stage where the government is free to do anything it pleases, while the citizens may act only by permission, which is the stage of the darkest periods of human history, the stage of rule by brute force. It has often been remarked that in spite of its material progress, mankind has not achieved any comparable degree of moral progress. That remark is usually followed by some pessimistic conclusion about human nature. It is true that the moral state of mankind is disgracefully low. But if one considers the monstrous moral inversions of the governments, made possible by the altruist collectivist morality, under which mankind has had to live through most of its history, one begins to wonder how men have managed to preserve even a semblance of civilization, and what indestructible vestige of self-esteem has kept them walking upright on two feet. One also begins to see more clearly the nature of the political principles that have to be accepted and advocated as part of the battle for man's intellectual renaissance. This concludes the reading of Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal by Ayn Rand. This book was read by Anna Fields. Blackstone patrons who enjoy this unabridged work also enjoy Blackstone titles by Ayn Rand, Anthem, Atlas Shrugged, The Fountainhead, and We the Living. If you would like to obtain a complete catalog of our titles or our monthly update telling you about new releases, and our new collection of books on CD, write Blackstone Audiobooks, P.O. Box 969, Ashland, Oregon, Zip 97520, or call 1-800-SAY-BOOK. That's 1-800-729-2665. You may also obtain the same information from our award-winning website. Our address, all one word, is www.blackstoneaudio.com. Thank you.